I am waiting till my clock says 6.30, which should be very shortly. When you start, Jenny, I will take down the PowerPoint slide. Okay, great, thank you. Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is August 6, 2020. I'm Jennifer Patterson, president of the Concord School Board, and I am calling to order um, a meeting of the board. Um, and first, I have an emergency meeting statement. Um, as president of the Concord School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. The business we intend to conduct today is necessary due to the need to accept bond results and most importantly, to make a decision about how to reopen for the 2020-2021 school year given the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting will include taking public comment as noted on the posted agenda by unmuting phone lines one by one during the public comment period. Um, and I'm getting a message that we are not streaming yet. Um, I don't know if I should stop. Jack, was that message from you? No, we see it streaming, and from what Conquer TV tells us who manages the stream, it's working. Okay, all right, then I will continue. Um, now, we are streaming, we are streaming. Thank you, thank you for everyone who is telling us that we are streaming. I appreciate it. Um, so someone is not getting it on their TV, um, and I'm not sure why. So it's on channel six, um, and it is... Um, also on the YouTube station as I'm about to read. Um, so we are here to make a decision about how to reopen for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, we will be taking public comment. Um, we also encourage the submission of comments via email at concordinfo at sau8.org. Um, I wanted to note briefly that the district is actively working on a plan to resume in-person board meetings, and we expect to resume meeting in person by the time that students return to school. What we're working on is a space that allows for both remote and in-person participation of board members and members of the public, consistent with public health and safety protocols. So we're confident that we will have that soon. Um, but for this meeting, we continue to have no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously. However, in accordance with the emergency order, we're providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access by other electronic means. Specifically, we're using Microsoft Teams for this meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in the meeting by dialing the phone number 925-391-1169 with a conference ID number of 991-268-400-POUND or by clicking on the link provided on the SAU8.org website. Um, and as we were discussing, the meeting is also being broadcasted contemporaneously on CCTV's education channel, which is Comcast Channel 6, or www.youtube.com slash ConcordNHTV. And a recording of the meeting will also be posted on the CCTV's website. Please note that those who are listening on the education channel may need to turn up the volume on their televisions as the volume for this channel sometimes is lower than for other channels. Um, we're asking that members of the public keep their microphones muted until they are called upon during the public comment period. To reduce the likelihood of background noise, we're also encouraging members of the public to listen to the live stream or the TV broadcast and to rejoin the meeting or to call in on the phone number during the public comment period. Um, so if that's something that you'd consider doing, that would just reduce the volume. Um, and we will make sure that we get to everyone. We absolutely want to hear everyone. Um, we did previously give notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to use Microsoft Teams or to call in telephonically. 
The meeting and pertinent instructions were posted on the board's website at sau8.org more than 24 hours prior to the meeting and are highlighted at the top of the website. Um, so if members of the public have problems with access during the meeting, they should call 603-513-9008. And in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. So I'm going to start by taking a roll call attendance of board members who are participating. All board members will be participating remotely and any votes that are taken during the meeting will be done by roll call vote. Um, so for members, when you state your presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during the meeting, which is required under the right to know law. And please do mute your microphone when not speaking and wait to be recognized. So Ms. Cannon, are you present? I am present and I am alone. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Uh, Mr. Crodo, are you present? Good afternoon, I am present and I'm alone. Great. Thank you, Mr. Crodo. Mr. Crush, are you present? I am present and I'm also alone. Great, thank you, Mr. Crush. Uh, Ms. Higgins, are you present? I am present and alone. Great, thank you, Ms. Higgins. Mr. Parker, are you present? I am present and alone. Oh, great, thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, Ms. Poinier, are you present? I am present and alone. The email one black person on our team. I don't know. Ms. Poinier. What am I going to say? Uh, Mr. Richards, are you present? I am present. I am in the boardroom, so I am not alone. Um, in the room with me is Pam McLeod, Donna Pally, and Jack Dunn. Great. Thank you, Mr. Richards, and thank you. I'm glad that we are starting to get back into the boardroom again. Um, Ms. Smith, are you present? I am present and I am alone. Great. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And I am Jennifer Patterson. I am present and I am alone. And I will ask um, Interim Superintendent Kathleen Murphy to let us know what um, staff and administrators are joining us. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Chair uh, present with us tonight, uh, Jack Dunn, our business administrator, Donna Pally, uh, our assistant superintendent, and Pam McLeod, our director for technology, all joining um, Mr. Richards in the in the boardroom. So that's good. Matt Cashman, our director for facilities, is also on with us. Uh, Larry uh, is with us. Larry uh, Prince is with us. And I think that just about covers everyone. I will say that on the call is our administrators across the district um, anxious to hear uh, comments as well as decisions made tonight. So thank you. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to all of the administrators who are joining. And thank you also to all the members of the public who are, who are joining. We are really looking forward to hearing from you and to actually getting to have a conversation as a board about this really challenging question tonight. Um, so let me briefly review the agenda um, and then I'll ask for a motion to approve it. Our first agenda item will be brief. Um, we're going to call on business administrator Jack Dunn to review bond results and the board will need to take a vote on that. Next, we will move into the return to school consideration. We'll start off with an instructional committee report from Barb Higgins and then we will hear a presentation from Kathleen Murphy about the proposal for returning to school. Then I um, have a guiding principles document that I created that I wanted to share with the board just in terms of the conceptual framework for making this decision. Um, then next we will take public comment. I wanted to say from the outset, we have received so much input and it's been incredibly useful. And I know that I have read through the emails and all of the material that came in and it has covered so many different angles of this topic and it's been really helpful. So thank you to everyone who has already submitted information and we're look forward, look, looking forward to hear the comment tonight as well. Um, and so after the public comment, we'll have a board discussion and a vote. And this is our opportunity as a board to have this conversation. We don't have conversations outside of meetings. So we are really, really excited to actually get to have a conversation and, and see what we think as a board. Um, and that is the agenda. So without further ado, I will ask for a motion to approve the agenda. 
So moved. Is that Tom Croto? It is. Um, so moved by Tom Croto. Is there a second? I'll second it, Jenny. So seconded by Jim Richards. Um, and I will call the roll. Ms. Cannon? Aye. Mr. Croto? Aye. Mr. Crush? Aye. Ms. Higgins? Aye. Mr. Parker? Aye. Ms. Poignier? Aye. Aye. Mr. Richards? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. And Ms. Patterson votes aye, so the agenda is approved on a nine to nothing roll call vote. So next I will turn to Jack Dunn to review the bond results. So Jack, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just go to my slide here. Um, let me go to funding. Okay. So um, for board members, if you remember back in September and October, we took a series of votes to put the board in a position to be able to basically refinance the elementary bonds that were done in 2010 when we, when the three new school elementary schools were built. Um, and we had to wait 10 years before an opportunity comes up to refinance those. They call it in the bond market refunding. And we took it, uh, the board put themselves in a position that when the first opportunity for that to happen came up, the market is favorable. So as you could see from this press release on your screen, um, on July 28th, we sold $33.5 million worth of general obligation bonds and have refinanced and got an average interest rate of 1.36%. That's down from 3.625. And you can see here over the life of that loan, that's going to save almost $10 million. So um, it was a very good day. Um, that will help the budget for each of the next several years. And it also helps for an, a future project as well. Bond Council has put together some language, which you should see on your screen, and I apologize if it's a little small, but I was trying to be efficient here. And um, this language, uh, you do not have to read. Uh, this was sent to you uh, last week, but um, you can simply say that the, you can get a motion to approve as presented and, um, or as prepared by Bond Council, and that will be sufficient for them. Great. Um, Thank you, Jack. Are there any questions? Documents. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, nope, I have a number of documents that had to be signed ahead of time by the clerk, board members and all. And I've, I've had uh, several of you in to get that all completed um, because this stuff needs to be to them by Monday. That why it, That's why it was critical to have this vote because they need to have everything there for Monday in order for the refinancing to move forward. Okay? I'm all yep. set. Great. Thank you, Jack, and great job with that great timing. Um, are there any questions from board members? Nope. Uh, Dave Parker? Yeah, go ahead. I just had a quick question. When I look at the when I look at that, it says the uh, next few years is five percent. Is that and then it goes yeah. down yeah. to how does that work? Maybe yeah, so so what happens is we pay more interest up front than we do on the right. tail end. Okay. Um, because it's structured as an equal principle um, type structure, right? which is different than a mortgage. So there might be more interest up front, but it's lower on the end. And then what you have, what's called a bond premium and the amount that they give you back, all that gets factored in and gives you what the, your total uh, net interest cost is. So it's a very complicated uh, documents in which they prepare that. Excuse me, but they are the rates for each of the coupons. And I can give you the 21-page document that sums all that up. I can send that out to you as well. Dave, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Jack. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Uh, Gina, do you have a question? I don't really have a question. I just want to say, well done, Jack. Well, it was a team effort, and as we said, we saw this coming, and we wanted to be in a position if the market was favorable, when it was extremely favorable. So uh, we took advantage of it, and the school district and city taxpayers are going to benefit from it. 
Wow. No, that is fantastic. And I'm glad we we're able to get it on the agenda so quickly. Um, so is there a motion to approve um, the motion as approved as prepared by bond council? I'll make that motion, Jenny. It's Gina. Great. And I'll second so, the motion. It's Chuck. Great. So moved by Gina, seconded by Chuck. Um, I don't see any hands up, so I will call the roll. Um, Ms. Cannon? Aye. Mr. Croto? Aye. Mr. Crush? Aye. Ms. Higgins? Aye. Mr. Parker? Aye. Ms. Poirier? Aye. Mr. Richards? Aye. Mr. Richards, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Aye. Okay, got you there. Thank you. Um, Ms. Smith? Aye. And Ms. Patterson votes aye, so that motion is approved on a vote of nine to nothing. I'd just like to add my thanks to Jack. Uh, this is $10 million is an incredible savings and uh, great work. Thank you. Thank you. I echo that as well. Way to go, Jack. Thank you, thank you. And thank you again for getting it on the agenda. So next we turn to the return to school. And so the first up, um, we would like to have Barb Higgins give a report on the instructional committee meeting that we held that was really the first presentation at the board level of the tentative return to school plan. So Barb, go ahead. Okay, so hi everybody. This is 21 pages of what we discussed and what went on in the instructional committee meeting on July 22nd. I would like us to be able to get to our discussion tonight, so I'm not going to go through all 21 of these pages. This was the meeting um, chaired by the instructional where the administration and um, administrators in the schools presented the three options to, the, to, the, to, to us as a board um, and all of the different things that, that have been looked at by the admin, building, safety, transportation, all of the... All of the um, all of the aspects and the work went into coming up with our three our three plans, fully included, a hybrid plan, or fully remote. Um, it was a phenomenal meeting. There was a ton of sharing, a ton of comments, lots of questions. This wasn't a meeting with public input, but the public was invited to listen, and several people did. We heard from our teachers' union um, around the concerns of the teachers, which which fueled our superintendent to speak with the union leaders. The, the union presidents of all the different unions representing all of the employees in our district, bus drivers, custodians, maintenance, um, food workers, teachers, teaching assistants, you know, this, <laughs> you know, the trite little it takes a village is, is hugely important in this, in this, um, in this venture. Um, the meeting was long. Um, it was very, very positive. I felt in a very, very stressful time. Um, everything was discussed. Um, Principles to go back, teaching and learning models, surveys, fully remote, fully in person, hybrid, everything, everything that could go into making any of these um, options successful was discussed and presented and hashed out and cut apart at this meeting. Um, unless somebody has a specific question about it, I feel that really this instructional committee meeting was the beginning of our parent forums, as difficult as they were techn technologically. Um, the conversations, the emails, all of it, this, it all started with this meeting. Um, and here we are tonight to decide as a community what to do next. Um, so unless anyone has any questions, I'm not sure I need to um, share much. Jenny, what do you think? No, I think, I think that's great. Thank you. I think it's a great introduction to, and really speaks to our process. Yeah. Um, and so next I'll turn to Kathleen Murphy to tell us what happened after the instructional committee um, meeting um, because that was a lot and um, and where we are now and what, what is being proposed for board approval. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we're here tonight to be able to make some decisions because I think that it's, it's very apparent that uh, there's a lot of anxiety and worry about the decisions that will be made that impact our kids. So I'm really happy that we're here tonight to be able to do that. I can't thank a number of people that have been working on this, administrators, our teachers, our support staff, uh, all stepped up to help develop the plan. Uh, but I think the, the thing that has been incredible has been the outpouring of recommendations, thoughts, ideas, 
uh, questions, concerns that people have emailed to us, whether it was through Concord Info, uh, SAU8.org, or whether it was direct emails to myself or our assistant superintendent. Uh, but it has been terrific, and I really appreciate that. I know it's not easy, and I know the decisions will be difficult. But we have, I have personally been very pleased uh, at the interaction that we've had. Since the instructional committee meeting, we had two forums. We broke those forums into sections. So we addressed elementary, middle, and high school on one night. We repeated it again on the second night, uh, again, uh, addressing elementary, middle, and high school uh, questions. That was very helpful. And all during that time, uh, we posted our PowerPoints on the district webpage under Return to School 2020. We also, when we were getting questions, we tried to keep up with them. Now, there were hundreds of emails, so we were working hard trying to uh, kind of see what the themes of some of the questions were so we could respond. We have a frequently asked questions list that is posted on our website. And, and we will continue to update that. That's not a, a document that will, will be the way it is today. We will continue to update it so people get current information. So if I could, I'd like to start uh, the PowerPoint. I think, uh, Jack, you have that. Uh, Donna, do you have the PowerPoint ready to put up? I do. Thank you, Jack. Oh, there we go. So... Um, just, uh, I, this isn't a full uh, PowerPoint. This kind of collapsed the longer ones, um, but into the essential things that we've been thinking about. But for this, this slide is probably the most important. This is the slide that drove us in the development of the plan. And first and foremost was to make sure that we ensured the health, health and safety, well-being of our students and staff. That was tantamount to this, to this plan. We also watched this episode. Which episode? <laughs> the whole we show. <laughs> I think someone, to someone needs to put their phone on mute. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We also knew, I mean, we're educators. Our goal is to teach and, and students learn. And so we wanted to make sure that we could, in, in every way possible, make sure that the students um, attain the grade and course competencies that were in their particular grade level. So that was important too. And all of the models that we'll present, that was a priority. We also knew and we got a lot of feedback about the importance of the social emotional piece for our, for our kids. You know, they've been out of school since March. They miss their friends. They miss their teachers. They miss all their activities. So when we were developing the plan, that was also a priority for us. We knew, too, on uh, uh, bullet number four on this list, as support the uh, needs of our vulnerable population, we knew that there were a number of youngsters that are at risk. You know, students have challenges. All students have challenges, whether they're in the whether they're in an advanced placement class, whether they're in typical classes, whether they need extra help for maybe a learning disability or uh, they, they have challenges uh, in, in, in a variety of issues with learning. We, not, we wanted to make sure that we would be able to address those for those, particular, for those youngsters. Uh, and, you know, the next one is about equity. We, you know, we've, we've done a lot of discussion about that. We're working on curriculum to ensure equity, but we also wanted to make sure that there was equity around technology and the way we, we delivered information to our students across all of our schools. We've tried really hard about ongoing communication. I feel terrible about what happened on Monday night. I, 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 I take ownership to that. I'm responsible as the superintendent to make sure that the board is, uh, has the opportunity to speak with the public and the public speaks with the, with the board. So uh, we all took, I took that personally. I felt terrible with that because ongoing communication is critical in this issue. Um, so I'm hoping that we've uh, got over that hurdle, and um, and tonight's a good example of how we have improved on that. Um, we also know that we need to empower our building administrators. We've heard a lot of issues around, well, what's the schedule going to look like? How are we going to manage it? What will the children know about what class is taught at what time? 
you've heard a lot of things about four by fours and and um, and hybrids. So we want to be able to empower our administrators after the decision is made about which model to be able to um, uh, present their models for schedules uh, consistent with our goals, of course, and also making sure that we use the most current effective pedagogy um, by our teachers. So, you know, that, that was really important. We also want to make sure that we have enough resources for our staff and, we, and, and that we support them in that. And of course, ensure operation and fiscal feasibility. I'm, I'm so pleased, uh, Matt Cashman, our director for facilities, uh, Jack Dunn, our business administrator, have been working very hard and making sure that we can use FEMA money, that we have CARES money, um, so that we can make sure that we have the kinds of uh, PPE and the materials and the technology that our students require. So and just think about when I, when I go through these steps, think about us using these guiding principles because I think they're tantamount to this presentation tonight. Jack, could we go to the next slide? And so I'm going to go over very briefly the models. We, we have a, a full in-person model. That means we bring all the kids back. Um, the, the problem that we had when we did that uh, was that we had issues around space accommodations. You have a class of anywhere from 20 to 25, 26, and you have a 900-square-foot classroom. Some of them are a little less than that, I might say. We can't get all the students back in. As much as we want, there isn't a teacher that I've talked to or, a, or an association union head that hasn't said we want to be back, but we have some limitations and that's one of them. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, Matt Cashman uh, set up rooms for me. We went and visited them to see how many desks and uh, or tables and um, furniture that we could get in a room and we just couldn't get all of the youngsters into, the, into a classroom. We also looked at outside space. Maybe there's places in the community, in the city, that we could, we would, um, would avail themselves of, that we could use. But we, we knew that we didn't have enough supervision for those sites. We were concerned about nursing and support staff services at those uh, off-campus sites. So we, 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 we set that aside. But if we go with full in-person remote, it will be dependent on the number of students who opt for remote learning. And we know that that's happening. We've gotten, we received a number of um, uh, communication from families that have indicated to us that they will, uh, they will opt for remote learning. If that number is, is whatever that number is, and, and after tonight we'll, we're, we're going to send out a survey to find out what those numbers look like, we may have a better idea about the numbers of children that we can bring back into those classrooms. So that's still a possibility, but it's going to depend on the number of students that opt for remote learning in order to pull off full in-person model. The next slide, if we could, Jack. The, the, the second slide is the one that most of you remember from the spring, and that was the full remote, remote model. But we learned a lot in the spring, and we learned that across the districts, in the communities, in the state. We know that we need more structure, that the students needed more tight schedules so that they knew what time reading was and what time math was or what time their, their uh, Spanish class was. So we want to have more structure to their schedules as well as more live face-to-face -face instruction. The, the students told us and the parents told us that they wanted to be able to see more face-to-face -face time with their teachers. And, and, and so we recognize that in the full remote. And we're working on that with the teachers right now through training. Uh, we, wanted, we also heard from uh, the students that they wanted a chance during remote learning to interact more with their peers so that we needed to make sure that they had their advisory time, that they had their morning meetings and class, class time so that they could have time to interact with their peers for, for, for their friends that they haven't seen for a long time. And that was important to them. We, we will continue with regular communication with, uh, between teachers, students, and families. That's important. You know, some families didn't hear enough from us during the spring, and we absolutely want to improve on that. 
Uh, and, and the students wanted to hear more about how they were doing. They wanted feedback and, and uh, from their teachers. And we've talked to our staff about that and our principals so that we can make sure that the, the students are getting alert, are hearing about how they're doing, uh, including uh, assessments, things that we can use to assess and track our student progress. We also want to monitor more closely student attendance and support um, those at-risk students. And for those youngsters that weren't engaging, and we have already identified our counselors, our social workers, our school psychologists, all of those folks who um, will help us to make sure that we um, find those youngsters that are not engaging with us. Could, and so the third model that we're presenting tonight, and 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 and, uh, and and I will make a recommendation on, will be that students will we would do a hybrid, and this will enable us to give opportunity for youngsters to be and to have that time with their teachers, but in much smaller groups. So we break up the students, we assign them to an A group and a B group. And the A group meets twice a week with teachers in class, in school. B group also does the same. Um, a would meet on Monday and Thursday, B on Tuesday and Friday. We had some feedback about, well, why didn't we have A meet Monday and Tuesday so we had consistency? The reason that we went to the Monday, Thursday was we didn't want the B group to have to wait till Thursday to have their lessons with their teacher. It just seemed like a, a long span of time uh, between youngsters being with, with, this, with their teacher. On Wednesdays, uh, every week we would do, uh, students would participate in their remote activities, uh, some live meetings, some small group instruction, and um, activities with uh, various uh, integrated arts, art, music, um, physical education, uh, some of the e extracurricular activities that we can do remotely. M many of the uh, concerns around youngsters with um, the, uh, our populations that needed additional support, we know that they, we, they may attend school in addition to their A or B group so that we meet their individual education plan or we meet their 504 plan or we meet the, the needs of our English language learners. So some of the students who need extra time may attend in addition to group A or B. And that will all be designed by their, by their special education teacher, case manager, and those um, the, uh, special education coordinators at each of the buildings, assistant principals. And Parents have asked, well, how will I know which group I'm in? And that will be a notification from the uh, building administrators. They will notify our parents that you're in group A or group B so that everyone knows uh, what their schedule will be. If I could go, yeah, okay. I, 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 we are recommending that all students and staff grades K through 12 will be required to wear masks while in the building. You know, there's been, you know, I know there's some issues around that. I know there's some concerns about it. But I have to say that I think the teachers are so skilled. And when the teacher works with the youngsters, even the K-1-2 uh, students, uh, they will be able to um, assist the youngsters in, in terms of wearing the masks. Um, I, Jack, I lost my screen. Is that... I froze, didn't I? Can you still hear me? I think, I think the slides disappeared for everyone. Oh, did they? All right. Well, I'm going to keep. Again. Yep. We're all so. Frozen. We will. Okay. So, um, please mute. Go to the meeting. If you could, if you could mute. Online. If you could mute it's your phone. If you could mute your. If everyone could mute their phones, that would be helpful if you could mute them. Thank you. And so we'll get back to that. We'll also provide youngsters with mass breaks throughout the day. And we're obviously going to ask parents to help us to help students get ready for school by practice wearing their masks. But I think the, the recommendation here is, is that when we have in-person instruction, we are going to ask all students K through 12, to, uh, they will be required to wear their masks uh, uh, while they're in the building. We could go to the next slide. Um, 
the in-person instruction for our students will, the class sizes will likely be around eight to 12 students in a class. Um, this is another, we absolutely expect and that we will maintain a six foot distance inside. I've heard three feet, four feet, you know, uh, we are asking uh, in, in order for this to, to be pulled off with the utmost uh, respect for health and safety of our students and teachers that we ma maintain a six foot distance inside. Students will be assigned permanent seats in a class. They will also be in a cohort. And what I mean by that, the students will stick together. Teachers will go to their class. In other words, they won't be moving around all over the building. We'll keep them together in their, in their classrooms um, and the teacher will go to them. If they have a, a, a class, a music class or some special class or the science enrichment class, those, those teachers will go to them. Um, materials will be limited in the sense that we're not going to be sharing materials. There's not going to be a big box of crayons and everybody takes out a crayon and, and puts it back in the box. They'll all have their own supplies that they will keep with them to avoid any of the touching issues that, you know, with all the materials. We've already started ordering signage in the buildings. We have uh, created pathways, so kind of reminded me of the supermarket where you can have to go one way on an aisle and up another aisle to go another way. So we're 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 working that out in our buildings, uh, so that we will come will have pathways that will prevent as as much as we can mixing of the groups. Outside space will be used. We really we really think this is going to be very helpful. Uh, we've already um, tentatively have orders in for. Uh, tents, 20 by 30, that's 600 square feet. feet. We can get uh, several groups out there. They can have some instruction. We know the weather in December doesn't work for tents. Hopefully, we have our fingers crossed that things will get better by then, but um, uh, we will have tents on site. Um, and as many of you know, some of our schools have amphitheaters outside where kids can have classes and lessons outside, and, and that's going to be a goal. Um, and we are recommending there will be no large group meetings or events uh, held in our schools. Uh, I have this slide in here for your consideration tonight because we know that no matter which model is finally decided on tonight, we need to make sure that we provide our teachers, whether it's remote, whether it's in-person, whether it's uh, um, hybrid, that we provide our teachers and our staff with training. They're going to need to have a lot of training on the on COVID-19, what, what are the symptoms, but they also need, if they're doing remote learning, they need to make sure that they are adhering to all of the, um, the stipulations that we're putting in place in terms of schedules and, and all the criteria for teaching and learning remotely. So we need to give them time, and I'm asking you to consider changing the schedule, amending it to a September 8th. Um, opening for our students. Um, we have often been asked what, this question comes up a lot, why, are you, why would you go from one to another? What would trigger you to decide to open and then have to go to remote? And honestly, we look at this information every day and um, Dr. Noble has been awesome. He's going to speak in a couple of minutes, but he's been very helpful in keeping us informed um, about the status of COVID-19 in our community. You know, just recently this week, uh, Merrimack, the county, Merrimack County, had only a 0.8 uh, per 100,000 and was considered a green area because our numbers are so low in Merrimack County. So we watch that. Well, how many new cases, how many, um, uh, have we had any um, uh, increases? So we've been watching that every day. Um, we also, as I said, we get medical advice from Dr. Noble, but we also hear from Dr. Chan um, from Department of Public Health at, um, at DHHS, and they've been also very helpful. State have given uh, the schools guidelines along with uh, federal guidance from the CDC. All of those pieces of information from our scientists and our doctors have really been what's guided us um, as so that we can be compliant uh, with the utmost safety for our students. I, I noticed over the last few days in some of the emails and uh, messages, if we could go to the next slide, Jack, 
Um, we've been getting a lot of questions around safety protocols. We've really detailed all of those protocols on our website. We have a much more um, uh, in, more information on the site um, than I have on my screen tonight. But we're going to be asking families to complete screening at home first, and then we will have screening in our uh, schools. Every student will be, uh, the temperature will be taken uh, prior to their uh, entering into school. We have uh, hand washing will be done throughout the day. We have sanitizing uh, systems in every single classroom that will be available for kids to keep their hands clean, which as you know is one of the CDC um, regulations uh, that they've asked us. We'll, we'll uh, also have a, a cleaning and disinfecting routine uh, under the leadership of uh, Matt Cashman, our facilities. He's already uh, looking at his staffing patterns, making sure we have additional staff in the buildings during the day so we can constantly be cleaning and disinfecting areas in the building, um, as well as when the students leave and we do deeper cleaning. Um, he's bought um, the kind of equipment that we need in order to disinfect all of our classrooms and places where our youngsters will be. Um, we have recommended that visitors and vendors not be allowed in the building during the school day. The, to, to check and, and do all the screening of folks from, from the outside, we felt uh, could put us at risk, and we really uh, were reticent to allow that. So we are recommending no visitors and vendors during the day. And of course, we will, strict, we will have strict adherence to the CDC and the Department of Public Health advisories. And those advisories are response to COVID-19 symptoms. What do we do when we, see a sim when we see somebody with a symptom, whether it's a student or a teacher? There's clearly a protocol that youngster is immediately, or the teacher has, is immediately removed from any areas. Uh, we have uh, rooms identified where a youngster or teacher can be, obviously wearing masks, and then they will, um, they will be asked to leave the building and sent home, you know, with the parents uh, to um, to call their physician and do what the phys their physician recommends. In terms of the cases of if there was a, a response of a case of a COVID-19 diagnosis, then we have a whole set of procedures from that. So we will be, we will be working with the Division of Public Health. The first thing we do if we have a symptom or we we find out that there's been a diagnosis, then we will um, we will contact public health. They know they know that they have folks on the line responding to school districts um, 24/7, and they will provide us with the, lead, the direction and the guidance that we need. Could could who's that? Could you? Mute your phone, that would be helpful if you're on. People could mute, thanks. Um, we also know that if we get an in-school confirmation of COVID, then we, again, we will be in constant contact with uh, public health and they are they will advise us in, in terms of the steps. But we, are, we know we have steps and we will identify where that student or teacher was, who may have, they may have been in contact with. And, um, and, and so any of that, uh, we asked, some folks asked about contract, contact tracing, and that's done by um, the public health. Others have asked, well, will we know? Will we know if there's been a case? Once public health is involved, they will identify anyone who may have been in contact and um, and they will they will reach out to the families and then once that's done I will then send out from the superintendent's office uh, information for the parents so it's it's uh, parents will know what's happening in any school should we have um, a, a confirmation of COVID nineteen. Um, I, you know, we put this in really quickly. That this has come up a lot about our air handling, and and I just want you to know that again, we work with Train Technology, Seaman Industry, and our two engineering firms, H.L. Turner and R.F.S. Engineering. We've are we've been in contact with them. 
we um, we have changed out all the filters in all the seven schools. Uh, we do that at, we, we do that by the way on a regular routine. That's not anything unusual uh, to happen, but we, we do that every quarter. Um, we also have been advised that we will set our systems to run at full capacity, bringing in 100% outside air. And that was, an, again, a recommendation from uh, CDC. We uh, reached out to our engineers, uh, asking them to evaluate our system, ensuring that we can maximize our system operations. So we're working with them. And of course, when the weather permits, in any case, we will, we will have the windows open where needed and encourage outside learning uh, where possible by using the, by using the tents that, we will, that we'll set up. <clears throat> Athletics at the high school, I'm sure um, many of you have heard just today, uh, the NHIAA has set forward a schedule um, of opening for athletics. Um, we just got it this afternoon. I just got it this afternoon. So there is a staggered schedule uh, that they are recommending for athletics. Um, the the, the uh, ones that will start up first will be those non-contact, uh, for example, the golf and cross country. Uh, they'll start up by the beginning of September. And the last group that would um, would start up would be the uh, the cheerleading uh, and the uh, football, which wouldn't happen until the end of the month. But we still are going to expect that there's certain um, protocols that we're going to follow. I expect the coaches to make sure that they take the temperatures, that we um, we do the daily screening. You know those seven questions that we ask. Um, where have you been? Have you been in contact? Have you been out of the state? Those kinds of questions. We're asking anyone, uh, the coaches, that they um, must wear uh, masks if they can't socially distance. Um, and, and students coming and going to and from school, uh, they must wear their masks until they're on the field. Um, and so we're working with our coaches, making sure that they have the proper training uh, in the protocols and procedures um, should uh, we decide to go forward with the athletics for the year. Uh, let's see. And we, you know what? In this posting, we have some resources. This, um, the PowerPoint that I'm using tonight will also be posted on our website. So with that, that kind of um, gives you a highlight of all of our meetings that we've had thus far. But I'd like to take a few minutes, if I could. I, I asked uh, Dr. Noble. Um, Dr. Noble uh, is over at the Concord Hospital. He's a, a, an infectious disease doc. And um, so we've asked him to uh, share his thoughts with us. Uh, he's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, we really appreciated his guidance. Uh, and he's always been available to us. So uh, kudos to, to you, Jim. We really appreciate uh, what you've done for us. And so if you have a few things that you'd like to share, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, let me, I'm going to talk probably for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, if that's okay. Um, first of all, let me, let me tell you who I am. Uh, I am uh, Jim Noble. I'm so, an infectious Dr. disease Dr. Noble, excuse me. You're getting yes. a little bit of feedback, and I'm not sure why that might be. Um, okay. Do you have multiple mics on by chance? No, I shouldn't. Okay. Can you hear it okay now? Yep, it sounds it sounds a little bit better. Well, I'm so. going to back up a little bit then. So uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist. I've been practicing for 41 years uh, in this field, originally in my home in New York, and then in Boston for 22 years, and then in New Hampshire since 2002. Uh, I've spent part of every summer of my life, starting when I was three months old in central New Hampshire, uh, it's been a lifelong ambition of mine to live here, which I was finally able to realize, uh, as I said, in 2002. Uh, my, I have two sisters. One is a teacher. One is a nurse. I'm married to a nurse. Uh, my grandmother taught in New York City public for 55 years. Uh, and so I've had uh, uh, personal as well as occupational involvement with the, uh, uh, the educational system. I have seven children 
uh, all of whom have gone to public school. I went to public school for 13 years. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the wonderful experiences I and my children have had can continue. Um, I have been working with COVID since, I guess, early January when I saw the first reports coming out of Wuhan, China. We saw a patient from Wuhan on January 23rd who, in retrospect, uh, pretty clearly had COVID. The virus is a member of the coronavirus family. Uh, there are, prior to COVID, there were six known human coronavirus types. Uh, and although people tend to minimize the non-SARS, non-Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronaviruses as quote unquote just a cold, uh, these viruses can cause severe uh, laryngitis, tracheitis, pneumonia, uh, and in their most uh, exuberant forms uh, are capable of causing fatalities. Now, this virus is new, at least in terms of the human population. And is the cause, the name of the virus is SARS coronavirus 2, to distinguish it from the original SARS outbreak in 2003 4. Uh, and it causes a disease known as COVID. I noticed lately uh, there has been a tendency to ascribe the term COVID, which is an abbreviation of coronavirus disease, to all patients with positive tests for SARS CoV 2. And I think this is a little bit misleading, and we'll get into this a little bit later, talking about the results of studies that have been done. Uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spread throughout the whole world between January and uh, May or June uh, with incredible speed and incredible attack rates. Uh, there are something like 18 or 20 million declared cases in the world now, and in places where the virus is spreading fastest, uh, India, uh, Brazil, the other uh, South Latin American countries, uh, and uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, I think it's unlikely that all the cases are being tabulated uh, correctly. I think Brazil will is on track to catch the United States uh, within the next month or so, uh, as is India. So the the magnitude of this problem is is uh, is really quite significant in the United States. Up until yesterday, there were 4.8 million declared cases and about 160,000 deaths. Now, you've all heard uh, that not all these deaths are caused directly by the virus, and I think that has some truth to that. But nevertheless, the virus has a very significant risk of harm, especially to people that are uh, in high-risk categories, namely people over the age of 70, people with morbid obesity, people with hypertension, and to some extent, people with diabetes. Uh, we've had considerable experience here in Concord with COVID. We've treated over 100 uh, patients at the hospital. We've only had one death since May 1st. Uh, in the beginning, uh, all over the United States, uh, lack of experience with this disease and lack of knowledge about what it really was able to do was associated with excess mortality. I think that there has been Tremendous progress, both in attacking the virus directly with antiviral therapy, but most importantly, in supporting the sickest patients with interventions that have been demonstrated to be effective. And although the number of cases in the U.S. has been rising uh, significantly recently, the number of deaths has not nearly uh, followed the same track that it did in March and in April. Uh, I don't have slides to present, but I want to hold up a picture. Uh, because it's relevant to what I'm going to discuss. Down here, this is a graph that shows rise and fall and then rise again in cases in the United States that's current from uh, March 1st up until today. And many people who see this second increase in cases are referring to it as a second spike or a second wave. This is really not correct. Um, the attacks attack of the disease occurred mostly in the northeastern United States in March and early April. And in this region, cases have declined to incredibly low levels. The places in the south and southwest where there was a tremendous expansion of cases in June and especially in July 
have followed pretty much the same pattern of rapid increase, stasis for a week or two, and then decline. These cases are declining in all those states now, Florida, Texas, Arizona, Southern California, Louisiana, are all posting uh, declines now. Uh, the reasons for, so it is incorrect to uh, view the United States as a single entity in terms of epidemiology, where there's one peak and then another peak, as if that's inevitable that it will occur here as well. I don't think that's true. Uh, and this has not been true in the rest of the world as well. Uh, in Western Europe and in China, there is this incredibly rapid sustained increase in cases that occurs followed by declines. Now, these declines don't go to zero. Uh, there's still this transmission of the virus that's occurring all over the world. But in places that have had one of these uh, two to three week periods of intense transmission, we really haven't seen a return to those levels of transmission uh, occurring now. Some numbers that are relevant to New Hampshire. New Hampshire's had a total of 6,742 cases. Now, I want to say a word about the case definition. Uh, everybody knows you can get your nose swabbed and have a, a quote-unquote COVID test. What the test finds is a fragment, a gene, of the RNA that is the heart of the COVID virus. Uh, the test does not date how long that's been present, and we know it's possible to be present for many, many weeks and even months in some cases. Uh, not all those people are sick. In fact, uh, less than half of those people have symptoms or ever develop symptoms. This group of asymptomatic RNA fragment positive people is the most important group uh, to discern or understand the future of the epidemic, but it is the group that has the least, uh, about which we have the least understanding. Uh, so of 6,742 cases in New Hampshire, 699 had to be hospitalized. There are currently 21 patients hospitalized in the state. There are 419 deaths in the state, which are greatly skewed towards congregate living facilities, that is nursing homes and rehabilitation facilities, and to the elderly. I can tell you that of people under the age of 40 in New Hampshire, there's been one death since the beginning of the pandemic. And in people under the age of 60, there have been 17. Uh, so this is really the mortality of this disease occurred early in March and in April for the reasons that I've explained, uh, and especially among people uh, with significant risk factors. Uh, of the states of the United States, in terms of total cases, New Hampshire is 49th, uh, trailed only by Vermont and Maine. Uh, and of uh, th these are new cases. And of new deaths, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont uh, have had zero for the last uh, week or so. So uh, New Hampshire is at the bottom, both in terms of cumulative and uh, cumulative cases and cumulative deaths. Uh, only Vermont and Maine really have had uh, a more benign experience than New Hampshire. New Hampshire had co has had, as I said, concentrated illness in a couple of places in uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, and rehab hospitals, especially. Um, in terms of current data, there are no inpatients at Concord Hospital. There are six at CMC. There are eight at Elliott, two at Southern New Hampshire, and one at Dartmouth. Uh, and this is uh, really as good as it's been uh, the whole time. Uh, as I said, I think our, our understanding of how to treat severe COVID when severe COVID occurs is responsible for the marked decline uh, in mortality. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about transmission. I think this is coming into focus. Uh, I tell people that I think about 40% of this disease has been revealed and about 60% remains to be revealed. Uh, in the beginning, I think people were working with what I call a spilled paint model. That is to say the, the disease or the virus is a can of paint. You place it over Manhattan Island, knock it over, and then the disease spreads out like paint, uh, getting thinner and thinner the further away from the can it gets, but in a more or less uniform manner. This isn't true anywhere. This disease is very granular. Uh, there are hotspots 
And it doesn't matter how far down you go with the microscope to cone down on those hotspots. There are hotspots in buildings. There are hotspots in blocks. There are hotspots in neighborhoods. There are hotspots in counties. Uh, there are hotspots in states. And there are hotspots all over the United States. And so this is true in the rest of the world as well. And that tells us something important about the disease, which is to say that uh, although there are cases everywhere, intense transmission occurs in urbanized settings. And I believe uh, that what is going to be revealed, or not revealed is not the right word, but which is going to be generally accepted, is that this phenomenon of intense transmission and intense spread is related to indoor uh, air exposure, uh, which is why I've been so gratified at the response of the district in terms of uh, working to upgrade filtration, upgrade air exchanges, and to make a plan even for the winter that's going to involve uh, air, uh, uh, air exchanges, because I think that's really the key to these very intense transmission events. Uh, everybody's probably seen this story about a summer camp in, I think it was Arkansas, where they required people to be tested before they went to the camp, and they were all negative, or it was one positive, or something like that. And they, after two weeks, there were 320 so-called cases that is positive test. We don't know enough about this event to uh, be certain about what really went on here. Uh, the, most importantly, we don't know what tests were used pre-camp, what tests were used post-camp. We do know most of the campers who had positive tests didn't have symptoms. And so again, there is this sort of subterranean or uh, invisible spread of the disease. Uh, I can tell you that in Europe, where uh, in Britain, where people went back, in France, where people went back to school in the beginning of June, they haven't noticed a marked increase uh, of illness among children, which is what you would expect, because children tend to do very well when they're exposed to this virus. But they also have not noticed a marked increase in community uh, exposure, as you would expect if uh, children were going home from school infectious and infecting their households and others. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know about transmission of the virus, and there's a lot that we don't know about prevention. Uh, I know that Massachusetts has adopted a three-foot separation rule for going back to school. We've discussed this. I think that the six-foot rule is uh, a little bit of an overstatement in terms of what we know. Uh, the reason for six feet is that droplets that are expelled when someone coughs or sneezes tend to travel about six feet before 99% of them have fallen to the ground through gravity. Uh, there is a uh, distinction that's drawn between airborne spread of viruses and bacteria and droplet spread of viruses and bacteria. I think that SARS-CoV-2 pretty clearly does both. But as I mentioned, there is something else that's going on that accounts for the degree of intense localization of disease in certain parts of the world. This was true in Wuhan City in China. This was true in New York City. This was true in Bergamo in Italy. It's true in Houston today. But even within those areas, as I said, there are, this is not a uniform distribution. This is very granular. And I suspect in the Northeast, we're indoors when it's cold. In Florida and Texas and Southern California and Arizona, they're indoors when it's hot. And I think that uh, that probably accounts for this uh, onset of intense transmission down there when the weather turned are really hot. I think the plan, as it's been outlined, is an excellent one, uh, both in terms of the use of masks, the use of physical distancing, and the use of rotation of students uh, to minimize indoor crowding. Uh, I can't say that uh, there can't be a transmission occurring in a school or in a camp or in a club or, or otherwise. We still do see low-level transmission occurring in New Hampshire. I think everywhere that has been through a period of intense transmission, as we went through in April and early May, has continued to see very low-level transmission events. But I think it's reassuring that we have not seen a resurgence, at least not yet, and that we've been able to uh, minimize and in New Hampshire almost eliminate mortality uh, due to proper treatment of the disease, both with antivirals 
and drugs that attack uh, the inflammatory aspects of the disease. So uh, that's where we're at. I think most districts are uh, going back to school with some kind of modified schedule. Um, and I think that uh, 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 my recommendation to the, to the people at Concord is that, that their plan is really good and that they should go ahead and try to implement it as best as possible. So, Dr. Noble, I've got one question for you. Do you, can you speak at all to this is Jennifer Patterson? Um, yes. To the criteria that we would use, were we to start off with a hybrid model to switch? What do you? Can you give any advice on what would be a triggering event or level? Um, yeah, to switch to 100% attendance. You mean? To no. To well, I guess to switch both ways to 100% attendance and 100% remote. Yes, I I think. Um, you know, uh, Potter Stewart, who was a, uh, a U.S. Supreme Court justice in the 60s and 70s, uh, was uh, wrote a majority opinion about an obscenity case. And uh, he was challenged by his fellow justices to define it more precisely. And he said, and he actually wrote this, in a, this is actually in a United States Supreme Court opinion, that he can't define it very precisely, but he knows it when he sees it. Uh, I think that there is no hard and fast rule. I don't think that I anticipate a level of transmission and illness occurring in the schools in Concord following the plan that's been laid out that you would be it would be necessary to close the schools. Uh, as I said, I think that we don't know nearly enough to answer everyone's questions about every possible eventuality, but it does look like uh, once you're through uh, your wave or your surge or whatever, that what really happens is sporadic transmission. Now, there's enormous controversy, as you know, about all of these interventions, about masks, about distancing, about lockdown. People have passionate opinions, uh, pro, con, that are based partly on their beliefs about the disease, partly on their political beliefs, and partly otherwise. And I think that uh, it is certainly possible uh, that you'll see uh, negative events that will lead you to a decision to go to full remote. But I think it's unlikely. And I think it's really not. Uh, I know a number of school boards have said, well, if there's one case, we'll close the school for 10 days and, and you know, decontaminate the environment. I think the role of the environment per se in this disease, at least in terms of opinion among experts, is in serious and rapid decline. I think that normal cleaning procedures, as we've talked about, uh, with the administrators uh, are more than sufficient to do that. I don't think it's necessary when you have one case or two cases uh, to close the schools uh, for even a brief period of time. But I do think that vigilance about uh, persons who might become ill, it's more important than ever that people that are ill not be in school. I, I think that's, that's that. Going to 100% attendance, I think that, again, if we continue to see declines throughout the fall, New Hampshire is already 49th in the country uh, in terms of new cases. And once you get to zero community transmission for a week or two weeks or three weeks, I think that's the time to have a discussion along those lines. And, and uh, one other thing I should mention is that uh, there has been work on a coronavirus vaccine for a long time. Uh, not for the SARS-CoV, obviously, but for other coronaviruses. And the reason for this is that the money in vaccineology uh, is worker absenteeism. In other words, if you, if you want to propose a vaccine development program, you're much more likely to have it funded and much more likely to have the vaccine paid for if it gets fewer days of absenteeism from the workforce. But to be fair, the urgency of coronavirus vaccine development has been uh, minimized throughout the years. Now, this obviously is a very different situation. Uh, there are billions of dollars and incredible amount of talent that's being devoted to uh, vaccination. And it is possible, I think, that there will be candidate vaccines uh, released from the trial environment for administration to the public by, let's say, November, December. And if vaccination becomes feasible, then I think that's a different uh, that's a different dialogue. Great, thank you, uh, Jim Richards. Uh, do you have a question? 
Yeah, thank you. I just want to ask um, the doctor, and thank you very much. How often should we reevaluate our plan? Would you, would, you, would you mind saying who you are? I'm sorry. Who am I talking to? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Jim Richards. I'm the vice president of the board. I'm a board member. Um, okay, sure thing. Sorry, my my uh, that was my mistake. I should let you know. Um, I just have a question with regards to uh, how often you recommend that our team get together and evaluate our plan, literally for, formally get together and uh, say, we're on the right track, we're keep going where we are, or we need to change course. I think that uh, I'm working, uh, at least on paper, I'm working with the team through the end of August. Uh, and it may be possible, that may get extended into the school year. I certainly have no, no quarrel with that. I think that, um, there's two, there's at least two aspects to that that I can identify. One is how's school going? You know, like, like how are things going with the kids, with, the, with staff? Are we meeting, uh, objective criteria that this is a successful way to educate students? So that's one, but I assume you're asking me because I'm not a teacher uh, about the medical part. Uh, and I think that we should be checking in probably at least once a week uh, for uh, uh, teacher absenteeism, student absenteeism rates, uh, and any concerns that people. Uh, let me let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an an anecdote. Okay, so I've been in the hospital. I'm actually on vacation. Uh, this week and next week. Uh, and prior to August 3rd, I was in the hospital every day from February 27th to August 3rd. And from that perspective, and oh, by, by the way, I'm 70 years old and, uh, you know, I have reason to be concerned about exposure uh, to COVID. So from that perspective or, or living that life, if you will, when I began to do consulting work in June, I discovered all the people who hadn't been out of their house since March. And, and so that's a very different way of looking at this disease or feeling about this disease than, than the one that I've been living in. Uh, but I think that uh, it should be possible once people are getting together and doing well uh, for, uh, you know, reassurance to spread to reassurance. Uh, whatever happens in your schools and whatever happens in Concord is going to happen in the rest of New Hampshire as well. Uh, I think New Hampshire has Ben Chan and Elizabeth Talbot, the, the epidemiology dynamic duo, are fantastic leaders and uh, really have their finger on the pulse of all the communities in the state. But I think, I think that a checkup once a week, a COVID huddle, as we call it at the hospital, uh, once a week is a reasonable thing to look toward. Does that answer your question or did I get, get lose, lose track? Hello? Jim, we're not hearing you. I don't know. I oh, think wait, you're on mute. Check. I don't know why that is. Let me just take a look. Click on me. There we go. Uh, I'm good. Ooh. Sorry, yeah. it just there's okay. a little delay yeah, here on mine for mute. Okay, and right. yes, yes, doctor, I just wanted to know that if we start remote, how often we should be uh, we should be looking at things and considering things. And if we start in a uh, in-school model of some sort, how often we should. And I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Sure. Great. Thank you. And we've got a couple of other board members with questions. Uh, Chuck Crush first. Uh, yeah, Dr. Noble, first of all, Chuck Crush, I'm a board member. Thank you for your time and thank you for uh, being with us on your vacation. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess my question is, so I work in healthcare um, in Massachusetts and was on a call today uh, with some epidemiologists and some infectious disease folks from Harvard and Mass General who shared some different information. Uh, certainly, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, but there are a variety of opinions out there from a variety of physicians, a variety of infectious disease specialists. Uh, the CDC guidance change frequently, as I'm sure you know. How do you explain that, and how do you explain the guidance that keeps changing and the, the varied opinion of infectious disease specialists and epidemiologists? Sure. Uh there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I think there is, uh, uh, you know, the term disagreement. I, I, I was going to say fundamental disagreement. I, I don't think that's really correct. I think that the, the 
all of us uh, feel pressured to answer questions, reasonable questions that people have. And when we, in, in the clinical realm, uh, this happens, I don't know, a hundred times a day. You know, you have to make decisions about patients, what's wrong with them, what treatment to give, et cetera, how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're very used to being asked by a colleague or being asked by a nurse or being asked by a family member, what to do about this? Going, you know, bang, 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 that's what you do. When the knowledge base is as fragile as this knowledge base is, it's possible for people to say one thing in the morning and something different in the afternoon. And I think, although it's understandable to me about why this is true, I think it's had a very harmful effect in terms of confidence and the degree of anxiety that people feel. Bob Redfield, who I've known for more than 40 years, who's the head of the CDC, uh, you know, there's there are memes or there are Twitter Twittergrams, you, you know, that line up all the things that he said that, you know, A is A and then A is B, you know, within a six hour period of time. I think we're all sort of uh, we're all sort of trapped by the urgency of these questions and by the rapidly developing state of knowledge. I think let me let me give a couple of highlights that I think are important. Oh, and, and of course, uh, in addition to that, all of that sounds very sort of scientific and noble. Uh, uh, there are other factors that, that, are, that are at work as well. Uh, uh, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's a very common saying, and it's, a well, it's one that's well understood. Uh, there is enormous uh, political ramifications to this disease, and people have passionate and, and uh, strongly held opinions about that as well that get into the advice that they give. Uh, I think it is uncomfortable for a lot of people, maybe particularly for academics, to have to make life-altering decisions without proper foundation or without having completed uh, research that's necessary to really give the correct, what to their mind is the correct answer to the question. Uh, I think that for CDC in particular, I think there will be consequences when this is all over. Uh, I think that you're quite right to point out that uh, the guidance not only changes day to day, but changes and changes back in ways that have great influence on the way patients are treated, as, as well as uh, prevention measures that are undertaken. And I think it's something that we all have, we've all been living with since February. Uh, and I think it just it reflects, as I said, I think about 60 percent of the 60 percent of the cake has not been sliced yet. Thank you. I don't know if that's helpful or not. It, uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, another board member, Tom Croto, has a question and Jim Richard sure. looks like has his hand up for another question. So, Tom, go ahead. Thanks, and thanks, Dr. Noble. I really appreciate your comments and your time from your vacation to be here with us. Um, can you talk more about the COVID huddle that you mentioned? Um, one of the things that has been bothering me, making me think really hard for the last couple of weeks is how do we know if we're being successful? How do we know if we're not being successful? Um, and how do we know what kind of checks and balances to use? So could you, I know you talked about teacher and student absenteeism, which is, you know, obviously that's, that's going to be one key factor. What are the other things that uh, you would talk about in a COVID huddle? Um, we, we have a COVID huddle every day. Uh, and the things that we talk about are uh, absenteeism, potential exposures, questions that people bring from home, from their families, et cetera. I suspect that in the beginning, at least, people are going to want to have their questions addressed. They're going to have a lot of concerns, a lot of questions. Uh, in conditions of uncertainty, um, the guidelines, the six feet, the mask, et cetera, uh, develop an almost totemic quality. You know, if you can't control the big thing, which we can't control the big thing, you get really focused on the little things. You know, somebody went into the cafeteria and they, they had their mask off, right? Well, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, the significance of that single event 
is probably nil. But uh, the significance of people disregarding ordinary precaution measures as a matter of habit can snowball, can be like a snowball rolling down a hill. And so that's really what I think Huddle's focus on. What are people's concerns? What are people's observations? How are people feeling? How are people doing? And it's a good opportunity to, to touch up the rationale for the measures that have been adopted to keep people safe. Thank you. And I just have one quick follow-up to it. Is it your expert opinion and expectation that we'll see an uptick once the colder weather comes and more people in New Hampshire are, are inside? I don't think so. But I, you know, again, I'm, I, I, and I know that's a tough question. I, I apologize. No, it's not a dumb, it's not a dumb question. It's a good question, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to hide behind the 60% unrevealed, you know, SARS one, uh, which was a very similar coronavirus, uh, physically, chemically, et cetera, et cetera, and in terms of its ability to cause harm, uh, disappeared very rapidly. And it didn't disappear because of anything that was done in Canada, in Toronto, or in China. It disappeared because, because it did. Uh, so I think that I'm going to, I'm, to answer your question properly, I'm going to have to back up a little bit and talk about immunology. So uh, there are things about COVID that, quote unquote, everybody knows. You know, most of those things aren't true, but, but there are still things that everybody knows or thinks they know. One of which is that the antibody response to COVID is weak and that antibodies form poorly and they go away quickly. Now, we're used to using antibodies as a way to define immunity. Part of this is because of government regulations. For example, if you work in healthcare and you have, you're required to be hepatitis B vaccinated, the way we know that the employer did their job and that you're immune is by measuring antibodies. But it's not actually those antibodies that protect you from infection. It's actually long-lived lymphocytes that protect you from infection. What their role is is to recognize a pathogen and explode, causing your antibody levels to rise a thousandfold, ten thousandfold in a day or two that protect you. And there's a very interesting series of papers now coming out that say that 60% or 40, 40 to 60% of people in Western Europe anyway already have T-cell immunity to SARS-CoV-2 without ever being exposed and without ever having COVID. And I think that that's the most, the most probable explanation for why you see this incredible rise in cases. And we've seen this, as I said, everywhere. Wuhan, Bergamo, New York. Florida, Texas, Arizona, Southern California, the shape of the left-hand curve in these epidemics or outbreaks is the same everywhere. And then they decline, and they don't get over 20%. Now, oh, the Diamond Princess cruise ship had an infection rate of 19.7% in people who were exposed for weeks. The USS Theodore Roosevelt, which is an aircraft carrier, had an infection rate of 20-some, 21%, I think. And again... So the, the everyone susceptible with the new virus and the model doesn't say this disease should cut off at twenty percent. It says it should keep going. Now, there are two possible well, two, there are more than two, but there's two generally held, tenaciously held beliefs about this fall off in cases. One is that the locked down states and countries are doing a great job. And that the reason it goes to 20 and then falls off is because everybody's staying home, everybody's wearing a mask, everybody's six foot distancing, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately for that, there are contrary examples. Uh, California is one. I have a slide when I do a long slide presentation where I show, you know, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, New Jersey, uh, up and down. And then you, for, for, for people who uh, are aficionados of uh, uh, Tom Murphy and Andrew Cuomo, I put up their pictures. And so these guys have did a great job, right? And then uh, I could show Florida and Texas and Arizona and put, put up a picture of their governors and say, you know, look at these dummies. They, you know, they let people go out and have fun and whatnot, and look what happened to their states. But then you, the, the contrary, of course, you could put up, you could use the data to show anything. You know, you could put up California and you can put up um, 
uh, uh, a loosening state that are both rising at the same rate. In California, you get arrested for going to the beach. In California, they're starting to shut off the water and the, the uh, electric power if you're caught in public not wearing a mask. And in, there are states that are much looser that have identical curves. So I, I think that there's something biological about the disease that we don't understand that causes rapid decline in new cases. And I haven't yet seen a credible example of a second uh, event that's like the first one. So Dr. Noble, I think, I think I'm going to stop you there because I think we've got an awful lot of people who are on. Oh, sure. We do need to hear our public testimony. Um, of course. So this, I mean, it's fascinating. I, I appreciate so much your being here. And I think, um, you know, we have a lot of questions just about the specifics of our plan and, sure. and we have some comments that we'd like to hear. So I just, I think I'm going to turn it back to Kathleen and just, was there more information that you wanted to present um, about about the proposal? No, no I think I think uh, you all should discuss. You all should discuss it. I think it's a great proposal, uh, and I think that uh, the people who worked on it have done a great job. And uh, I'm going to hang up on vacation, and you all can do that. Great. Thank well, thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you so much, for, Jim. I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Your information uh, was very valuable. Ha enjoy thanks, your vacation. Pleasure. Enjoy your vacation. Take care. Um, Jenny, uh, I guess I would like to finish up by recommending to the board that I that we believe that the a hybrid plan would allow us to go start in slowly, part of half the kids in and on each of those days, uh, so that we can have that teacher student interaction and still allow for parents to choose the remote should they desire to do that. And so I'm recommending to the board um, a hybrid uh, with a, a remote option for the parents. I'm also recommending the calendar. I'm recommending to you that we enforce the six feet distancing as well as the masks and all the safety procedures that I outlined tonight, including air exchanges, outside uh, activities for the students, uh, and the... the um, the work that we will do to sanitize all of the areas. So I guess I'll leave it at that. And I know you want to hear from, uh, from the community and, uh, thanks. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you've done. I think it was very interesting to be looking at the comments that had come in and to look at the way that the proposal was evolving in response to comments that we'd received. I know that we've had some, questions and comments that have come in more recently that may not have been fully answered. So I think that people may be wanting to comment on and, and may have questions. Um, and I don't know to the degree that we're going to answer for specific questions here. There's a question and answer up on the website. There are many more questions than have been and can be answered on that. And I think for me in thinking about this from a board perspective, um, I you know, I had a diagram, and I don't know if anybody has it to put it up there, um, that we may talk about when we get to the board discussion. Jack, do you have that um, that diagram that I came up with? If not, I can share my screen. There it is. There oh, it great. Is. Thank you. Um, so I had a lot of questions as I thought about what we were being called upon to do as a board tonight and I don't know if this will be helpful or not. I like to make diagrams, but I, you know, we have the excellent principles that were presented at the beginning. I kind of try to encapsulate them into four areas, one of health and safety, one of operational workability, one of learning and growth, and one of equity. And, you know, one of the things that I can circle going back to and that we may hear comments on is that question of of equity because I find that to be one of the more challenging ones. So I just, I wanted to, to flag that um, from the outset and we can talk about it more as board members when we talk after we hear the public comment. But I just, I think that a tremendous amount of work has been done and there are still questions that are gonna be difficult to answer. Um, and I think the board will really have to look at how we can support the ability to be successful, in this model and to meet these very high level criteria in a way that really ensures success for all of our students. Um, 
So I think with that, we will move into public comment. And we have, I think it looks like 285 people, something like that. We have a lot of people on. Um, and we really, really, really want to hear from you. I think many of you have already submitted emails. Not all of you have. Um, so again, the purpose of the meeting is to make a decision on school reopening. We are asking that folks focus on that topic. We do have a policy that limits public comment to five minutes per person. We hope that folks can be even more succinct than that. Um, because we will be here for a very long time, but if we have to, then we will. Um, and I think what we're hoping to do is to have folks who wish to, to comment write their names on the comment function. And then we also have our, um, I think Jack Dunn and Pam McLeod, who are supporting us from a technical perspective, who can go through and make sure that we get everyone's public comments. So again, we ask that you focus on school reopening. We've got other meetings coming up where we can talk about other topics. That's not the only topic that we are faced with as a district, but it is the focus of our conversation tonight. And truly, we need input on that so that we can make a decision as a board tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, Jack, can I turn it over to you to work through the folks who want to comment? Jenny? Yep. This is Jim. Is that Jim? Yep, go yeah, ahead, Jim. I just want to add the one thing. Um, uh, as people, we want to hear... You know, we all want to hear as many people and as much as we can. Um, and there are a lot of comments. We are taking notes and uh, minutes of this. So if people could please um, identify themselves, spell their name, and then state if they're a Concord resident, uh, that will help Lyndon a great deal. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jim. I neglected to say that. Uh, so Jack, are you able to facilitate the, the folks commenting? Will that work? Yeah, I can do that. What I thought was I would go with people who are logged on and raise their hand. I can start with the hand raise, try to do two there, and then move to the phones and kind of go back and forth. Is that all right? Yep, that sounds fine. And again, to the, to the degree that folks are on and they have had their comment and they've had the question answered, you may want to you know listen online on YouTube. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we're getting more people. I think, do we still have a 300 person limit? I, you know, just, yes. you could consider doing that if you've had your comment. Um, and if you have another way that you could watch just to make sure that we get to hear from everyone. Jenny, may so, I okay. ask a question? Jenny, this is Lyndon. May I ask a question, please? Yes, Lyndon, go ahead. Um, I, I am looking at conqueredinfo.org. How do you want me to present those questions? Not on YouTube. You got to put it in. Why don't we have Jack go through folks that raise their hands first and folks who, you know, who want to ask their question um, verbally. And then if there, there are still questions that we haven't gotten to that came in through Concord Info, then we'll get to them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I will mute myself. And if everyone else could just mute yourself, if you are not being recognized, that will yeah. help us all be able to hear. This is what we're worried about with this one. So, okay. All right, ready? Um, so I'll start with the first hand raise of Jeff Van Pelt. If you're available and want to make a comment, please go ahead. Yeah, I am. Thank you. Uh, again, it's Jeff Van Pelt, J-E-F-F-V-A-N-P-E-L-T. I am a Concord resident with two kids in the school system. Um, the good doctor earlier referred to something that caught my ear. He said, you know, he referred to it as an eventuality, and I think it is a, an eventuality, right? We know that if we open up the schools fully or even remotely, part, you know, hybrid model, there are going to be cases. We've seen it in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi over the past two weeks, where they've opened up schools and within the first week have had to quarantine students. What is the school board's plan for that when that happens? Is, it, is that something that has been thought through? and that you can say, here's what we are going to do, and how are you going to deal with that? Yep, thank you for that. And again, I think we are not answering questions because we haven't made a decision yet. We'll be making a decision after we hear the public comment, but certainly a point that we are wanting to talk about and to consider. Okay, Kate F. If you want to speak, go ahead. 
Yes, hi. I'm curious. I'm, I'm Kate Fry. I'm a Concord resident. Can someone please explain what the four by four schedule will be at the high school? There's been um, many of us who've asked multiple times and we still have not had that explained to us. Would you like me to do that? Um, Mike, I think that would be very helpful. We have gotten that question a lot of times. I think a lot of people have that question. So okay. Mike Rudin so, is the principal of Concord High. So uh, uh, four by four, not similar to the hybrid, and they're two separate things. Uh, I would just think of them uh, almost metaphorically as cleavers because they're cutting things in half. Uh, with, a, um, with a hybrid, we're bringing in half the kids one day and half the kids the other day. And uh, I think everybody understands that. With a four by four, we're doing the same thing with the classes. So traditionally, Concord High School uh, students take six, seven or eight classes a year. Those classes run all year for about 45 minutes. Um, what we are proposing is that they take four classes at a time for 90 minutes, one semester, and then three or four classes at a time um, for 90 minutes in the second semester. So um, that, you know, and, and the impetus for that, I guess this is really the most important part, the impetus for our suggesting that is the uh, inevitability of kids having uh, either all or uh, partial, uh, uh, partial education online. So the prospect of kids having six or seven or eight classes uh, remotely um, at the same time where they were in a, um, a situation where every day they were doing six, eight, 10, 12 hours in front of a screen seemed to us untenable and certainly unhealthy. Um, and we thought as an, as an ad hoc type of uh, uh, move that we could make structurally uh, uh, to, to restructure the way the day went, that a four by four made uh, sense for this coming year. Uh, it's not a permanent thing. It's a tool that we had that we thought would make sense uh, for the kids just to be able to um, navigate uh, classes in, a, in a, uh, a much more realistic way. Where I think for a lot of, I mean, some kids, <laughs> some kids you could put, in a phone booth and give them 15 classes and they do fine. But I think for most of our classes, uh, for most of our kids, the prospect of having multiple six, seven, eight classes online at a time uh, is just overwhelming and they get lost and they and, and it, it goes downhill pretty rapidly. So it's just, it's just making the classes longer, uh, just taking four at a time, three or four, depending on, depending on how many they signed up for. And, um, uh, or doing that each semester rather than everything at the same time. Is that the so case? Mike, okay, go ahead. I, go ahead. Is, is that the case also if it's remote? If it, yes. If, okay. Yes, but the, the difference is that both, both the hybrid and the um, remote classes will be synchronous. There will be a, there will be a set schedule, uh, but the uh, um, remote classes which will meet every day will be one hour in length rather than 90 minutes in length. So that's a, that's a distinction right there. So Mike, I have a question related to that. So would the student take the same number of classes over the course of the entire year? So it would be basically like a quarter system? Yeah, they would. If you're asking me, would they take the same number of courses as they would have in the, the, the eight period system that we uh, traditionally have had? Yes, they will. And I think, I, I, you know, I mean, we're talking about a lot of kids and a lot of variables, but I think most of the kids will be able to get most of their most of the classes they signed up for in the hybrid model. Now, that's going to become much more um, variable with remote because that's kind of contingent on the number of remote teachers we have and which subjects they teach and obviously the number of kids we have in remote. So those things, it's not going to be um, uh, exactly the same in that sense, because I think our resources, our human resources in, uh, in remote are going to be more limited. 
Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Jenny, I'm going to move on to the next hand. I'm going to try to do three and three, okay? Okay, great. Go ahead, right. Jack. Martino of New Hampshire, if you want to speak, please go yeah, ahead. Thank you. Um, so, um, so my name is Martin, uh, and I'm a um, Concord High School graduate, uh, class of 2014, and uh, I attended Dame School, which is now the community center, uh, Broken Ground, which is uh, Crystal McAuliffe, Conant, which is Abbott Downey, um, Walker School, which is the um, the, the news news place and um, basically and then run the middle school graduated uh, Concord High School so I'm just curious like listening to the plan and everything um, I haven't heard um, anything about uh, anti-racism the anti-racism that we've all been talking about earlier like and and included in the reopening plan um, especially when we know that black and brown populations are going to be uh, disproportionately affected. Um, shouldn't shouldn't, shouldn't um, the reopening also have that tailored in? Um, so that's that's my question. And then also, yep. I'm also curious um, if the school's opening, um, why, why are you guys meeting online? Like, shouldn't you be meeting in person? If you're going to be having students, um, if, you're, if, if you're just discussing opening the schools, I mean, still have the online platform, but I feel like it would make sense, too, if you guys were meeting in person. It would make more sense. Yeah. No, thank you for that question. And we did address it at the beginning of the meeting, but I'm happy to answer that question again, which is we are working on getting an appropriate setup so that we can meet in person. It's a little bit complicated, obviously, just as the question of school reopening is complicated because we have to make sure that we as board members can see and hear each other and speak to each other. And we also have to make sure that members of the public can comment and participate both remotely and in person and that we can meet appropriate social distancing and health and safety requirements. But we do expect that we will be meeting in person um, definitely by the time that school starts and possibly sooner. So that is a priority for us. And in terms of the anti-racism, I, I mean, that is certainly a very, very, very important initiative. We'll be getting an update um, on that when we have our rescheduled monthly board meeting. I agree with you. There is a component that relates to the school reopening, um, and that's certainly one of the considerations that I'm sure the board members will be talking about when we talk about equity considerations related to reopening, because it is an important consideration. Okay, Jenny, uh, if I go with I'm curious, like, what are you guys going to do about it? Right. Well, we have a very extensive initiative that's going on. I think we're not going to, it's going to be beyond the scope of this meeting to talk about it in detail, but we have a meeting, I can't remember whether it's scheduled yet or not, um, where the board will get an update. And there's also a meeting that's been scheduled for next week to actually continue that conversation. And Kathleen, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. I think I can respond in, in a couple of ways. I think I mentioned the issues around equity um, in the plan in that we're making sure that all of our families have the adequate resources in terms of technology and support that they need. That that cuts across all, all of our um, uh, students in the school district. And um, we also know that we have a um, anti-racism uh, discrimination uh, committee going. We have our first, uh, third meeting on August uh, 13th, which we um, have um, sent out information and we're working on that plan. Um, we also know that I will update the board uh, at your next meeting that you've scheduled to finish up from Monday night. So we, we have that. That's a, an important topic and uh, we're addressing the uh, concerns. I know there's many of the top, many of the questions um, and um, suggestions that people have. We have a lot of work to do, no question about it, but we are moving forward with it. Hey, Jenny, it's Chuck. Quick question. Are we answering people's questions during public comment? Because somebody asked me if we were answering questions or not, because we've been a little inconsistent. Yeah, I mean, I think that we will try to answer if we can, if there's someone here who can speak to the answer. 
um, because I think it's helpful, particularly where we have so many people that want to come in. And my hope is that that will help the comment go more quickly. If it seems like there are unanswered questions that we can answer, we may just hear the same questions and I'd rather have that not happen. But um, we, we're not required under our policy to answer questions. So we'll, I guess, have to exercise our discretion on that. Okay, I just think we should be somewhat consistent, so. Okay, phone number ending in 8609, area code 603. If you have a question, please hit star six, unmute yourself, identify yourself, and go ahead and ask or make your comment. Uh, Jay, I'm going to move on to the next one. Phone number ending in 6714, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, identify yourself, and state your comment. Okay, phone number ending in 0112, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and make your comment. All right, Jenny, I'm going to go back up top and start hitting the hands. Uh, Sarah Pratt, if you have a question, please unmute Hi. and go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I, the, I'm really glad that the word equity showed up in the Venn diagram, and I've heard that word um, mentioned a bunch of times. I, I really want to urge the board to consider I, – I, Sorry, I should have said so my name is Sarah Pratt, P-R-A-T-P. I have two boys um, in the Concord school system. One is going into seventh grade, one's going into ninth, and I live in Concord. Um, so the issue of equity for me, um, there's a, a lot of reasons why some people, including me, are leaning heavily towards um, just keeping our kids home and not sending them to school in person in the fall. And so the issue of equity with regard to the 100% remote I just really hope that that's something that the board is going to take very seriously. I'm really worried that um, for those of us who make that choice, for whatever reasons we do, um, that what we're going to be faced with in terms of an option, I'm worried it's not going to have equity with what the hybrid kids are getting. And I'm already hearing from the principal of the high school that there's not going to be the same resources um, in the remote academy. So I just really hope that's not going to be the case. I hope there's going to be some way that the kids who are 100% remote are going to feel like they have some something equitable. I, I know it's not going to be exactly the same, but I, you know, I, I you're using the term equity in terms of making sure people have technology and this and that, but I think there's a need to make sure that there's equity for kids, even like my kids who are very smart kids who you know were able to get all their assignments done and things like that when they were remote, but. Um, really missed out in terms of live instruction and having more structure. And um, I worry especially about my high schooler that he's not going to have very much choice. And that's not an equitable situation. So I'm just hoping that the board will really consider equity um, from that standpoint as well. Um, and I, I also just have a, um, a question more, and I know it, it's not going to be answered. I'm sure no one can answer it. But, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you're – making steps to um, follow all recommendations that, you know, are available in the CDC and other sources. Around the mask wearing, I mean, one of the um, recommendations that you see everywhere is that masks are single use. And so I'm just wondering if you've thought about that. Um, you know, people have cloth masks. How are we going to ensure that they're getting washed, you know, every time they're used even once? I mean, I, I think that's probably... Um, something that's going to be really challenging, and I, I would have liked to have been able to ask um, the doctor about that. But anyway, that's just another comment. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your comments. Jack, can you see the hands? Yep. I can't Rig see the hands. Yep. Sorry, Rigby. Rigby. Buckner, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself and ask and make your comment. Hi, my name is Rigby Buckner, and I'm a CHS graduate of, of 2014. 
Um, I am disappointed with the vague response to the questions voiced earlier by Martin regarding how anti-racism will factor into the district's reopening plans. I am one of over 1,700 alumni, students, and community members demanding concrete and specific anti-racist actions in the Concord School District. I'll read to you the list of demands signed by myself and the community. Release a public statement that endorses Black Lives Matter, institute comprehensive anti-racist curriculum reform, remove the school resource officers from the district and invest in appropriate mental health for professionals, enact restorative justice practices of discipline in school, implement mandatory prolonged training for administrators and staff focusing on anti-racism and implicit bias, diversify staff, track and publish transparent data on racial and ethnic disparities and rates of graduation, disciplinary actions, referrals to law enforcement, and involvement in honors and advanced placement courses. Prioritize for the permanent superintendent position who has demonstrated the, capa excuse me, the capacity to enact anti-racist police policies on a district level. I'd like to know how you're going to address our first demand of releasing a public statement that endorses, endorses Black Lives Matter. So we're working on all of those things. Um, we take them very seriously and we will be having further conversations about it. However, that's not our focus tonight. So um, we don't have any statements on that tonight. But if you have specific comments or suggestions as to how those issues relate to reopening, we'd be very interested in hearing them because we are very serious about addressing those issues. But we're focused on reopening tonight. It does disproportionately affect um, members of the black and brown community. I'd like to know how the school is going to respond in making sure that our students are not um, underrepresented or under-resourced during this time. And how they're going and that's to- That's absolutely the equity consideration that we'll be looking at. Hold on, I'm on number three of those that raised their hand. Next one, Matt McNally, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself and go ahead with your comment. Hi, uh, Matt McNally, M-C-N-A-L-L-Y, I live in Concord. Um, I have a daughter who's going into eighth grade at Runlet. Um, I'd like to say that I share uh, I, what I think is most parents' frustration with the lack of live learning last, last year. So I'd like to know what has been done to to fix that. Have you have, has the district been in touch with teachers? Has there been training? What's going on with the the live learning? If the district decides that we're going to have either a remote, a remote or a hybrid uh, structure. Um, that's a that's a great question. I think that it was partially discussed in the presentation earlier, and there may be more information that's available. I don't know, Kathleen, if that's anything that you want to offer additional information on right now, um, but if you do, you're welcome to. Well, we absolutely recognize uh, the need for more live instruction. Uh, over the summer, we've already begun many training sessions with our teachers uh, using uh, various platforms. Uh, the district has also purchased additional software and applications so that it will um, enhance the live learning that will take place. Um, we absolutely understand that, so we're addressing it through training of our staff and the various resources that they can use with their youngsters um, as they provide that face-to-face uh, -face instruction. Okay, and, and which, um, which software platform will this district be using, Google or, or Teams, or have you decided? Well... Right now, we've been using the Google platform uh, for the most part. Uh, that's the, the one that the teachers have really used uh, the most. But we have some other things that we found. For, for instance, in the younger grades, we saw Seesaw, which was an effective uh, platform for our, our younger K1, 2, 3 students. Um, but they also can use a Microsoft Team, which some uh, staff members did in terms of presenting their lessons. Okay, so is that um, is that the teacher's discretion which which platform to use, or is that going to be mandated? Well, we haven't mandated any particular platform yet. Um, we um, we we have a number of options. Um, we also are looking at Zoom um, because there's um, a possibility. Well, there is um, Zoom offers more um, options, so that we are considering that 
to be used for our staff. So we haven't made that decision yet. We know we have those three platforms that I just mentioned, um, in addition to support software. And um, once the decision is made by the board, we're going to move forward with that and continue the training. The, the uh, emphasis of the training will um, really uh, ramp up over the next uh, four weeks before school starts. Okay. Will the uh, purchasing of licenses to use said software affect the district's um, decision to use which platform? Well, not really, because we do have um, funding. You know, we, we received... Uh, 900 plus thousand from the CARES Act. And so we have um, that money allocated for uh, those kinds of resources. Uh, we also have uh, additional resources in some of our federal grants and our entitlements, which have allowed us to purchase additional um, software and applications for the teachers to use. So I'm, I'm confident. In addition, by the way, there's money in the operational budget that has always been there for technology. So uh, I feel pretty confident that we have the resources to be able to provide those tools for our youngsters. Thank you. Okay, I am now going to move to the phone numbers. Uh, we've been alternating between three hands up and three phone numbers. Um, phone number ending in 3176, area code 603. If you hit star six, then you will unmute yourself and uh, you can make your, please state your name and make your comment. Okay, moving on. Uh, phone number ending in 7989, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six and unmute yourself and, and state your name and make your comment. Okay, moving on, 5290, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name and make your comment. Okay, that's three phone numbers. I'm moving back to hands up. Okay. Um, Regan Bessonette, I apologize if I did not say your name right. Please uh, unmute yourself and make your comment. Thank you. My name is Regan Bissonette. That's R-E-A-G-A-N-B-I-S-S-O-N-N-E-T-T-E. -E -E. I'm a Concord resident and parent. And one of my biggest concerns is uh, our focus on students who have greater needs, whether that be students who have an IEP or need special services or just need additional support. And I did see in the Q&A submitted, uh, circulated before the meeting that these types of students will have the ability to attend school more often than two days a week. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there a need to ask parents who have the privilege to keep their kids home for remote learning to do so in order to offer better access for these kids who have greater needs? Thank you. Okay, if I could move on to Sarah Robinson, if you could unmute yourself and Make your comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Wonderful, thank you. I just want to uh, echo uh, what Regan said and thank you so much for taking the time to do so. Um, I have just a few points and I'll be quick. Um, I hope that the district will use this opportunity to introduce more new and more inclusive materials. Um, oh, and I apologize. My name is Sarah Robinson. I'm a parent and a Concord resident. Um, so uh, using this opportunity to introduce new and more inclusive materials, um, we're being given an opportunity to reimagine what education can look like in our community, and I hope that we'll be taking advantage of it. Um, and that also means administrators encouraging uh, their staff and supporting their staff in using more inclusive materials that are more representative of our student population. Um, assessment plans need to be addressed up front. Um, they should be flexible and they need to ensure assessment won't be used against students, thinking about how 
uh, grading systems will affect opportunities like CASL, competitive summer programs, scholarships, access to future courses. Um, and everyone, which includes teachers, parents, and students, needs to have a clear understanding of expectations and learning outcomes. Uh, and these should be the same regardless of experience, remote or in person. Um, thank you all very much for taking the time for public comment. I know that it makes these meetings very long. Thank you. And my third uh, hand hey, raise. Hey, Jack. Hey, so yeah, is yeah. Chuck. Can, can we try and give an answer to Reagan and Sarah? Because they, they raised valid questions, and I wonder if Kathleen could try and give an answer to, to, their, to their questions, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck, and, and thanks to both Reagan and Sarah. Those have been... Um, those are topics that we've spent a lot of time on. Um, we um, we want to be able if we go to let's let's use hybrid. OK, let's start there first. If we go to hybrid, one of the things that we're setting up is we're allowing to have the opportunity for youngsters to spend more than just their A or B group with us so that they can have more face to face instruction with their um, their teachers, their special teachers, whether that's occupational therapy, um, um, their physical therapy teacher, their um, um, English language learner. Um, it could be tutoring and reading and math. So we we are we have that built into the hybrid plan. In terms of the remote plan, because there are people that are going to choose to stay home and that, and yet their youngsters do need um, some services. So some parents have said, can I keep my youngster home, but bring them in just for their, um, maybe their speech and language session. Maybe it's a, a reading lesson, whatever. We're, we will allow that to happen. It'll, it'll be scheduling. And the principals are, like I said, the principals are really trying to figure out their schedules and working on their schedules. Um, but in addition to that, um, we will be working with our um, our providers for special services to work with youngsters remotely. There may be some cases um, where we aren't able to provide all of the services that a youngster may have on their IEP. And so we, we, we understand that there may be times when we have to focus on compensatory education for those youngsters at some point. So those are the options that we have um, at our disposal right now. And certainly if folks have some other ideas, and I appreciate I know I've heard from Sarah and Reagan, and they've sent in um, some notes to us. Um, we're, we're, we're more than open to hearing from our parents in, in ways that we can provide service. We do have a couple of our private providers, people like um, people who provide pr um, physical therapy. They um, indicated to us that um, if it's possible, the youngsters could go to their facility to receive their physical therapy um, units that, that that are required in their IEP. So we're looking at all kinds of different options that would um, help the families and obviously help our students. I hope that answered that, Chuck, for for them. Do you, do Thank you think you, there's anything yes. else that I might have Thank missed? You. No, I think that was a, a comprehensive answer. Thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. Okay, moving on. Uh, so our third hand raise, Kelly Qualey, if I pronounced that right, please um, unmute yourself. Um, state your name and your comment, please. Hi, nice job on pronouncing my last name. Most people get it wrong. So I'm Kelly Qualey. I live in uh, Deerfield and um, I'm kind of a minority in this group because um, Deerfield is a very small percentage of kids that go to Concord. Um, I know that nobody's going to be happy with the decision the school board makes and I understand that. Um, I am pushing and I'm hoping that the school board will end up doing a five day a week. Um, that being said, um, I'm pretty sure that the school board's going to vote hybrid. Um, in that case, however, I find that K through five, six through eight and nine through 12 are very different situations. They're very, very different. Um, my three kids go to Concord high school and, um, Going two days a week and three days uh, remote learning is definitely setting them up for failure in every way, shape, or form. 
Uh, we barely got through the spring. And if I didn't step in, and thank God, I, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I was able to step in. But without myself stepping in, they all three would have failed several major classes, including English, math, um, GAC, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if the school board is willing to take a look at these three separate situations and maybe make decisions based on those situations. Um, not sure if that's possible. Um, there's a lot of people on here that have ki kiddos in elementary and kiddos in middle school, and I understand that. Obviously, my focus is high school. Um, so I just want you to consider the way that's going to look. Um, I also have a kiddo that has an IEP. Honestly, I'm less worried about him than my other two. They're typical learners. Uh, one junior and two sophomores, but um, yeah, so I just, I, I want the school board to really consider these three separate schools, you know, um, K through eight is a lot different than nine through 12. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move to back to the phone numbers. Uh, Phone number ending in 1973, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and say your comment, please. Okay, from there, next phone number ending in 6337, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and make your comment. Okay, moving on, 5156, last four digits, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your comment, Thank you. place your name and state your comment. Thank you. Okay, I'm moving on back up to the hand raise. Yeah. All right, Zeus Simone, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself. And uh, state your name and comment, please. Uh, my name is Zeus Simeone. I'm a Concord resident um, and also a, a teacher myself, although I teach uh, colleges around here. Um, uh, and my name is Z-E-U-S-S-I-M-E-O-N-I. -E -E uh, I have a couple of kids in Concord High School, so all my, question, all my statements will be mostly based upon that. Uh, first of all, I do want to say that I do like the hybrid model. I teach the hybrid model myself in colleges. Uh, it can work fine as long as the teacher puts in a lot more work than they normally do. And this, this is actually kind of key. The problem with any online learning is that the preparation kind of takes forever. And uh, you make up that time because later on down the road you can use that same preparation for later classes because you've you've made videos you've yeah, have to stuff that. you've prepared all this stuff but uh but that's just what good online learning takes um as a tip uh i believe kathleen was mentioning that a lot of resources had been purchased uh with allocated monies i have personally found that buying resources doesn't work very well um I've had bad luck with it in the past uh, in my own classes and with my own students who have used some of these uh, resources as in, you know, my own children that were uh, taking classes at Concord High last semester. Um, if the teacher assigns some pre-made video, the kids don't learn much about it. Uh, they don't learn much from it. If a teacher takes the time to record a lecture and put that on YouTube, that the kids do tend to learn more from. Uh, and a lot of these resources that you buy are like practice assignments to give the kids. And, uh, and they, they just turn into so much busy work that wastes the kids valuable time. Um, so I think kind of in, in, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, just find out what has already worked not just what is being pitched by the various salesmen trying to sell these products is going to be a little bit more useful. Uh, the fact is online teaching is done often. Um, heck, I'm even personally starting up an online high school only program from the local community colleges to offer, uh, in this case, Psych 100 classes uh, for students. So I would love for these students to actually have 
uh, online learning have a good reputation and not just have them hate online classes because they've been done so poorly. This should be kind of an opportunity for kids to be comfortable with good online programs and not the absolute disaster that it was in the last couple of semesters uh, in this spring. Um, and, and so I completely expect the hybrid model will be successful until a couple of schools in New Hampshire completely explode with coronavirus and then we'll need to shut down. But at least at that point, we'll have gotten some good face to face time in uh, and we're at a good opportunity to do that. One thing that I am worried about, however, is sports. I cannot imagine why anybody is thinking about starting up sports. Why poke this bear? I realize kids want to do it, but people want to do a lot of things we just can't do. There is no greater risk a person can do than play basketball. I mean, think about the, the jump ball. Two people grunting in each other's face as they jump up to reach the same, uh, the same ball. There is no way you can keep infection from spreading. The fact that we like these things doesn't mean that they're needed for the education. Um, football isn't any better. This seems absolutely crazy to me. This doesn't even include the problem of people mixing with other schools more than they need to do. Why bother with sports in the middle of a pandemic? Uh, the only one that seems even possibly feasible seems to be baseball, which was not actually listed on the uh, potential plan. That one, as long as you keep the control the dugout, it seems more feasible. I understand kids want sports. I even understand that we need to do some model without fully knowing all of the effects, but I don't understand why we would do something that we know is risky and we know is a bad idea and could just possibly uh, make things worse. Thank you so much. Okay, Eric, if you could uh, un Mute yourself and um, state your name. Yes, thank you. Make your comment. You're welcome. This is uh, Eric Fleming. It's uh, E-R-I-C-F-L-E-M-I-N-G, and I'm a resident of Concord and have uh, two of my girls in the school system. Um, with safety as kind of a, an utmost concern, uh, while many of us who are, are working parents are trying to get a grip on, you know, what our, our work and uh, caring life balance looks like as we move forward. I'm, I'm curious to hear what the school system has planned for a lot of the aftercare programs that are typically in place, particularly the Y programs, um, how that is. I'm not even looking at the comments. I'm just not even. Oh, sorry. Yeah. As it relates to uh, as it relates to the hybrid plan as we move forward, so I was hoping that somebody could address that. Kathleen, do you have anything briefly on the on the uh, aftercare? Jenny, this is Kathleen. Yes. Yep, go ahead. Please. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, we've lost power here, so I'm not on on the on my system, but I'm in calling in by phone. Um, that we have, we've actually been in discussions with our local Y uh, program, as well as the Boys and Girls Club and our 21st Century Project, which we have programs that we have availed throughout the city. And so we're working uh, with them uh, to um, develop programs so that we can have before and after school uh, support for the families and, um, and a safe place for youngsters to, to uh, be in attendance. I, I appreciate that. And do you have a sense of the timing about when details about that program information might be revealed? Right. As soon as we get through tonight and we have a recommendation, um, that's one of the issues. Um, we've already had uh, several conversations with them. Um, they, are, uh, they are ready and able to step up and provide that service. So it's just a matter of having a, a plan and a model that we can jump onto and, um, and then um, embed their programs uh, into the needs of our students. Okay, sorry. Um, the third hand raise, uh, McHugh family, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself, state your name, and go ahead and make your comment. Hi, this is Rebecca McHugh. I have a daughter at Runlet and another daughter at Concord High School. 
Um, and I would just like, I, there's, I could make many comments, but I'm going to just stick to one at the moment. Um, I would just like to invite the board and the SAU leadership to wear masks and go spend six or seven hours inside anywhere above the first floor in those two old buildings between September and late October. So even if I thought hybrid was a good idea, which I do not, um, kids wearing masks for seven hours inside buildings that can be upwards of 80 or 90 degrees is, is unhealthy, even if we didn't have COVID going on. So I just am wondering if any of the board members or any of the SAU leadership have actually been in the shoes of our children who will be put into those conditions wearing masks. Because it's one thing to be in an air-conditioned grocery store for 40 minutes in a mask, and it's quite another to be in a very hot, very old, very poorly ventilated building um, for six or seven hours. And I know the newer elementary schools may be a bit better I, I haven't spent enough time in those to know, but I, I know that, that for Runlet and Concord High School, that's something that really needs to be thought through before you're sending staff and children back into those buildings, at least during like really warm temperatures. So that, that's my comment for the evening. Great, thank you so much for that comment. And um, Jim Richards is going to facilitate for a little while, so we're going to swap over, and I'm still listening, though. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move down to the phone numbers. Um, after these three, I have five more phone numbers, although we haven't had much of a response from there. I will continue to toggle back and forth through until we're through them. So phone number ending in 716. One area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and make your comment. Okay, nothing moving on to uh, phone number ending in 3180, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and make your comment, please. Okay, phone number ending in 3907, area code 603. If you have a comment, unmute yourself by hitting star six. State your name and make your comment. All right. Thank you, Jack. I just want to remind everyone that uh, we want people to be able to uh, State to identify themselves, to uh, spell their name, please, and to state if they're a Concord resident. And um, and as per our uh, policy, 136 uh, comments should be five minutes. And Jack, do you have something else for us now? Somewhere, someone else. I'm going to move to Lyndon Jack. She has some questions that were emailed, and I'll let her speak to those. Okay, I'm just going to read these into the record. Um, Kelly W. Can everyone? Can you hear me? First of all, can anyone hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Okay, thank you. Kelly W. writes: If a child is kept out due to a cough or other symptoms, what is the process for them to come back? Do you need to have a test? Stay home for 10 to 14 days. Next comment from Lisa Moore. If my family chooses remote, will we be able to change our minds as COVID numbers decrease? Conversely, if we choose to send to school, can we switch to remote if we feel it is unsafe? Next comment from Heather LeBlanc. Will there be a screening table before entering the school? COVID-19 is serious and droplets travel more than three feet, so I don't see how three feet is safe. COVID can happen fast. I think more than once a week check-in would be a good idea. Parents like to send their kids to school sick. What is going to happen to them? How will the nurse deal with sick students? I think we should follow the 620-100 rule when it comes to school. What about the seniors? How will this be a good memorial year? And then a question, um, comment from Beth, no last name. You missed the mark on your first slide and first bullet point. 
ensure health and well-being of students and staff. Staff. I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Could everyone please mute their mic, their microphones or phones? Ensure health and well-being of students and staff. Where do the children go after school? Neighbors, grandparents, aunts, etc. What happened to the safety and health of their families, family or neighbors, and many grandparents community? Look at Georgia, Mississippi after four days, or regardless of where they stand in the USA. Another question, another comment or question from Tanya Pennard. Is there cleaning that will occur between group A and group B? If not, it's less likely to be able to contain infections between the groups. Seems to make more sense to not do cleaning on Wednesday, but rather in between the groups, in-person visit. Also, if there are middle schools and high school siblings, will the siblings not be part of the same group A or B? Another comment from Liz York. Dr. Noble's insights are helpful. I hope you will consider that in Europe, the students returned to school for only eight to 10 days, then broke for summer vacation. When Israel, who had only 100 cases per day reopened, cases exploded. Is it not wise to start remotely or at 25% capacity and then gradually increase numbers when we've proven that we can gather safely, have had time to teach kids safe practices, and can see that these practices actually prevent disease spread? A comment from Sherry, Sherry Burbank. It's not appropriate to expect public schools, which are funded to be run in person in groups of 25 students to run another model without significant additional funding. Our kids' lives are too valuable to be subjected to this experiment. We should suspend formal education until we have four consecutive weeks with no new cases in the country. She wrote county, I suspect she meant country. A comment from Amy Schur, or Cher. I am a teacher at RMS and want to point out to the public that what happened in the spring is different than what will be remote this year. The spring was emergency planning. Now, with training, planning, and schedules, it would look very different. We are seeing adults who cannot follow the guidelines set by the CDC. It seems unrealistic to think that students would be able to do so. Also, think about the damage done to the community if a teacher or student were to get very sick and or die from being in the building. Um, comment from Sharon Gallagher, Concord resident and Runlet paraprofessional. Many special ed students require one-to-one -one support. If we go to the hybrid model, how would staff maintain six-foot social distance? What would be the expectation for staff who are required to work with students who may require physical interventions? How would staff be kept safe? At RMS, security has been an issue in the past with problems of unstable adults and youth in the community on campus, as well as issues with animals and community members on school grounds. This has led to a locked door policy. If we go to hybrid, using tents may seem useful for minimizing spread of disease, but I worry this would make students and staff vulnerable to danger from unstable individuals, possible gun violence, and environmental dangers. A comment from Jennifer Thompson. I could not raise my hand in the chat. This is my question. My name is Jennifer Thompson. I live in Concord, and I am a parent of an incoming kindergarten student who has been in the special education system through the school district since age of three. My question is, how will the district ensure in the hybrid or remote learning models that children who receive IEP services, that they will be held to the same standards as with the full in-person model? Will there be an expectation on all providers that the children will have remote sessions with their providers? That was not the expectation during the spring, during remote, and it did affect my child's progress tremendously, and I am sure other parents experienced the same sentiment. When speaking of equity, this needs to ensure special education is strongly considered with these models and the impact on these children. Thank you. Comment from Penny Duffy. As software is chosen, please make sure it is accessible for all students, especially for students who are blind or have low vision. My daughter independently uses Zoom and Google Meet. Other software is not as successful. Thank you. Um, a comment from Beth, 
two hours of listening, waiting for the school board to vote. Why Q&A at this point if you're supposed to vote tonight? Q&A should have been over the past month. Why last minutes? I find this unprofessional and disorganized. Early this week, 45 minutes waiting for technical issues. Never should have gone over 10 minutes. Comment from Deborah Hoyt. Thank you for all the work everyone has put into reopening the Concord schools. I am a parent and Concord resident. I would like to forward a couple of questions and concerns for the board to consider. Number one, if the Concord schools return to either a hybrid model or 100% in-person learning, and given that not all staff may be able to return to in-person teaching, that is, within the buildings, will there be enough staff to safely work with students in the buildings, keeping the class numbers low as indicated in the presentation? Number two, Assuming there is enough staff to be present in the school buildings, will these staff members be able to fulfill the responsibilities in the school, or will the staff present be covering duties, covering a class due to lack of substitutes, and or completing other tasks that may be beyond normal expectations for that staff member? Number three, what expectations are there for those staff that are working remotely? How are these staff going to be held accountable during remote learning? Number four, given that there is a focus on social emotion learning, what agencies slash supports outside the Concord School District will be working or collaborating with all the schools in order to support students, staff, and families during this chaotic time, whether these students be working in the building and or working from home. Thank you for taking these into consideration and for all the work you've done this summer in planning for the return of school. I'll hand it back to Jack. There might be more uh, emails that have come into the website email address, but I'm handing it back to you, Jack, for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first one hand raised, Sean H., if you could unmute yourself, uh, state your name, where you're from, and make your comment, please. Yes, my name is Sean Hackshaw. Uh, I'm a resident of Concord, and I have a daughter going into 10th grade. I've been uh, listening to a lot of what people are saying and reading a lot of the comments tonight in the chat. And uh, the first thing I want to ask, if it's possible, and I don't expect you guys to do it this moment, but if it's possible, could each board member uh, voice your opinion on reopening uh, which plan you would prefer and why. Because after hearing everything tonight and chatting with parents, it seems that most want us to use greater caution and begin fully remote. I also want to acknowledge that each age group has different needs to consider in these models. I've heard it said that uh, K-2 to need the live face-to-face -face learning uh, with their teachers. And if this is the only group that really truly needs to be face-to-face, -face, if everybody else is remote, there's room to spread these children throughout all of the school buildings to have proper distancing and uh, allow for them to learn. Yes, the, the, the K through two is where you build the foundations for everything else. And, and I acknowledge that as a teacher myself. Uh, but I, I think what we need to do also is in a fully remote situation, the special ed services really should be offered at the schools. Uh, wh whether you're a one-on-one -on -one aid with, with a student who has a lot of needs, uh, you, you can be remote still in that situation with the student and working with that student. You know, it, it doesn't require us to uh, segregate the, 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 the students with extra needs. It, it would be irresponsible, never mind illegal to do so. We need to make sure that the social emotional and academic needs of our students are being met. And I think that would be having everyone remote 
with in-person support for those who need those extra supports. Parents shouldn't have to be 24-7 uh, uh, working as a paraprofessional for their student when they're home in a remote situation or in a hybrid situation. Parents need to be able to be parents and students need to be able to be kids and students when it's the proper time. I, I think I've said enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oops. Okay, next one. Nick Musio, uh, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself. State and spell your name, what, where you're from, and go ahead. Hello, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my comment. My name is Nick Muccio. That last name is M-U-C-C-I-O. I am a graduate of Concord High School, class of 2012, and I would like to affirm the comments made earlier by Martin and Rigby calling for anti-racist action in the district, action that is supported by over 1,700 signatures of community members, alumni, and students in the aforementioned petition. I will say that I find the board's intention to dissociate anti-racist work from the specifics of reopening plans at this time disheartening, particularly since we know that COVID-19 disproportionately affects black and brown people. While you keep alluding to equity as a piece of that four-part diagram, I have yet to hear any specific actions you plan to take in any of the outlined plans that addresses racial inequality in the district. I am hopeful that you will be able to provide greater specifics and answers to subsequent questions. The response, this is not the time for these discussions, has been used far too often to stymie discussions of racism. I encourage you to consider issues of racism as not isolated from the issues we are discuss discussing this evening. So given, as earlier stated, that your subcommittee on discrimination has already convened twice, what specific actions will you take advised by that subcommittee in your reopening plans to address racial inequalities in the school district? So this is Barb, and I noticed that no one's responding here. And I just think that this, this is a theme that's come up several times tonight. This is Barb Higgins, board member. Um, and as we put together a plan, I feel that it's imperative that this is this COVID situation and the, all, the whole pandemic affects people differently. And there is absolute medical evidence that um, people of color suffer um, drastically differently than, than white people in this typical particular illness and whatever we put together for our students, we have to make sure that we're covering the, the specifics for every every group of students represented here. So I just want to say that because I feel like the silence was a bit deafening. Bob, this is Chuck. Thank you. I agree. Yep. And thanks. Well, and just to be clear for folks who are listening and who are commenting, the way that we proceed, and there was an earlier comment that said, you know, why are we taking so much time with this? We as board members can't talk to each other about these things except in a public meeting. And the way that we have the conversation is we hear from the public and then we talk to each other. So our intention is to listen to the comments and then have a conversation about it once we've heard all of the comments. So absolutely, those of you who have raised these issues will hear us talk about these issues as soon as we're done taking public comment. That's what we're planning on doing afterwards. We're just not here to engage in a back and forth dialogue on it with every single commenter. I think that would just take too long of a time. So just to be clear, we'll absolutely be talking about this at the end of the public comment period. Jenny, let's. this is Dave Parker. Let's just not respond then because we have been responding and we haven't been responding and that's inconsistent. So either we respond or we don't respond. Because we have been doing a lot of work on anti-racism on this board. We've been doing a lot of work on many things. But either we respond or not respond, please. 
Yep. No, I agree. And I think that part of the challenge is that there are some specific questions that we as board members don't have answers to that are being raised by commenters. Um, and it's interesting to hear from the administrators the, if they have the answers to those. So those are the types of questions that I think we may be providing answers to. But I agree. I think let's try not to engage in a dialogue between the board about these larger questions because that will just take from our time to talk about it afterwards because we will be having this conversation. Yeah. Okay, Liz Britt Salsky, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself, state your name, and proceed with your comment, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Lisa Britt Solsky. I have two boys at Concord High, a rising freshman and a rising junior. Um, so I have three comments. I'll try to be brief. Um, I just want to say that um, it seems more than coincidental that nobody who has tried to offer a comment by phone has been able to do so. And I think that that is equity illustrated right in front of us in real time. Um, and that's a problem. And if we can't address it in these meetings, how should we be expected to address it for the, the kids who are affected by inequities generally? So um, that wasn't among my original comments, but as I hear every single phone person not be able to connect, I'm really concerned and curious about what it was that they would have contributed to the conversation. Um, I just want to say that I think and, and I'm not. Let me, let me step in on this one. Then. Excuse me. I just wanted to answer your question really quickly. Um, to be clear, when Jack asked a phone number if they have a question, it's because we they don't have a raised hand. So they most of them don't have questions. They didn't intend to ask a question, but their phone number is on our screen. So in a sense of fairness, we want to be able to give them their opportunity to ask a question, but uh, many haven't asked questions simply because I, I assume they don't want to speak. Um, it's different from the hand raising where that is clearly someone indicating they want to ask a question. So we will continue to ask all of the phone number folks if they have a question, but I do not expect all of them will. So I just want to make that really clear because I think there's a technology thing that not everyone understood. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I hope that the folks on the phone will have a chance to chime in on that. Um, so the two other comments that I have are one about transportation. I'm not sure that we've really talked about how to ensure safety on school buses. Um, and I do worry about the ability of bus drivers to oh. ensure that kids are wearing masks and doing the things that are appropriate while they're being transported to and from school. Um, and then finally, a comment about the hybrid schedule. Um, I appreciate all of the points um, that seem to point in favor of a hybrid schedule. I just um, think that doing a Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, what? increases the likelihood of all kinds of germ mixology that can be easily avoided if the cohorts are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday school gets cleaned and kids do, um, every kid does remote and then Thursday, Friday, the other cohort goes to school. Um, I think that's an easy solution. I know there was a comment by Principal Reardon earlier that you know, that would leave too long of a gap between when kids were engaged with school. But if they're supposed to be doing online on their non in person days, I just don't know that that's um, that risk is outweighed by the potential to mix all the germs by the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now moving back to the phone numbers. Phone number ending in 2078, area code 603. If you hit star six to unmute yourself, please state your name and make your comment. Okay, moving on to phone number 4375, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name and make your comment. Area code, I'm sorry, 
phone number ending in 1995, area code 720. If you would um, hit star six uh, to unmute yourself, make your comment, state your name and where you're from. Yes, this is Melissa Heimbach. Last name spelled H-I-N-E-B-A-U-C-H. I'm a resident of Concord. And I, I, I do echo some of the concerns about the people calling in. I have called in previously to these meetings and not been able to make a comment on the phone. In addition, the reason why I'm calling in tonight is because I submitted my comments before the Monday meeting by email, which was suggested. However, my comments were not read tonight. So I'm calling in to resubmit those comments. My first one is that I'm very concerned about losing funding for public schools if parents pull their kids out of the Concord School District and decide to pursue other options such as private school, self-financed pods and VLAC. So the disenrollment will impact our bottom line for next year. What can the district do so that those numbers won't negatively affect budgeting for, for the 21-22 school year? And secondly, if parents pull their kids out of the Concord School District and pursue other educational options, this creates a new segregated society of who has resources and who does not have resources. Given our ongoing efforts regarding anti-racism and equity within the school district, how do we address this new form of segregation? Okay, okay. Um, Madison Howard, um, if you wish to make a comment, please un unmute yourself and state your name and where you're from. Yep, so um, hi, my name is Madison Howard. Um, that's M-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, um, H-O-W-A-R-D. I am a senior at Concord High School um, and I live here in Concord. Um, so first I would like to echo the sen sentiments of Rigby, Martin, and Nick. Um, and I am very disappointed with the board's response to them. Um, at the very top of the alumni letter that nearly 2,000 current and former students signed, um, it discusses um, the district's dismissal of grievances of students of color. Um, and here you are doing this again. So not only have you refused to acknowledge the demands outlined in the alumni letter during this meeting, you have not yet issued a statement regarding them. Um, and also, uh, the board could not even remember the date of the next meeting, which record is August 13th. Um, but clearly, you don't want to hear about this, so I'd like to submit my um, opinion on school reopening. I think there isn't a universal solution across all grades, but um, as a member of Concord High School, uh, I can say that um, we should not be going back at all. It, should not be hybrid, it should not be full in person, it needs to be fully remote. Um, with high schoolers, they are able to be alone and it might be difficult. I know that I miss my friends, I miss my teachers, but it is not worth one, put it, putting people in danger and two, putting an undue burden on the teachers. Um, I do have one question uh, regarding the teachers, so across all grade levels. Um, they're not really a question, they're a um, not really a question so much, more of a demand. Really? <laughs> okay. Um, not a question so much, more of a demand. But um, um, every single teacher who wishes um, to teach remotely, who does not feel comfortable being um, at school, they need to have the option to teach remotely, no matter what. That's they awesome. do. Thank you, Madison. It's nice to hear from students. Thank you for speaking. Okay. Next one, Ryan uh, Baker, B-A-C-C-A. -C um, if that's correct, please unmute yourself. Go ahead, state your name and make your comment. Hi, this is uh, Ryan Baca. The uh, last name is V-A-C-C-A. -C -C I live in Concord um, and I'm a parent. 
Uh, I guess this was originally a question uh, probably for uh, Kathleen Murphy, but if we're not uh, responding to questions, then uh, you can take it as a comment of just something to consider. Um, assuming that the board doesn't choose the fully remote option, um, then parents will have to choose between uh, doing the fully remote option for their kids or whatever the board decides to do. Um, regardless of the choice that's made, uh, will parents have an opportunity to, to reassess and change uh, to the other option at one or more points during the, uh, during the year? Or is it more of a uh, sort of speak now and forever, or at least for a year, or hold your peace? So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jack, this is Kathleen. Go ahead. Can you hear me, Jack? I can hear you. Okay, so let me respond to that question and, and also to indicate to the folks that said that the, you know, folks calling in on the phone. I, I'm, I've been on the phone because I lost power um, at my residence. And so I, I resorted to the phone tonight. Um, and, um, but I wanna answer the question from Ryan. Um, we are offering, we want parents to be involved in the decisions that they're the, they're, they're the first in line. And so we, we want to be able to hear from them. And should the conditions change, as I think uh, Dr. Noble indicated tonight, that we want to be able to allow that to happen. So for instance, if you start out in uh, remote and the numbers uh, decrease and uh, in terms of your or you're feeling better about the conditions of which to allow your child to come back, we want to be able to honor those things for, with the parents. So um, we're ready to be flexible. We, we're, we're, we're pivoting on, and that's why we did three plans, because we were ready to pivot based on all the data that we had. So we want to work with you, and we want to find the right solution for your child. Thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome, Ryan. Okay, I'll turn it over to her now because, um, okay. Linda, you want to go with comments that have been sent in? I just need to figure out the phone numbers because they're jostling around because people yes. are uh, chiming in and out. Go ahead. Yes, happy to do that. Um, I, I'd like to respond very briefly to uh, Melissa Heinbach. Uh, just to note that we had approximately 110 pages of comments that were sent by email, all of which, every one of which has been sent to the board. So that in that form as public comment, all of that public comment went to the board. I'm simply reading the emails that have come in since I sent the last batch of those to the board. So I have several um, from Christopher Russell. Hi, my name is Christopher Russell. I'm an instructional assistant at the middle school. Thank you so much for all you do and for this opportunity to say something Contrary to what I've heard, my experience with remote learning was very positive, but it requires eyes on work in real time in presentation mode, so both instructor and student can be participants in the student's learning. I encourage remote instructors to remain present, not just to the student, but to the student's work in real virtual time. This mirrors the way a teacher doesn't just lecture, but how they move around the room and supervise attention. It also ensures accountability on all fronts. Thank you for your time. Another comment from Linda O'Rourke. I am a teacher at RMS and would like to re echo what Rebecca McHugh ad addressed regarding wearing a mask seven hours a day, especially in the heat. My classroom is on the second floor with the average temperature in classrooms during September and into October is 88 degrees, though my room has hit 92 degrees. Comment from Maria Ioza, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Maria. With regards to high school students, who will make a decision on what classes will take place during their four block? Will an advisor be in contact with each student to make sure their schedule is updated? How will this work if they have a study hall? Will they be able to fill in with a class? And let me just check and see if anything else, nothing else has come in. Back to you, Jack. Thank you, Lyndon. All right, I'm going to move to the final three phone numbers that I see. Uh, phone number ending in 0430, sorry, 0430, area code 802. If you have a comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. 
and uh, state your name and make your comment, please. Okay, moving on. Next phone number ending in 1146, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six. State your name and make your comment. Hello, this is Gretchen Stalling, S-T-A-L-L-I-N-G-S, and I'm a Concord resident and parent, and um, I, I want to give my, my thanks and appreciation to Kathleen and the board for the work that you're doing to make sure that everyone's heard. Um, these are unprecedented times, and your compassion and leadership through this is um, exceptional. And I really appreciate the work that you're all doing to try to help steward the best solution to the problems that are at hand. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. Um, next, and my final number, ending in 1838, area code 734. If you have a comment, please hit star six. State your name and make your comment. Hello, my name is Mose Jones Yellen, spelled like Jose with an M, M O S E. Last name is hyphenated, Jones, J O N E S, hyphen Y E L L I N. I'm a Concord resident, parent of two children in the school system. And there are several things that I'm here with my children and my wife. We've been talking this over. Um, the first thing I just want to say is that the phone is several minutes delayed from the YouTube video that we're watching. And so when you're, if you're listening to the YouTube and you're calling out phone numbers uh, and you're actually on the phone ready to make a comment, you're out of luck. So that may be one of the issues you've been experiencing with the lack of phone comments. The second comment I have is that I found it shameful that the questions around racism and discrimination are met with uh, irritation from board members and avoidance. And um, I, that's it's just really disheartening. It's a difficult thing for me to deal with. Uh, it's a difficult thing for me to explain to my children. The third comment, um, I'm troubled by the presentation of the hybrid model as uh, the only recommended option. Uh, I think if you were having a genuine and robust process, I think if you were taking this, taking the health of your community seriously, um, this would have been presented differently. The fourth comment I have, uh, the screening plan, and if we end up going with the hybrid, I think the screening plan uh, shows a real lack of respect for the prevalence of asymptomatic, contagious people in our community. And that's just what we know about the virus and the idea that taking temperatures at the door and asking these questions is going to somehow safeguard our children and our teachers, I think is, it's an ugly facade. Uh, I'm curious about why school system employees aren't being tested. I know that that's been the approach taken amongst uh, some private institutions and amongst summer camps that have been open uh, currently. So. And then my last comment, um, presumptively, if we end up with the hybrid model, and you have these two groups, these A group and B group, uh, I think it's irresponsible to squander the opportunity to thoroughly clean facilities on that Wednesday, 100% remote day. I understand there's an idea about having students and their time with teachers spread out over the course of the week. I think that that, I think we're gonna be in an unprecedented time. We are in an unprecedented, unprecedented time. I'd rather have my students in a facility that has been thoroughly cleaned 
and take those two days back to back rather than have this notion that no spreading out and having one day every three days is somehow vastly better. I would be much happier knowing that the facilities have been thoroughly cleaned before my children show up. And those are my five comments. Thank you. All right, I'm going back up. So, Jack, in light of that comment, I do think it's worth going through the phone numbers again because I want to make sure that we can hear from everyone. You want my computer? You want me to go through the numbers all again? Okay. I'm just going to go right through them. I'm, I'm not going to do the hand raise. I'll just go through each of them one at a time and wait a minute in between each one. So yeah, phone number let's just N give them enough time. And again, N I don't know if other people have their hands up. I mean, I don't want to mess with your order, but I do want to make no. sure if people are on the I, phone. I, I, I might as well hit it because as comment. soon as they start, they, they all readjust as people chime in, chime off. So I've been writing each number down okay. so I know that I don't hit it again. But if... I'm just going to read them. I'm just going to do it all in one shot. Um, I think the thing I just don't understand is if you're listening on, on the phone, that I'm thinking is in real time. Obviously, streaming is going to be delayed. So sure. if they are just, I, if they're listening to that and not wait near their phone, that could be a challenge. But um, the phone, I think, should be real time. But that's all right. I'm just going to go right down it. Uh, phone number okay. ending in 1146, right. area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six. Unmute yourself, state your name, and make your comment. Again, phone number ending in 1146, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six. Unmute yourself, state your name, make your comment. Okay, Jenny, I'm going to move on to the next one. Phone number ending in 7989, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, unmute yourself, state your name, and make your comment. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to say that the phone does work because people are commenting that they're not thinking that we can't get through. So the phone does work, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate you try checking in. You're welcome. Phone number ending in one nineteen seventy three, area code six oh three. If you have a comment, please hit star six, unmute yourself, state your name and make your comment. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Wasim Altaki. I'm a Concord resident. Uh, my, my daughter goes to uh, Concord School District and she's on IEP. Uh, already she lost one year of her OT and speech sessions and she's way behind. Any plan to make up session, like instead of 15 minutes, give her 30 minutes a week or maybe double the session per week? Thank you so much. Name again, last name is E-L-T-A-K-I. Thank you. Didn't catch it. I didn't catch that. That's a, we'll, we'll replay it on the video, if that's okay. Last name, E-L-T-A-K-I. First name, W-A-S-S-I-M. Okay, next number, ending in 6337, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six. To unmute yourself, state your name, make a comment. No comment. Thank you. Jack, this yeah. is Kathleen. Um, I'm back. Power has been put resumed and so I'm back on so thank you I was on the phone during that time I'd like to respond to the last caller relative to services and relating to the IEP 
Um, we, um, as many of you know, the governor uh, in, in his executive order indicated that um, we had a responsibility to reach out um, between now and uh, September 30th to reach out on, with every student on an IEP um, that we will be um, discussing uh, IEP and, and talking with families relative to where the student is and assessing their needs. So um, as, as the last caller said, dad said, he felt that his daughter needed more time with speech and language. Those are the kinds of questions that the- I wanna get through the, the phone numbers. Ed, I just wanna be done with this. So the so. special ed teachers will be um, provided- will be Cool, call that. With direction. So I just wanted to let him know that that is going to be happening between now good. and September 30th. Thank you. Mute yourself, people. We're hearing all sorts of comments here. Thanks, Kathleen. Phone number ending in 5156, area code 603. Um, if you have a comment, hit, please hit star six. Unmute yourself. Make your comment. State your name, please. So this is Barb, and while it's silent, I just got an email from a citizen asking about fire drills and lockdowns. So that's just to add to our list of things to consider should we have a hybrid model. If we're in buildings, clearly we have to follow all of those guidelines. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Barb. I just want to address a comment as far as we getting it done. What happened was I was being fed a comment that they have, Lyndon has some more comments to read, and I had said, no, I want to get through the phone number so I can get that done because that's what we were in the middle of done, what Jenny had asked me to finish. So I apologize if I was either half muted or not muted, but that's what my comment was about, trying to get through the phone numbers, because we had just said we would go through all the phone numbers so that this way the people that may have had a delayed hearing or thought they could not connect, we wanted to make sure that they had their uh, comments heard. So um, it's okay, I'm gonna move on to 7161, area code 603. Again, if you would uh, hit star six to unmute yourself and uh, state your name and make your comment, please. Seven one six one, you are unmuted. At least I can see. If you want to make a comment, please do. No comment. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Let's see. Now I'm at the uh, phone number ending in 4375, area code 603. If you have a comment, please hit star six, state your name, and make your comment. Thanks. Last phone number of the 802 area code they had spoke uh, earlier, so I'm not going to address that one if that's okay. And I am going to go over to Lyndon if you want to. You said you had some more comments. If you could go ahead and read that, please do. Lyndon, are you still on? Here's that she's uh, muted, Jack. Hmm. Yes, I was trying to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry I'll let you read your comment. 
Heather, uh, a comment from Heather Walker White. I am asking this on behalf of my daughter. If school is fully remote, why should sports continue? In the fully remote scenario, where we would not be putting students in classrooms with appropriate social distancing, how can we justify allowing students to play sports or play instruments where they can still be exposed? It simply doesn't make sense. As a student, I would not be comfortable participating in these activities if I cannot attend school in some capacity. And the next comment, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce the last name, Jacqueline Figuera. I support full in-person schooling, especially for elementary age, which both of my children are. I am even more encouraged for full in-person based on the doctor presentation at the beginning of the meeting. Thank you. And that is the end of the com. Actually, I'm sorry, I have one more. From Kelly Martin, it's been three hours. Can we please get to the vote? And that's it for, for me. Okay, I'm going to go back up to the hand raising. Um, and I will start with Karen uh, Craver. If you have a comment, please unmute yourself. Go ahead, state your name, where you're from, and make your comment, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Karen Craver. I'm a Concord resident, and I have two kids in the school district. I work as a chronic disease epidemiologist, but I'm speaking tonight as a parent and member of the community. I encourage the board to consider the risk that in-person education will pose to teachers, staff, students, and their families. We know that many New Hampshire adults suffer from chronic conditions, and I won't go through all the statistics tonight, but putting them at increased risk, these conditions put them at increased risk for complications from COVID. These are the adults in our school. These are the adults that our children come home to. Underlying conditions aren't limited to adults. Children in our state also live with conditions that put them at increased risk for complications, and there's still so much that is unknown about the disease. We're still learning about immediate and long-term impacts that this disease has on those who contract it, including children. I encourage the board to also consider the fact that there's a segment of our population that needs a solution that will allow for full-time in-person learning. Parents and guardians for whom working from home isn't an option are children who need in-person learning for other reasons. A hybrid model will not meet the needs of these families and will increase exposure exponentially with children from a single cohort attending different childcare facilities on their remote days and then returning to school. We need a plan that creates a safe learning environment for the children of frontline workers in healthcare and other industries. One that creates an environment where distancing can be achieved and mask wearing can be monitored for a smaller group of people. As a parent who's able to work from home, I plan to continue with remote learning. I do this with the interest of my own family in mind, but also for the health and safety of others. Promoting home learning for those who can support it would create a smaller pool of children for whom learning needs to be accommodated and would allow for full-time in-person learning for these students. It would allow teachers who have concerns about returning in person to continue to work remotely and those who'd be built, who would be willing to go back could do so. And I would argue that they deserve some hazard pay for the risk that they would incur. I don't want to go over my limit, but I really want to thank our teachers for what they were able to achieve in the spring and for all of the hard work that I know that they'll continue to do during these times to educate and protect our children. It's my hope that in voting tonight, the board will approve a plan that promotes health and safety and that values our educators, school staff, students, and families. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, next hand, just, uh, Justine, if I have that right, if you uh, could unmute yourselves, state your name, where you're from, and make your comment, please. Hi, good evening. This is actually Melanie. I'm on Justine's computer, and uh, I am, uh, I put four kids through Concord High School. I still have two to go, one that will be a freshman, one that is possibly going to be a senior. Um, I live in Concord, and uh, I just wanted to say that the remote learning that we had uh, from March on was pretty tough for us. Um, my high school student at the time lost a few credits. Um, she's one of those kids that struggles and, uh, you know, does not have an official IEP or any other official services. Um you know, just wants to try to get through it on her own, but she really struggles. And so going home uh, or being home, that was really tough for her. And she lost some essential credits. 
Uh, so just kind of keeping with her, she went to summer school. She did the remote learning tier first and failed. She did the hybrid tier second and succeeded. Uh, my second student uh, was an eighth grader when everyone was sent home. And she was one of those 100% disengaged students. Great student in school, um, sent her home, and she didn't care at all. Uh, you know, and, and I'm an essential worker, so I didn't have the ability to be home to help them. Uh, so they were home by themselves doing I don't know what, uh, because I was at work every morning. And, uh, you know, I am at work for nine hours a day with full PPE on. And so I don't know what they did at home. And, and I begged the school for help, you know, how to engage them. You know, they would, they would text me, they would email me, and I would say to them, I don't know what to do. I'm at work. I, I cannot leave my job. Um, so those were some, some tough things. And I just want to say a, a good shout out to the Concord High School CRTC. Uh, very thankful for that program. My daughter's in that program. She loves it. There's a huge shout out to Mrs. B for being a wonderful educator and engaging her students. Um, I, I'm really a fan of, of you know, uh, full time back to school. I, I know that's not a popular opinion, and uh, I do hold that. And I, I recognize, and this will be another Pandora's box, but. When kids go back to school, there is that herd immunity that occurs for those first couple of months. You know, they get sick, they get, you know, runny noses and things like that because they come in contact with each other's germs after not being together all summer. So you do sort of have that bump in the road, if you will. I expect we'll have that bump, you know, and we've got flu season coming up and we have COVID currently going on. So we've got a lot going on here. And I, I honestly, I, I don't know what the what the, um, I don't know what the solution is. I do know, I think it's very individual for families and it would be really nice if, if families could, to, you know, like the last caller that is, that has the ability to be home. If you could be home and you could have your kids home, you know, that's awesome. I don't have that ability. Um, so what do I do with, with mine? You know, and, and a high school education is incredibly important. I know grade school is important too, but you know, high school is important, too. These are the kids that we're releasing out to our community. And do we want them to be a contributing citizens? How are they going to do that without that high school education? And they all can't be remote learners. Um, I, I, I look forward to, if, if we do end up doing remote, that there is some improvement there. And I, I'm excited about that. I'm sure there is improvement because I, I do think that was an emergency situation that couldn't be helped. Um, so I'm glad there's improvement there, but really that just isn't for everyone. And, and my daughter will not succeed with that remote. And, um, I, I just don't know what to do with her. You know, uh, we're looking at private schools and, and alternatives, but with the Concord taxes and, and you know, what, what I make and thank God I can still go to work. I just, I don't know if I can afford that, you know? Um, so I, I know there's a lot of families struggling and probably in the same boat. And, and I know it's hard and been reading all the comments tonight and I, I just wish people would be a little nicer to one another because this is hard. It's very emotional. We are talking about our kids. We're, we're talking about future citizens and, and there's a lot at stake here. Um, you know, there's, there's help and, and everything else. But thank you for letting me comment. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Okay. Uh, next up, Krista uh, Robichaud. If you could unmute yourself, state your name, where you're from, and make your comment, please. Krista, are you there? Right. I'm going to lower your hand, and if you decide to come in and make a comment, please raise it again. Thanks. Next is, um, says Ralph, I had one of those earlier. If you've already made a comment, please um, um, wait to, to come back in. I want to try to get through people that haven't, so I'm going to unmute you. If you have, you are the one that made the comment earlier, I'd ask that you please wait. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, last name Burns, if they could please un uh, mute yourself, state your name, and make your comment, please. Hi, I am Dady Burns. I am a um, incoming sophomore at Concord High School. Um, I am actually very much in favor of going back to school because my education. I also I have siblings that go to Krista McAuliffe, and I saw all of our education significantly suffer as soon as we moved in to the online school learning I had my emails were completely full of my peers like asking me to send them work because they didn't understand any of the work so like yeah maybe your kid was passing but that's because I sent them the assignment like I think there's a lot of this and there's so many kids that just were not doing any work that like I knew and I think that if we don't go back we still have all the same activities and people are still hanging out out of school like even if we cancel all the activities kids are still gonna be hanging out out of school so we might as well just to have school and have kids get a better better education and there's a lot of parents who are not able to teach my, my mom's a stay-at-home mom so my mom spent her day all day trying to teach my younger siblings like their schoolwork because i mean they don't have a teacher and they're little like they they can't just like do it by themselves but parents that are essential workers or workers in general, they need their kids to have some sort of supervision. Like you can't leave a kindergartner. I'm like, I know a lot of people in the comments are saying, oh, well, a high school student can be left at home because college, they're unsupervised. Well, guess what? A kindergartner has no problem just like leaving the house. And like, you don't really, you can't trust a kindergartner at home by themselves. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And thank you for holding this meeting. I appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Sorry, Krista Robichard, if I saw that you put your hand back up, so maybe there was a delay or something. If you want to go ahead and make your comment, please go ahead. Please unmute yourself, make your comment. Hi, thanks. Yes, this is uh, Krista Robichaud. It's K-R-I-S-T-A Robichaud, R-O-B-I-C-H-A-U-D. And my son is in the fifth grade at Broken Ground. Uh, we are Concord residents. And I had sent in um, a comment in the chat box last Thursday. Um, I haven't received a response via email. So with regards to the remote learning that we had in the spring. My husband and I are very good at homeschooling our son. So, you know, we didn't have any problems with helping him out with um, reading, math, science, those kinds of things. And so if we were to do hybrid schooling, we would be okay with that. Um, however, our son actually would like to go to school for music and art. He did not want to do any art assignments with us at home. Um, those kinds of things seem to be a struggle for him at home. And so what I was asking is with this uh, hybrid plan, and I know every, every child is a different learner, everybody has different skills, and I recognize that um, you know, there are a lot of parents out there that probably would prefer for the teachers to be doing reading, writing, math, the, the three R's. Um, but it's it's the reverse for us. So I'm wondering if the hybrid situation happens, if my child will be able to go to school for music, for art, and we would be happy to do the reading, writing, arithmetic, those kinds of things, those core subjects at home. and. Um, also, again, um, like a couple of the other parents, I will say that my husband and I are fully on board with going back to school 100% of the time. And again, I recognize that that's not for everybody, um, but we, we are supportive of that. Thank you. Great. Okay, next one. Um, Thank you for your comments. Initials MM, if you could... Um, Please unmute yourself, state your name, make your comment. Sure, uh, my name is Mohan Mandali. Uh, that's M-O-H-A-N, last name M-A-N-A-L-I. Um, I graduated in 2012. Um, 
I just wanted to address a few things that uh, were previously mentioned. When I turned on my camera, I was kind of debating it, but I turned on my camera so that you could see a person of color that graduated from Concord High School to potentially get shrugged off and uh, not answered. So I wanted to kind of state that other students have you know, mentioned the racism that has been experienced at Concord High School and the Concord School District, including myself who experienced uh, racism uh, and bullying and in a situation right now where you're saying that uh, we have to potentially bring uh, students back to their classroom where they are experiencing more than one disease. One of them is uh, COVID-19 and the other one is racism that's happening systematically at Concord High School. And the fact that none of that is being addressed by any of the Concord School District board members, I think is um, scary. I think it's scary. The fact that it is, we will talk about this later. The fact that it is, we will address this at some point. The fact that some questions get answered, but other questions don't, I think is a very, very scary topic. And for you to say, we are going to bring these students back in and not address something that people of color are facing every day, not just this year, but when I graduated in 2012, I think is extremely disrespectful for uh, the way that you're handling this. Uh, and I know you're not gonna address my questions, so I guess I'll just put them out there. Um, if you uh, do not address any of the concerns that past alumni or uh, recent uh, students have about the racism that's happening currently at Concord High School uh, and it doesn't get fixed, if it is just this is you doing your best or it is what it is, as some other people like to say, um, then at some point will you members of the Concord School District resign? If someone gets sick by you guys sending them back to school, if at the worst case scenario someone dies, is that going to be something that you will take responsibility for and will you resign? Um, so those are the things that I wanted to mention. It's extremely disheartening to hear multiple people address things and them to be shrugged off and say that it will be talked at a different time. It's something that's been happening for years. When is the time to drop? actually going to address it this is, is it now the problem excuse me is it the time that you're going to address it now is it going to be or when is it going to be it seems like it's always uh something to be uh heard in the future and something to address then thank you jennifer this is mike Reardon. i don't know if it's appropriate or not so just only shut up if you want but uh, i would i would like to respond to some of those comments if i could um Sure, Mike, go ahead. Um, at the high school, um, we are far from perfect, uh, but we do recognize the struggles of, uh, of a lot of our kids, and particularly kids of color. Um, so I just want to go uh, briefly through um, some of the things that we, we have started and will be starting in the fall. This summer, um, we uh, convened three listening groups uh, for about 10, 12 kids in each group to talk about issues of racism, both in the school and, um, and in the community and um, have taken action on some of the things that we've heard already. Um, one of our uh, juniors uh, is forming a black student union, which we support in the school in the fall. And she's uh, much to my happiness is, is inviting students of all colors to, uh, to become a part of that. We're looking to start a series of uh, Who Am I talks uh, by students who volunteer to talk to five minutes once a week uh, to the school around, um, you know, who am I, what do I believe, uh, what do I think is important, how do I make Concord High a better place. We're going to start an art museum up on Main Street, and it's going to be um, not student art, but it's going to be art um, from uh, uh, world-class artists, but not just the Western tradition, also the tradition of the countries where our refugee population comes from. Um, we will be starting student and uh, parent advisory groups in the fall around racial issues. One of the most important things we do, we're a competency-based education school, and that means that students will have a, uh, have a chance to uh, display mastery of competencies from different paths. In a lot of cases, uh, language can get in the way. But when you're a, a competency-based education school, 
uh, teachers look out for different pathways for students to uh, uh, display competency. So that's a really important thing. I know our social studies history department is already looking at a curriculum review uh, based on some of these issues. Um, we are ready to release disciplinary stats uh, uh, when we have the permission of the district to do so. And we have been, uh, for quite a while, very interested in minority um, hiring. Um, it's not easy uh, in New Hampshire right now, but um, that's something we're really interested in doing. So my point isn't that we're doing stuff. My point is, and I want uh, the folks who spoke eloquently on those issues uh, tonight to know that uh, not only Concord High School, but the Concord School District takes this stuff very seriously and is acting on it. Well, none of us have a, a magic wand. Uh, we can't make everything perfect tomorrow, but we know that, uh, as several people have said, a lot of work needs to be done, and we are willing to do that work, and we have started to do that work. Thanks. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mike. If I could move on to the next one, Tina uh, Filibati, if you could unmute yourself. State your name and make your comment, please. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tina Philibot. I'm a Concord resident. I'm a parent of a senior, um, soon to be senior at the high school. I want to thank you for holding this space. Um, I have a few comments. First and foremost, I want to echo the commentary um, around issues around equity and cultural competence raised by several folks here, the alumni, Madison Howard. Um, I want to echo um, Karen Craver and Melissa Heinebach's information, too. Um, a few things that I'm thinking about here. So mostly, um, first and foremost, I want to promote going mostly remote, right? Not the hybrid model. I'm thinking about a few things. So I'm thinking about like the teachers. So I understand that teachers have a choice. I'm wondering, is their choice to go back to school? Is it based solely on their rights um, under ADA already, or is it based around um, their concerns around protecting their own family? Um, I understand that teachers have invested a lot of time in the district, good for you, has invested a lot of time and money in having teachers do professional development, like a lot of teachers over the summer, to prepare for a really robust remote learning experience. So thank you for that. Um, and given that, um, I'm hoping that families choose to stay with the Concord School District versus pulling students out to do private schooling or the pods. Um, and that's something that just concerns me. And I'm hoping you're going to be able to speak to that if that were to, if people were to pull out of the district. What does that look like for us in the future? Um, I want to speak to, in, in terms of the remote learning piece too, I hear a lot about social emotional learning. Um, Riverbend the Greater Mental Health Care of Manchester, Bedford Counseling, not a single one of those counseling centers, those are the major counseling centers in the area, are doing face-to-face -face, um, meetings. So despite the low numbers right now, they're still not meeting face-to-face. -face. So I hear there all of the things that are going on in the media. I hear um, folks talking in this space, but maybe it makes sense to listen to the folks on the ground doing work every single day in our own town. Um, the last piece I want to speak to is this notion around student voice. So, Jennifer, thank you um, for commenting after the students um, were able to speak. I want to speak specifically to Madison Howard's comment, and I want to speak to equity. Full disclosure, Madison is my daughter. When she was speaking, um, she was interrupted several times. And I feel like that's an equity issue in that partially this vehicle, right, the Microsoft Teams piece, if you are on Zoom, that wouldn't have been allowed to have happened. And I also feel um, that as a community, like I agree, somebody said this before, this is really hard um, and we need to be compassionate with each other. The fact that no one on the board addressed the interruptions um, that happened there. Uh, that concerns me. And so if you actually believe in student voice, then I think that that should have been addressed in that moment. And then I want to speak to one last thing. Thank you for your time. Um, Mike Reardon was talking about uh, the work that you're doing at the high school. It's interesting that you spoke immediately after that alumni spoke. Um, 
It's the responsibility of the faculty. It's the responsibility of you, the school district, to to do the work of cultural competency, to do the work of cultural proficiency. I really appreciate that you're going to have this moment where students can be able to speak their voice and everything. I highly encourage teachers to have the opportunity to say what they believe as well. Teachers need to model what this looks like so kids know how to do this. And then I hope that also is echoed in that remote learning environment. Thank you. Hey, Tina, this is Far Higgins. I'm a board member. When your daughter was speaking, I heard all the feedback and I had unmuted my microphone to say, please, people, turn off, please mute your microphones because there was all this feedback, which was clearly unsettling. Um, but then it got quiet, so I never said anything. So I actually noticed very, very acutely the fact that there was all this feedback and reverberation going on when she was speaking. So I should have just yelled out and I apologize that I didn't, but I did notice that. So thank you for bringing it up. Okay. Um, Erica Markson, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself, state your name, make a comment. Hi, my name is Erica Markson. I am a senior at Southern New Hampshire University. I'm studying elementary education with special education, and I will be student teaching at Beaver Meadow this fall. Um, I have been both a student and a teacher during this time of remote learning. I just wanted to speak on the importance of in-person instruction for all ages and how remote learning has done a great disservice to students on IEPs and 504s. I hold a 3.9 GPA at SNU and I know I too struggled greatly in remote learning and suffered from the lack of collaboration and engagement with my peers and teachers. Uh, I know it's difficult to be motivated and diligent when completing schoolwork and have seen that with the students I work with. I think at this time, hybrid is the best model for all, especially allowing families to decide if they want to send their students to school or keep them home for remote learning. I know this is a hard you know, choice for teachers and students being put at risk, but I know developmentally, this is one of the best options. Um, that's really all I have to say. So thank you for holding this meeting and taking the time to listen to all of our comments. Great, thank you. Okay, I have a notes um, slipped to me for uh, to call out for Kaylee Smith, K E A L I Smith. If you are there, please unmute yourself. You were having trouble hitting your uh, raising your hand. If you are still on yeah. and want to make a comment, there you go. Thank you. This Kaylee K E A L I Smith S M I T H. And I have like a real simple question for Kathleen. I've just been patiently waiting. So what exactly does a mass break look like? I see Jim over here has had his on for like the last three hours and he hasn't keeled over and died yet. So that's great. But like for like the little kids, is that just lunch and snack or is it like strategically throughout the day? Right. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, it will vary based on the age of the youngsters, but um, with the primary age youngsters, K1, 2, those, those breaks will have to be frequent um, between different periods. For instance, when they finish their reading, when they finish their math lesson, perhaps before the music teacher comes in or the art teacher comes in to do their lessons, we need, we absolutely have to give them a break. They'll have to be socially distanced and we if it's if if for instance we can use the the gym kids can go into the gym which has plenty of space they can distance themselves take their mask off for uh, for a bit um, as well as um, you know go outside um, I think that's the best I would like to see that happen because I think that's the best is to get the kids outside but yes um, you know um, they're not going to be um, I give Jim a lot of credit. I know he's been three, four hours with his mask on. He was here at 5.30, so he's been four hours with that mask on. But we do not expect that of our of our young students. Thank you so much. I just wanted just clarification. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I have another um, one that could not raise their hand. Nick Musio, M-U-C-C-I-O. If you are available, please unmute yourself and speak. Okay, I'm going to move on. That's okay. 
Um, back up to the top, I think these may be people that have spoken already, um, but I will go with a hand and double check. Ralph, if you are there, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and make state your name and make a comment, please. Hello, my name is Ralph. No, I'm not, not really not <laughs> Ralph. Um, yeah, I, I have a, obviously many, many questions and comments. Um, I, uh, I, I guess what I'm, I'm really concerned with is, is going back at all to the buildings um, for the students, teachers, staff, cafeteria workers, everybody. Um, this isn't like we're hating a shooter. We already know who the shooter is. The shooter is COVID. And it's with full magazines. And we don't know when it's coming or when it's going to hit, but it's there. And I think um, that the board and the SAU and superintendent do understand that you're part of a larger community here when we're going back into the classroom. But that makes us a catalyst. It makes us a catalyst for this for this virus. Um, and I think that you know learning will come, but only if the students have a life to live. And and teachers work their butts off all the time. They um, I know they worked really hard back in the spring when we left the buildings, um, but it was under emergency situation. They had never done it before. It was very quick, very, you know, they had to do it on the fly. Um, I think it will improve, and I think they, that it needs to be perfected at a time when we should be doing remote learning. Oh, she's still there? Hello? Oh, oh go ahead. Did you hear me? Yeah, it, I don't know what happened, but go ahead, wherever you left off, okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm not sure where. I'm not sure where. I'm, well, I guess I've said it enough. I, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, Sean H. Um, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself and. State your name and make a comment, please. Sean H, any comment? Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry go about ahead. that. I, I wasn't unmuting. Yeah. Uh, Sean Hackshaw again. Um, I, I just want to comment uh, about the remote option. I've heard, I, I heard college student just a few minutes ago, and I've heard people say our kids didn't get a lot out of the remote learning over the spring. I think part of that is because remote learning needs to be live and synchronous. So, so that kids have their schedule to follow. They go online at 7.45 for period one and they have their period one teacher and so on. And instead of having a five minute or 10 minute video lesson and no way to ask the teacher questions. So, so I, I think if regardless of how it's done, whether it's fully remote or the hybrid method, we need to have that live uh, streaming video with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, McHugh family, if you could uh, unmute yourself, if you have a comment, please say your name. Yep, Go hi ahead. again, it's um, Rebecca McHugh, and I have two quick comments, um, or one quicker than the other. So to the speaker before Sean saying, you know, it's really important that we take the time to really plan to do this well. Um, I received, and it's been posted publicly, so I'm not sharing anything that's that's not public. 
I work in Manchester and they proposed their draft plan tonight. And it's basically the same dilemma that Concord has had, but the superintendent has, um, I think quite bravely said to the board that it's going to take a couple months to really put things in place to do any kind of hybrid model safely for everyone involved. And so everyone will be fully remote until the end of quarter one, except for K one and two and specific children who need very specialized instruction in person. So I'm just throwing that out there as like a kind of mixture of hybrid and remote maybe that the board wants to consider. And then my other quick comment is in the discussion about equity, um, and I guess this applies more to the high school, I would like there to be some thought in the, when the board is deliberating on discussions and when the high school administration is making a plan on how are you going to ensure equity in a competency-based model um, where if you go with this four by four plan, kids are being asked to demonstrate a year's worth of competency in half a year. So are kids gonna be measured on competencies or are they going to be measured on how fast they can absorb and display knowledge of information? Because that, that, that really rewards kids who are accelerated learners and does not seem terribly equitable for I'd say a, a good majority of students who developmentally as high schoolers need more time to process and think and reflect and learn. So I'm not expecting an answer to that. I just think that it's an important question. And as I, I know, if I was a high school teacher right now, I would probably think, okay, well, I have competencies and kids now have half a year to show a year's worth of them. So the ones who can do it will do well and the rest will will not, and, and that's not gonna be equitable. So I, I know those are two very disparate points, but I just thought I'd slip them into the same comment. <laughs> so that's it. Great, thank you. So Jack? Yes. Um, can you give me a sense of how many more folks we have? Because I wanna make sure that we hear everyone once, but the board definitely needs to take the time to deliberate. So sure. I think if we're getting into a second round of comments, I mean, I think these are great comments, but but really we need to make sure we have plenty of time because I think our conversation is going to take a while. I, okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is this last one that's on, I need to get her name because I believe it's the same one that just made the comment. I know Lyndon sent us a note saying, could you get her name? So I'm going to lower her and ask her for her name. If she has a second or third comment, do you want to ask that she wait on that or? Um, yeah, let's just see if there's anyone who didn't make a first comment. Um, I've looked down I, I, everything I okay. see. I think I'm good unless somebody raises their hand. And uh, if I look at the phone numbers, unless I've missed something or somebody's chimed in, it looks like I have hit every one of those. Okay. At least once. I mean, I think some people went super fast, so I guess technically yep. they got five minutes. But I think sure. I just I would ask that people, if they have something really important, Maybe they keep their hand up and hit, say it very quickly. I'm going to hit this last yeah. hand raise to get the name for Lyndon, and then Lyndon has a comment, and then I think that's it, unless something chimes okay. in. Okay. Great. Okay. Ralph, yeah, please unmute yourself and state your name. Hello? Hi. Sorry about Hi. that. That's Sorry. Right. Can you state your name? We have someone taking minutes, and they just need Ralph. to. Ralph. Um, just wanted to ask you about um, support staff. Um, they work very closely um, to the children, and I know their proximity is not that far. They really do have to work closely with the students. How are you expecting them to, um, how will you expect them to, to have a safe six foot or distance from their students? I mean, aren't you putting them at risk? in the case of putting them, you know, going back into school with a hybrid or full model? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, so Jack, was, was that the last comment that, that was we, the last comment? we have here? Uh, I'm gonna just ask Linda to unmute herself and um, she'll go with the last bit of comments and then- Okay. I'll leave it to you what you want to do next. Okay, thanks so much, Jack. 
Okay, I have a number of emails that have come in. The first is, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you, Linda. Okay, thank you. The first is Susan Kerrigan. With the vote on reopening anticipated to take place this evening, I want to remind the board that we are hoping that preschool will be discussed in this decision as well. The evening has been addressed, A12. We have a large population of preschool students in our district and we appreciate direction from the board on this population as well. Next one from Candy Dennison, four hours and still no vote. I would have liked to hear the vote, but I work in the morning signing off. The next one from Aaron Sharkey, if teachers are choosing to do remote work only, who is teaching our children in-person days? If it substitutes, what are the long-term effects of having inconsistent teachers through the year? Next one is from Maureen Howard. And it's a little bit long, but I'll get through it. Maureen Howard, I don't want to read this out loud, but I just wanted the board to know. He says, I don't want to read this out loud. I'm not sure she wants me to read it out loud. I guess I will go ahead and do that. I am the parent of eighth grade twins. I just wanted to say 7-3 did a phenomenal job last school year with remote learning. I keep hearing parents complaining about other grades and clusters with remote learning last year. No complaints here. This cluster was absolutely amazing. I have a son who has an IEP and Crystal Rubino did one-on-one -on -one with him at 10-15 every day to lay out the expectations for him daily with each class. When she had her normal class at 12.30 daily, this was a discussion class. She would email me if he was falling behind in a subject or hasn't, hadn't turned in paperwork. Great communication. My son also had a one-on-one -on -one typing class with Mrs. Shoemaker. She did a great job remotely as well. His twin sister was also in the same cluster. She does not have an IEP, but I have no concerns with remote learning with her. 7-3 last year went above and beyond every single day. Mr. Gianetti had a weekly 45-minute or an hour real class each week. Discussion, learning, and participation was expected. Amazing job. He was also my son's advisor and called my cell phone every Friday to talk to my son and I. He was just checking in. Again, going above and beyond. I wish we could have structure like 7-3 this school year. Big kudos to all of them for their hard work last school year. Thank you. Um, I work at Concord Hospital last school year. I was able to work remotely. Unfortunately, my office now doesn't allow me to do that. Last school year, I was home and constantly needed to direct my son. I am hoping he's able to be more proactive this year as I need to work full time in the office. Both my kids have significant medical issues. I'm going to skip that. I am a widowed mom. Her own mom is almost 80 and has severe asthma. Personally, I can't risk my kids getting sick. When they get sick, they get severely sick and need hospitalization. I'm leaning heavily toward full remote learning this year. Because of this reason, I hope remote learning has structure like we had in 7-3. They did a great job. Uh, next, hang on one second. Got to get back to this. Um, okay, this is from Ella White. I'm an incoming freshman at Concord High School, and while I did struggle with remote learning, I believe that school should be 100% remote. Normally, I am quite motivated when it comes to my schoolwork, and my motivation did drop a little bit during the remote learning process. That being said, I value my health much more than my education. To think of going back to school and having to deal with the possible trauma of deaths of those you know or possible med medical issues with myself doesn't sit right with me. If we are in a remote learning situation, I would like for there to be more options for students who may struggle emotionally or socially. I feel as if I was not provided those resources when I was finishing my eighth grade year in the spring, and I know many of my peers feel similarly on the matter. I would also like to mention that school staff and administrators should be considerate about mask usage in public. Teachers are individuals that many young students look up to. And I believe as important figures for these young children, they should be focusing on wearing masks in public on the off chance that they encounter their students in public. Our teachers have to be positive role models, regardless of whether they believe in wearing masks or not. I know that when I was in public and I did see a school administrator without a mask, I was incredibly disappointed. Thank you for your time. And then the last one, I think, 
John Drew. My name is John Drew. I'm a Concord resident with two students, two seniors at Concord High School. I listened to the meeting tonight on Teams. I didn't feel the need to raise my hand, rather wanted to provide my feedback via email. I want to thank the board members for your work. This is clearly a very difficult process with significant logistics to consider. I'm extremely ex impressed with the amount of due diligence you've done and the professionalism you've shown throughout the process. My personal preference is to have kids go back to 100% in school. I do understand that may be unpopular, and I respect those who have concerns about the health of their children. To that end, I strongly support the hybrid model. This will allow people to choose for themselves. There is significant pressure from people to keep the schools closed. I do not think that's in the best interest for the students, and I do not support fully remote as an option. Thank you. And, oh, I'm sorry, I have two more. Uh, this is from Sarah Aiken. What will you do for students who cannot wear a mask, specifically those with disabilities? And the last one from Ann Zinken. For whatever it's worth, after hearing from the infectious disease specialist, I am even more comfortable than I was before with a hybrid option. My kids learn best when my, my child learns best when he has an established relationship with his teachers. He will be able to do that more easily with at least some in-person time. Thank you. Those are all the comments that I have on the email. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Lyndon. Um, so we've heard a lot of public comment, and as several people have pointed out, we've been sitting here for almost four hours. So my suggestion is that we take a break until 1030 and then come back to have this conversation. Does that make sense to board members? Do you want to have a break or should we just jump right into this? I think we should have a break. It's shot. I'll, I'll vote break. Okay. Yeah, Jenny, I'm not Jim, calling. I think we should have a break. <laughs> okay, so the board's going to be in recess until 1030, and then we're going to come back. And thank Hopefully you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you to everyone who commented. That was really helpful. I really appreciate it. And um, now we'll figure out what to do in 10 minutes. So we are recessed till 1030.
I'm just going to confirm with Josh that we're we're good. Okay. Streams back up, ready to go. So, okay. to you, Jenny. Okay. Thanks. Um, can you put up my my slide again? Sure can. I don't know if it'll be helpful to anybody else. Um, it was kind of helpful to me in thinking about it, and I want to give it a shot and just see. So I think I am reconvening the meeting of the Concord School Board. I'm going to just briefly go through and make sure that we've got all of our members back from the recess. So it is 1030. Uh, Ms. Cannon, are you here? Sounds like she's not back yet. Uh, Mr. Croto, are you here? I am here. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kresh, are you here? I'm here. Great. Jenny, I am here. I'm just having difficulty with the mute, unmute. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Higgins, are you here? I'm here. Great. Thank you. Mr. Parker, are you here? I am here. Great. Thank you. Ms. Poirier, are you here? I am here. Great. Thank you. Mr. Richards, are you here? I am here. Did you get your mask break? I Maybe. did go outside with my mask break, and I do want to apologize to Matt because I was trying to hit that unmute button to tell people to turn their microphones off, and it was a delay on mine. But uh, I also want to say, bring out the fact that I'm not the only one sitting here in a mask. You know, Pam, uh, Donna are all wearing masks uh, because we're close, um, and, and they've been here the whole time, too. Great. Well, thank you, and thanks to all of you for that. And we look forward to being there with you in masks sometime in the near future, because um, that is what we want to be doing. Um, Ms. Smith, are you here? I'm here. Great. Thank you. And I'm Ms. Patterson. I am here. So we do have our full board. And so now it is our opportunity to deliberate. And um, this is a very difficult issue. I think it was really helpful to hear from many, many folks. I struggle with a lot of questions, particularly around equity and safety and um, trying to think how best to approach it. One of the speakers had wanted to hear opinions from board members. We could start off by just giving impressions or we could just start by having Kathleen recap what she's asking us for. Again, if that slide, um, you know, I had just been trying to think about what are our guiding principles, because one of the things that I find challenging about this process is how do we as a board support the ability of the district to, um, you know, be creative, to be nimble, to be somewhat flexible while still being acting consistently with the principles that we as a board want to establish. And so should we be talking about those guiding principles or should we just jump into some of the specific details? Um, so I guess I, let me just go through and, and call on each board member as to kind of how we want to approach this conversation. And everybody will have lots of ample opportunities to talk afterwards. Um, so I'll start with, with Dina. Well, <clears throat> I think we want to very briefly set up some guidelines, but it's 1030. Yes. Our conversation is likely to be somewhat intense and somewhat lengthy. So I don't think we want to take a lot of time to set up guidelines. I think very briefly and then jump into it. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tom, any thoughts on how to proceed? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, I think we should take one minute each, and I I can say a lot. In one minute, you know, maybe one minute each, and just go through and, and give our first impressions about what we're thinking. And uh, you know, I think that the community deserves to hear what we're thinking. And uh, you know, we could we could say it in a minute or less, and uh, and then 
maybe we'll vote differently once we move forward. I know my mind has changed about 45 times just tonight alone. So <laughs> we can uh, we can try it that way if, if people think that's appropriate or we can move on. Um, does anyone disagree with that approach or should we just go ahead and do it or should we keep going? Here, Chuck, what do you think? Should we go through any? You know what I summary? was going to, I was going to say exactly what Tom said. I was going to say two minutes. But I okay. think a minute is even better. So uh, I think we can go through and give our initial impressions, our initial thoughts, and then maybe have some discussion after that uh, and allow for a little question and answer and, and discussion. I agree. Great. This is Barb. Great. Um, anyone disagree? Um, okay. Uh, who would like to go first? I'll go I'll first. Oh, okay. You go, Barb. <laughs> I think I you know, heard Barb and then <laughs> Barb and then Dave. I think was what I heard. Um, go ahead, Barb. So, uh, of course, we the best thing about being on a board is that we all bring our unique perspectives and experiences into our decision making, and we're all very different people. Doesn't always make it easy, but it makes it right. Um, no matter what we decide, one third of the population will hate us. One third will think that we were wishy washy, and one third will celebrate our very being. Um, so having taken in all of the comments tonight and all of the emotion and again, people's personal experiences behind their comments, um, I, I have to say that I'm not comfortable as a human being or a board member or a parent or a teacher or a charter school director, um, having my name attached to anything that puts people at risk, students, teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers. I don't feel that we're ready. I don't feel that there are too many unanswered questions. That's not a flaw on our part. I do not feel we're ready in three weeks time or a month's time to send our student population into the building. I feel that we would be much better serviced by giving it a month. Everyone starts remote and we take the month to look at what's happening, to see where our teachers are, to see how it's working. And, and I also feel, having said that, we have students in our district that absolutely need to have their remote learning in a place provided for them. It doesn't mean they're having live learning. It means their remote learning is taking place in a, in a place that we, we make available to them um, so that they aren't at home alone or, or not participating. I know, I know I might sound all over the place, but I, I, we can't go back full time. I don't feel that our hybrid is solid enough. I think we have to have a focused remote and in the meantime, put together a really solid plan for getting kids back into the building. That's me. Great. Thank you, Barb. Uh, yeah. Dave, were you were you next? And someone I think may have their microphone um, unmuted who is not part of this conversation. Go ahead, Dave. <clears throat> well, I don't know really what to do. I think that there's many many opinions. Uh, what I'll say is that I have read everything. I've listened to everyone's opinions. And, and I don't think any decision is going to be um, necessarily the right decision. It's the question of what sort of risk our families and the board willing to take. Because nothing is risk-free. <laughs> There's so many different components to this, so many variables uh, that that uh, there's this part of me that just wants to stay remote. But on the other hand, that's a large risk too, because what the kids are saying is that they would like to come back in some capacity or not. They're willing to take some of that risk, and I know it puts something like me at huge risk. I'm very vulnerable, given my age and all the risk factors. I just, I listen to the kids and, and, and remind people that they're just not in school every day. They're hanging out with each other and they're going to the families and their aunts and uncles and grandparents. And that's a risk in and of itself. But what are we supposed to do? You know, and, and the hybrid model to me addresses some of that. People can keep their kids home if they feel at risk. But for the families at work, every day, um, it's hard for them 
uh, we we do provide daycare for a lot of families in our school systems. It's a risk, but after listening to the doctor, the, I sort of feel like who's going to decide what risk people are willing to take? And I'm willing to go with a hybrid model because it's the risk I'm willing to take. And I don't like to make that decision for anyone. And if people want to keep their kids home, they should. But we should give them the opportunity to come back in some capacity if we can. So that's all my opinion. Great. Thank you, Dave. And we take all this as an initial opinion. I mean, we're going to have a conversation about it. So, yeah. um, so Gina, go ahead. Your hand is up. Yeah. <clears throat> so, sorry, I was kicked out for a little while. Um, I think we have no business going back into the schools right now. We don't know enough. I don't think, um, I mean, just this morning, uh, Dr. Burks down at the uh, CDC, or I guess she's not the CDC technically, but anyway, was, was calling that Boston was going to be a hot spot in the next uh, couple of weeks. We have kids returning to college from all over the world, including into Concord for the law school. I think we're going to end up seeing a, a spike when all those college kids come back. Um, I think college kids and adults have problems with wearing masks and washing their hands. I think kids are going to have a very hard time with it. I don't th we can't do full in person. It's not practical. We don't have the floor space. I think the hybrid has too many complexities, including only getting 40% of instruction time. Uh, I think the best we can do is remote for everybody and providing in-person space for kids who need additional support, whether that's IEP, 504 kids, whether that's kids whose parents work and so they can't, uh, they can't be home, they have to be supervised. There are, you know, there are reasons to have kids there, but they need to be basically a case by case basis. Um, I think we need to be remote, but some of those kids will be sitting in chairs at school. Okay, thank you, Gina. Tom. Tom, you look a little frozen, but no, oh, no, there you moved. There are definitely issues with yeah. having many people on the forum. Okay, I finally got unmuted, I believe. Do you hear me? Yep, I hear you fine. Okay, so. I have no question that our teachers, parents, and administrators could do a hybrid job and do a very good job at it. But there are parts of this whole process that even the most capable people can't control, and that coronavirus itself. I know that I have heard from our administration all of the things in place that they are putting into place and can put into place to make kids safer. But the bottom line is coronavirus doesn't really play the safe game. Even if we try our very best, we can't guarantee our students and therefore our teachers or our parents safety. I'm for going completely remote. I would wait for a vaccine. Hopefully, as the experts are telling us, it may occur sometime after our first quarter is over. In the meantime, we could try to be the best that we can be being remote. And that's where I stand at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, don't see hands up. Uh, Jim, your hand was up earlier. And Chuck, you look like you might want to speak. So. Yeah, I, like I can't figure out my hand. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go sure. ahead. Go ahead, Jack. So, so yeah. So, listen, I uh, feel pretty strongly about this. Uh, I play in a sandbox that uh, focuses on this every day, and I've seen firsthand one-to-one -one experiences of of what coronavirus can do to families. I've also seen how a well-meaning and well-caring staff. Uh, can mistake an attempter, and it can have pretty global significant implications. I guess my position is, and I'm going to quote Dr. Fauci, 
um, uh, are we really to are we ready to take part in an experiment where teachers and students are are really the test subjects um, in the COVID nineteen pandemic? And that's a paraphrase of Dr. Fauci. I think there's too much we don't know. I think our school system. I think look. I think the administration has done a really good job at looking at at three different models. I think the uh, going back fully is off the table. I think the the hybrid model um, in the you know in the ideal world, if we had more knowledge about COVID nineteen, if we had more knowledge about, um, and that's why I pointed out uh, with Dr. Noble, you know there are different physicians that have many different opinions. Uh, so that's that's a consideration. I do believe that we need to work toward being the best at remote learning that we can be. I think we need to look at the psychosocial, the emotional aspects for our students. I think there are going to be those students that we have to have the school or a location for that need to be there. Uh, I think it's, we can't ignore that fact. Uh, but I think right now, I think for safety of our teachers, I think for the safety of our, our paraprofessionals, our bus drivers, all of our associates, I think that we and and our students and our students' families, I think we have to be remote uh, for a good period of time. I don't feel comfortable going back any other way. So that's that's kind of my position. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Um, anyone want to go next? Jim, Danielle, Liza? I don't know if I'm if I can go next. Um, uh, sure. Danielle. Yeah, go. Oh, there you go. You were breaking up a bit. Danielle, go ahead. I just figured I'd jump in and sort of piggyback off of Chuck because I feel a lot of the same ways that he does. Um, I think that there's just so many questions and so many details to work out for hybrid that make me really nervous to send kids and teachers back. Um, I think it was Madison, the student that had said that it's just a lot of pressure to be putting on teachers. And, you know, I spoke with a teacher on the phone earlier this week who was in tears because, you know, she has made the decision to stay remote. Her husband is undergoing chemotherapy treatment. Um, she can't put herself in that situation. And she was just upset for her peers, her coworkers who don't have necessarily the reason that to stay home, but are still, you know, trying to make it work for the kids. And, you know, uh, teachers really, we ask them to give a lot of themselves. And this just seems like not fair to put them in sort of that life or death decision making process. And it may be dramatic, but I'd rather err on the side of being overly cautious than coming back um, a couple of months from now and really regretting our decision as a community. So um, that's my first impressions and where I'm sort of leading right now. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Liza. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say to all the um, folks who have written and called and commented tonight um, and been so patient and, and forthcoming and opinionated in a very good way. Um, I feel like we have a really f complete understanding of all the things we don't understand. And um, we feel your anxiety intensely. Um, I've been thinking, and this was, um, I was grateful to hear what Dr. Noble said about risk. Um, in New Hampshire today, in Merrimack County, and particularly in Concord, New Hampshire, um, there, you could count the number of cases on one hand in Concord, and that makes me feel pretty good, right? But <laughs> we don't know um, who all the people are that are in various family networks. Um, if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would keep the case count at four and I would have everybody do hybrid for two weeks so that we could meet the teachers, 
um, establish a rapport between teachers and their new batch of students, and then go to remote um, for, for safety because we don't know uh, what the future holds. You know, we may be lucky. We may, if we're smart and we keep wearing masks and keep keeping our distance and keep not traveling to places where the virus is prevalent, I, I think we can do a really good job, but there's too many unknowns and I, and I don't feel comfortable forcing people into the classroom either students or teachers who, who are not comfortable being there under these circumstances. So it, it sure would be nice if we could start face-to-face -face, um, with all the health precautions necessary. I don't know if it's possible um, given, given the high level of, of uh, concern. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Jim, do you want to go or I can go too? I, you don't have to, you can go last if you want. No, that's okay. I uh, I just need to unmute this. Um, first off, I would, I just want to I want to thank everybody in the community um, for participating tonight and being patient. I want to thank um, all the people who wrote that 103 pages of comments and and suggestions. Um, this is an incredibly difficult decision. Uh, none of the nothing is perfect, and there's positive and negatives on all sides. Um, I also want to. I also want to say, and I feel uh, I need to say it. I, I do want to say to those people who wanted to talk to us tonight um, that, as far as I'm concerned, and my personal thing, Black Lives Matter, uh, and I think the board will definitely be addressing bullying and bias uh, coming uh, tonight. It has an effect, but overall, we're going to uh, to be addressing that, so uh, they don't need to worry about that. We will. Uh, I, I did a lot of research. I've talked to epidemiologists. I've uh, looked at the science, and and I'm going to sound a little like Barbara's. I talked to a lot of people who didn't, whose voices aren't always heard, and um, and they're very concerned. They want their kids to go back to school. They uh, they're really upset over losing their job because they're going to have to go home and take care of their kids. That they don't have the ability to have someone you know, not work and be the stay at home dad or mom. Um, and, uh, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're really stressed about it. So, uh, and, and a lot of times that are, are more economic, economically disadvantaged families or people who don't have that they're essential workers. And, and that is an equity issue. So, um, and you know, it's becoming pretty clear that it's less a hard surface type of a, uh, transmission as it is a uh, a breath and it's a uh, droplets so um i'm i i favor the hybrid model because it does give those people who want to uh those people who want to to be fully remote it gives them that option and for those people who want to have you know a little more flexibility it does that uh that being said i would mandate absolute masks distancing the one way items and the moment that that did that failed or we saw that students were not uh were not adhering to that or teachers for that matter or administrators uh i'd, I'd pull the plug and go remote but as of right now based on the science and the numbers that we're at we can't compare ourselves to georgia or to, to alabama i i kind of favor the hybrid model so thanks everybody thanks jim I have struggled with this so much. I think this is an incredibly difficult decision. And I think a couple of things that I struggle with are, if we could start tomorrow, I think I might be more where Jim is, because I think from the social emotional perspective, it's so important for the students to get to meet their teachers. I think that was one of the critical elements that helped us in the spring was that we did have cohesive classes. The problem is we're talking about a month from now. And I think the way that this epidemic is moving we could be in a vastly different situation a month from now. And I believe with, as it Chuck had quoted Dr. Fauci, I don't want to be running experiments. And I think the thing that I find really difficult, I think the administrators have done a great job of designing a plan that allows there to be choice. But I worry that that choice may exacerbate inequalities within our district in a way 
that we have really tried not to have. And I just, I think about, you know, when we did the elementary school consolidation and the principle was that every student got to attend their neighborhood elementary school. We have inclusion, we have, you know, building administrators who work very hard to build classes that are inclusive, that are diverse. And um, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that because of the pandemic. And I think that I am leaning towards starting remote and the way that we would start remote would be really to listen and trust our building administrators and our teachers mm -hmm. to develop models that will work with those populations. But to have that integrity of the class grouping and find ways to creatively work with that um, in the goal that we would get to in person as quickly as it was feasible. But to have, I think the thing that makes me concerned from an equity perspective is that I guess I, I like I like Barb's model of we we you know some students may that need the support of being in the building yeah we use those buildings we use the buildings for the students that need the services in them we use them even for remote instruction for the students that need that and that that's the way that we can develop our you know a really robust remote remote model that where you have a class of kids you know. And again, it may look a little different at different grade levels in terms of, of you know, how the different staff approach it. But again, I think back to before we did the elementary consolidation, we had all kinds of incredibly creative and wonderful things that were going on as a result of inequalities between the buildings. And I think let's use that creativity, let's foster that creativity, let's try to find ways that our administrators and our staff can work together to develop things that will conform with these standards um, so that we can move towards in person if it is in any way feasible as quickly as possible and also support from an equality perspective those essential workers and all of that, that that all should be part of our, our consideration. I don't know exactly how we do that, but and that's why I'm a little bit all over the place. But I also, I am concerned both from a health and a equity perspective about about the hybrid model. I think there are too many questions about having a one size fit all for all grade levels for all schools. I would rather um, have there be a little bit more kind of flexibility and an aspirational aspect in terms of let's get to in person as soon as we can, but have a whole lot of different people working on different ways of doing that safely. So that was not a vote. That was an articulation of thoughts. Um, so Jenny, so, you have th three board members with their hands up. Okay. Um, Tom, did you have your hand up? I was thinking some of them might be residual, but I'm happy to call on you. Tom, would you like to speak? I, no, I'm sorry. I, I will lower it now. Okay. Gina, did you have your hand up on purpose? I do, yes. Okay, please go ahead. So I think we, we also have a very, I, I'm torn, I'm very torn about our preschool through two. Because, or preschool K one, or however we want to uh, cut that, but those kids, the the point of preschool in K, or one of the one of the big points is socialization. Now, I don't know how socialization is going to work when you're six feet away. I don't know how you you know you get a kindergartner to wear a mask. I don't know. I mean, it's hard enough to get them to wash their hands when they come out of the bathroom. I, I, I don't know how that's going to work, but I will tell you that I am very torn for our littlest students who need the kind of socialization that goes on so that they get a foundation of what school is about, what, um, what behaviors are expected. What, how do you, how do you interact with your peers? How do you, how do you share toys when we're not going to be sharing toys? I, I, I just, we've got to have a discussion about the littlest ones. And I, 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 I want to, 
every single one of these kids in our district is in a way my kid. And I get very emotional about thinking about risking our kids. But the li and especially the littlest ones. But they they need something that we haven't figured out how to give them. And we need to talk about it. Thank you, Gina. Kathleen, you had your hand up, and I'm sure you have some thoughts that maybe can help us um, have a more focused discussion. And um, I'm going to yes, try. Go I'm going to try. So I want you to think about the message that we're sending when we say to the community that we'll bring in the youngsters that have special needs, but everyone else stays home. That's a funny message that, that, that we send, and I want to be very, very careful. On the other hand, I don't disagree with what uh, Gina just said. Um, there are youngsters that need support. And I think about K-1-2, learning how to read, learning their numbers. I mean, these are basic skills that they, they're not going to get as much attention as they would with, when they're with the teacher. And social emotional development at that age is huge. Um, and so I, I think that, that there are mixed feelings. I mean, you could, as a board, decide to bring in your primary age kids um, in a hybrid a couple of days a week. But again, you're still facing that risk factor that you all have expressed, every one of you have expressed concerns about it. There's no question about it. I, I, we, you know, we did really listen to Dr. Chan and to Dr. Noble when we made that decision to go with remote. We didn't just say, that's what we wanted. We did it based on the information that we received from those uh, scientists and doctors and um, the, the messages that we were getting based on New Hampshire. We, you know, I know we follow Mississippi and Alabama and, you know, all the Texas, California, um, but um, we, we know what's happening down there. But we don't have those hot spots that they have. They they have huge um, issues, and we don't have that. And and because we don't, um, you know, we felt comfortable offering some time where we could connect with kids. And then if we had to pivot, let's say when the college students come back, you know, the kids at, at New Hampshire Law or, or when the kids come back from down in Manchester and, you know, they visit the city uh, of Concord, I, we, we are ready to pivot if we need to, as soon as that data shows that we're in trouble. But I, I think it is complex. It isn't easy. It's not easy, but I think you need to think about those things. And, the, and, and I, I so wanted to discuss equity tonight when they were, you know, the, we are, I mean, I can't tell you the work we've already done um, in, in addressing and beginning to put together a plan to address the recommendations, but they, they don't know that yet. So I felt bad tonight and I didn't want to get into it, but I have to say that I, I mean, we're, we're in contact with the university and New Hampshire listens, uh, Dr. Jim McKim, I've as Donna and I have had a long conversation engaged in curriculum and, and facilitating discussions with kids. So all that stuff is happening. It's just they didn't know, and I felt bad tonight. So um, I don't know. And I, I think that we, that we can find ways to incorporate that. I think it. I agree with the points that were made about how important it is to incorporate the anti-racism message into our reopening, whatever model we choose, because I do think it's a perfect opportunity right. To really look at what is happening at a systemic level and look at assumptions that people may not have thought about. Um, and it is a complex issue. And I think what I had hoped was to get some more specific recommendations. I think what I took from it that most of the folks who commented about the anti racism effort were recommending a full remote start. But that was it was a little bit hard to discern mm. to me. Um, what their recommendation was as to what was the best way to address it, yeah, strictly in terms of were. the reopening. I think they were. Um, I I, they yeah. were. So Jim, I think, is next. And go ahead, Jim. Unmuting. Hold on one second. Thanks. Sorry, I have a 
shoot on this computer. Um, yes, uh, I want to ask the question is, you know, to, uh, to decouple schools. We had a couple people talk about it. Should we be voting on elementary, middle, high school separately? And, and I'm just asking that question because I think they are very different. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, uh, Kathleen, do you have the sense that the administrators, the building administrators, might might come up with slightly different models at the different building levels? I mean, I know we have one middle school and we have one high school, and so we've got a pretty set approach that is being proposed. But in terms of the elementaries, and in particular the like the primary versus the upper elementary, um, right. Uh, well, I have to say that the administrators are very flexible. All of them have shown and demonstrated their ability to go to the model that we need to go to. I think that there's some strong feeling in the elementary school that they want, you know, the youngsters in because of the developmental things, you know, the social emotional learning, the basic skills, um, the old, the, um, the high school, middle school felt that they could do more remote just because they're more a little bit more independent. They could, you know, withstand that the remote learning. However, they're the ones that you have to really work hard to engage. It's easier to engage the young ones in remote learning, more difficult with the middle and the high school youngsters because they're the ones that, you know, don't show up for the class, don't go on at the t assigned time, teachers not sure where they are, you know, and tracking them down. In which they did. I mean, they tracked kids down. They called parents and they said they're not engaged. But um, so I, I think the the middle and the high um, can handle the remote. They're older. The parents can basically. I hate to say this, but they feel more comfortable leaving them home um, if they have work. And um, and and many people are going back to work. We have to consider that. Um, but yet the young ones, they can't. And that was that was the area that they felt more um, with the hybrid or um, return to school. Would there be any way to do a full, you know, full in person minus the parents that chose remote at the elementary level, or is that just not? Well, possible? no, we, we think we're, we're, that's one of the one, on one of my slides I said that whether we can get the young kids in will be dependent on how many parents choose the remote. So if, right. if our statistics hold out, 25% of the parents, around 25%, said they wanted to remote, right? So that, that would really lower those class sizes. So if you have, you know, 25% of your youngsters not there, we may need some additional classroom space, even with that. So we'd have to look at that. But let's say we had some classes that at the other buildings, we might be able to use classrooms in other buildings that are, are remote, let's say the middle school or the high school. So we could do that work. Can I go now? Yes, please go ahead, Barb. All right. So a couple of things. I'm going to address that we're not a hot spot, so we should send kids to school comment. We're not a hot spot because we've done things right up here. Um, not to politicize it, but uh, the majority of people, as much as we are a live free or die state, masks are worn, social distancing, we don't have big populations. So you're right. Okay, we know, you know, we're 49th best in the country with low COVID numbers. So let's just shove all our kids back in buildings. That's the crabby me responding right now. I'm the mother of a dead kid, so I do not want to be attached to someone else's dead kid or somebody's non-symptomatic COVID carrying nine-year-old infecting some teacher who infects her grandmother and now that kid loses a grandmother so that's that's the emotional part of me we're, we're not we're not in a bad place because we're doing it right second our this whole conversation kathleen your comments everyone's comments are raise more questions than they answer i think saying that september is remote and we're going to work really hard to get our young ones in first as best we can makes sense we, we they're, you're right. We don't know who's going to teach. Do, do the elementary school teachers really want to come back? I, I, I haven't. I haven't heard too many teachers. Actually, I've not had any teachers comment to me that they that they're willing to go back. They're afraid. Same thing. They don't want to have COVID and give it to somebody. Um, I, I just feel that our conversation supports the fact that we need current data, not a June questionnaire. We need to tell the city we're going to go remote and we're going to take the next two months to figure out how to get kids back in the building and to do that right. 
We need people to tell us exactly what they are willing to do and not do. Teachers, custodians, teaching assistants, paraprofessionals, cooks. It, we, we can't, nine of us cannot make a decision that's remotely responsible with all these wonderful questions that we're asking. This is a fantastic conversation. So, so we need to have it. No more speculation, no more creating ideas. Let's take facts. Let's take, take relevant now facts and watch the news and watch, and watch everything that's happening. And, and if in a month from now things are great, then our remote start might only be two weeks. In a month from now, if things are horrible, we have a good remote system set up to educate our kids, and we put in place things that will, that will address our children that need extra help, our children of color, our low-income kids, our ELL kids, our special needs kids. You're right, Kathleen. The normal kids stay home and the special kids go to school. Well, that's, that's what special kids need sometimes. They need the things that maybe we, other kids can go without and still succeed. So I know I sound emotional, but we have so many questions here. So let's, let's do it right. Let's answer the questions using relevant facts and and. and and in two months from now, say, wow, I'm really glad that we took our time and did it this way, rather than, oh, we have to go, now we have to go fully remote because 50 people have COVID. Anyway, I'll stop now. Uh, thank you, Barb. Hey. Uh, Gina. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree, but I, I right. think in addition to um, the, the special needs kids, there, there really is a need for some of the kids whose parent, single parent family or, or two parents, both working, there needs to be a place for those kids to be able to come who can't stay home for whatever reason, um, whether they're, I mean, some kids, even though they're in middle school, some kids even in high school are not mature enough to stay home alone and not engage in things they shouldn't be engaging in and so those kids need to be able to come and put their tukas in a chair where it's supervised right and maybe would, that, yeah. that's where we so, can utilize the teachers who are willing to come in and that the teachers who are not willing to come in can actually do the remote teaching so Dave had his hand up. I want to make sure he gets called on. Yeah, I, I, I've seen remote work really well, and I've seen it not work very well. And, I mean, we're asked to choose among three different options. In reality, if we go to remote, there's a lot that we can do to make it more personal and give people an opportunity. And I, and I, I don't think we should be talking about special needs or not special needs in terms of personal instruction. And part of my reason of saying the hybrid model, I've listened to many, many kids and they want to come back. I've listened to many, many parents who can't afford to stay home and tell me that they're not the rich people. They're not the people that are independently wealthy or can handle all of this sort of stuff. They're people that say, we need to go back to work and we're really concerned about being able to provide for our kids if we're not there. And I, I, I do understand that there's, a, that there's some degree of risk, but I've had a lot of parents talk to me about the fact that they need to go back to work and they don't have the capacity to watch their, watch their kids. Fortunately or unfortunately, public schools play a lot of different roles, and we're, we're clearly seeing that during this pandemic. I'm, I, on the other hand, feel that no matter what we do, we're going to take some degree of risk. And, and we're all in some degree of risk. And remember, the kids are in the school six hours. They're, they're out in the community the other 18 hours, and we have no control over what they do, whether they distance or they don't distance, whether they wear masks or they don't wear masks. All we can do is control them during the six hours they're with us or try to. I mean... And, you know, the, the amount of variables that's involved here makes any decision almost absurd. So, I mean, I'm glad to go remote, but we need to do a lot of work around what that looks like. Because I, I don't want to put anyone at risk at all. Yeah. With that being said, I, I, I think it's elitist. So, you know, with all those hardworking people, I really struggle with this. Thank you. So, Ginny, it's Chuck. Can I chime yes. in? Go ahead, Chuck. Yep, go ahead, Chuck. Thank you. 
So, so listen, I, I think I still contend we, we go remote. I still contend that we start off for the safety of our students, our families, and our teachers to be remote. I do think, to, to Dave's point, to Gina's point, and to Barb's point, that we do need to have provisions in place for so it is an equitable playing field for students that need additional services, Absolutely. for students that need support through PTOT speech, but also for students who need, whose parents have to go to work and, and they need to be in school and learn, even if they're just in the building learning remotely, utilizing that model, but they need to be in school. I don't want to economically disadvantage anyone or not promote economic equity, nor do I want to promote racial inequity or any other type of inequity. I want it to be an equal playing field, and I think remote is the most equitable way to do that. Thank you. I mean, well, one thing one thing that I have wondered about a lot as I've listened to the forums and the answers to the questions is the thing that, that bothers me from an equity perspective about kind of doing hybrid but then also having voluntary remote is that it does, I fear, tend to exacerbate a class divide in a way that I'm not very comfortable with. And so I'm wondering, is there a way that we can say that our first priority is to continue to have the types of class makeups that our administrators have always built. I mean, again, I'm thinking at the elementary level and to have it be maybe even a cluster where it can be a combination of in-person and remote, you know, assuming that that remote becomes feasible. So it's a little bit different from the hybrid, the way it's been described, because what concerns me is the idea that, again, at the elementary level, you would have a class of students who had chosen to be all remote and that you wouldn't have these classes that, you know, if in a perfect world there's a vaccine and everybody comes back, then you have these classes that are separate rather than the types of classes that we've always had. And I'm just wondering, and maybe it's just pie in the sky impossible, but if you could have the type of class makeup and have maybe a team of teachers who worked with that, like at the middle school um, with that group, and, you know, then focus in in those initial weeks on getting to know the class. And part of it would be remote and part of it could be in person, particularly for the younger students with all of the health and safety protections. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess I would just I'd like to see what our administrators were able to come up with, because I think they could come up with some creative solutions that would be, you know, supported by the staff and that would be protective and that would preserve the ability to have remote and that would also promote equity. Tina. Well, I think the solution to that is to have everybody be remote. I mean, on Zoom, for example, everybody has a little box. All those kids are, are in attendance at Zoom. And you can have the makeup of that. It's just that some, in my opinion, some kids, in order not to disadvantage some of our disadvantaged families, are uh, and to call it the way it is, our 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 community of color, both parents need to work because the t statistics show that people of color get paid less than white people for the same job. So often it is those families that need to have both parents working. I'm sorry, but I don't think a fourth grader should be home alone by themselves when both of their parents are at work. And I'm not willing to say, well, we should make one of those parents quit their job to be home because we've gone remote. I think if the, if the child that needs the supervision because of the, the parents needing to work, it can be decided on a case-by-case -case basis of who is coming and who isn't coming. But all the kids are actually remote. That makeup of the class doesn't change. It's just that the kid is sitting in a classroom 
six feet away from other kids on their Chromebook and not sitting in their living room. Right. right. Um, you know, and, and I've seen a lot of comments about how school is, is not a daycare, but I do think that one of the functions that it serves and thing and that people have relied on for, for generations is that their kid would be in school during the day and they can work. Um, so I think we have to figure out a solution to this. I, I mean, I, I think we have to be remote for the vast majority of kids, but for those kids that need additional support, whether that's supervisory support or whether that's one-on-one -on -one or whatever, um, that those kids are in schools and, and wearing masks and separated and, but you know, we, we, we need to be really careful because kids, kids are just as susceptible to catching this, uh, even if they're asymptomatic and the new studies are out that sh show that they're even larger spreaders than adults. Uh, David. Um, just, just to be clear, just because we give kids Chromebooks does not mean they have access to the internet. And I've had many people get in touch with me to say, we don't have access to the internet. We have a computer. So just that's, because it's remote does not mean that people have access. That's why we it's provide a place for those kids. People that, you know, in some of the housing projects and other things, they don't provide Wi-Fi. They don't have access. Right. I mean, this is complicated. And I don't ever want anyone to think that I don't want to protect every kid and family out there. I absolutely do. And if, if it were that simple and remote was just like the answer, then I'd really, I, you know, I'm glad to vote in favor of remote, but I'm going to tell you, we got to do it understanding that we are depriving a certain number of people of their education. Do not think that we're being all holy and, and right by going remote. We're not. We're good, still going to suffer greatly from that. And there's a big risk of kids not seeing each other. But just acknowledge that. Stop saying that. Like, okay, this is the answer. You know, because it isn't the answer. Either is, is hybrid the answer. But oh, I, I don't think there's sort of an like, answer. When people try to say, you know, oh, if we go remote, everything will be fine. No, it won't. Yep. It wasn't yeah. fine before. Right. It's like the unsolvable thing in the Star Trek. You know, like it's it's there's no right answer. It's just, you know, we still yeah. have to make a decision. There is no right answer. Uh, Jim. Take that second till it actually uh, unmutes. Um, <laughs> the thing I'm I'm having I'm having concern with and, and as everyone says, hey, they have great faith in our teachers being able to create better remote learning, the better remote, the ones with the video, all those things will exacerbate anyone who does not have a quick and broadband internet connection. Right. We know from our own point of, from our own experiences here, we know that if you don't have a really great system, you're, you know, we're gonna crash and do that. And then the other thing is, if we bring a bunch of kids in with their Chromebooks and put them in a classroom, that's hybrid. It's just that it's those kids that are in that hybrid thing that's in there. It's um, that's still hybrid. That's kids in a classroom, just like we talked about with uh, with the hybrid system. So, so you know, we can call it what it is, but it's hybrid. So, that's. I mean, we have a we have a difficult problem, but uh, and there is no best good answer well maybe what we need to do right now is vote on the three things vote on fully inclusive vote on remote vote on um hybrid and go from there i mean we will talk all night there's no fixing this it, it's a, it's it's something we've never dealt with a year ago from now who would have thought we'd be talking about this <laughs> um yeah. would have thought it would get worse <laughs> Um, so, 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 Bart, let me get, because a couple of people had their hands up. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and I am recognizing that it is late and we want to get to a vote, but I also think this is really hard and it's a good conversation. And <laughs> let's, let's take a little more time with it. Um, but I, I, I appreciate your keeping us mindful of the time. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. So I, 
Dave brings up a good point and something I hadn't really thought about or heard about. And that is, you know, what about our kids, if, if there are some, and there seemingly are, who are un, unable to learn remotely because of service? So I would ask Catherine and, uh, and her team, you know, what, what do we know about that? How, how, much, of our, how much of our population of kids, um, if you know, are not able to do any of this? Are we talking about something that just can't be done? Um, I was under the impression that Comcast was working with us in the spring. I kind of assumed they would continue working to make hotspots, but I guess that's a very knowable thing, and we should know that before we do too 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 much. Uh, I I do think still in my heart of hearts that having any kids come back, and I understand Gina, I. And, and others, I truly, truly understand the plight of kids who are home in, in perhaps a, a difficult situation. They're home. Um, they need they need some extraordinary help um, with their experiencing uh, special needs. I get it, but I just don't think that Tom, Tom Proto doesn't think that it's worth taking one chance right now. Um, until we can figure out more about what this virus is doing and how it's going to react. And thank you for listening. So, so can I respond to Tom? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, and then I, I want to kind of see if I can give you a little summary of what I've been listening to. So, Tom, I don't have an answer for you. Um, what percentage of our kids um, didn't were not able to connect? Um, they, you know, cast, sometimes they did everybody. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sometimes sorry, they, sorry. Go go. Um, we had free internet. That's all. The whole city had free internet. Right. Comcast is still doing that. Um, right. But you had a qual you had to qualify too for it. So it was you know there were certain caveats relative to whether you had access. And I know that we provided some hotspots outside of the, even the Comcast. So. We did make that effort, but I want you to know, and I, you know, I'm trying to be forthright here. There were kids that just simply did not engage, and that was a choice thing. That wasn't that they didn't have the internet access or the hotspot. So, but I want to, I want to just so, let me just paraphrase some of the things you said tonight. You you indicated that you know that youngsters need some help right? The youngsters that have speech and language, all the special ed issues, the ELL kids, um, the five, the kids with 504. So you think they should be in school. All right. Then you talked about the kids that, um, that both parents work and it, and they have to go to work. They're in a, they're either an, an essential employee or they have a job that, that they must go to for their own sense of keeping their family together f financially. So now you're talking another group of kids. Now you're talking about the kids who don't have a place to go to be able to access the Internet. And maybe they do need that supervision. So you, you've almost created your hybrid group. Quite frankly, you have by just bringing in those youngsters. Now, I totally understand what Tom's saying. It, it, it is a risk. For that very one student, I, I get that. I, I'm, trust me, this is not an easy decision for, for me to make as your superintendent. Oh my goodness. But, but what you told me is you want students who have special education needs, special, you know, uh, whatever that might be. You want to help the kids that parents need to work. You want to help the kids that don't have access or need a place to be. Right. And I don't care what age they are. They could be a kindergartner or a preschooler all the way up to grade 12. You have created hybrid. Hey, California, oh, Scott, no, can, I, I, can I chime in? I'd like to yeah, chime you in. Sure if I, could. Can. I, I just that's all what right. I heard. Yeah. And I guess I respectfully disagree because okay. look, <laughs> on your hybrid model, how many kids are going to be at Concord High on one of the off days? A thousand kids? Oh, no, 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 I mean, much Donna, smaller, Donna. much smaller, 500, um, five, probably close to 500, depending on how many stay remote. 
All right, how uh, many are gonna be a run? How many are gonna be a run like? Uh, well, think about starting with about 900 and then taking off about 30 percent. Um, so I think well, we thought about 300. You're taking the 30 percent. It was 20 percent the last time we talked about people were being from well, home. We, 23rd percent. So you're talking 400 students. So you're up uh, to like what? Yep. 900 maybe just at those two schools? That sounds right. reasonable, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. So so I guess what I'm envisioning is not near that degree of number in the district. So I, so I don't think we're talking about creating our own hybrid. I think we're talking about making a case-by-case, -case, exceptional basis. Look, I don't think we ought to bring every special education student back for a hybrid. I mean, back to school, you know, in the classroom. They should be remote if their needs can be met and their education can be served there. I think for student safety, I think we have to be prudent at this point. And I, I don't think we were at all, at least I was not at all saying creating a hybrid. What I was saying was doing the right thing. It, you know, do we want to create a homeless family because we have a remote model? No. Should we be able to work around that? Yes. Should it be 900 students at two schools? Yeah. No. Thank you. I did want to respond. Sorry, it's Donna, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I did want to respond to the part about uh, Comcast and the internet. So we know we know pretty close how many students we have who needed support for that. And Comcast does a 60-day um, free. It's not forever free, and they've extended it to December, which is great. Uh, once you get past the 60 days, it's uh, there's plans like 9.95 a month. So you know we can certainly plan to to pay to help to pay for those things. Not everybody wants it, but um, there, there are folks who do it, and we do have information about that. Yeah, my phone has been blowing up with texts from teachers, local teachers in our district. I've gotten like 37 texts about Comcast and the internet and the Wi-Fi. And I also had several students at my charter school that live in the projects up there in the Heights, you know, not necessarily internet having families that all were able to connect uh, via Comcast. And also um, I had a student that didn't have it at her house, and she went and sat in the parking lot at Concord High and did her work there. So there are ways around that. I don't think internet access will be a problem. I don't think so. <laughs> but Bob, what about the comment you made about having a place to do it? So so I'm gonna echo a bit what Chuck said. So by, by setting up a hybrid, lots of parents who just want their kids in school, not for the reasons that kids might need to be in school. Um, I think we'd have large, large numbers of kids in school. I think if we announce as a district, look, families, we are remote. Every, so, so I teach first grade, and my 25 first graders are looking at me on my computer screen. Ten of them live on Auburn Street and Ridge Road and, and West Parish Road and all those nice roads with the big houses. And so they're, they're at their houses or they're in little groups because their parents have been able to do that for them. And then ten of them are our kids that, that are, have no English speakers at their house or live in poverty or are unsafe, have drug addicted parents. And those 10 are split into two little groups of five and work either with a volunteer like they're doing in Tucson, Arizona, or with a staff person that's willing to come in. And they're in a little, they're a little group of five and they're looking at the computer. So, so me as a teacher, I see 20 beautiful faces, 10 of whom are at home, 10 of whom are in a place that we provided for them. That's how I see it that the ones that absolutely need it get it. I, I had two students that I call, had to call the police for well checks on all the time. If I still had a school and it, we, we were going remote, those are kids I would find a place for. I have other kids that would definitely be better off in school. Every kid would be better off in school. But some of those kids should stay home. So, so yeah, I suppose you can say we're just creating a hybrid, except it would be a much smaller number of people. And it would really be on a needs basis. And, and we have social groups and, and, and places that, also support our kids. And, you know, it takes a village here. We can't, we can't, I'm not comfortable risking death because, because, um, because we can't find a place to help a, a, a student who's comes from a family that needs support. We, we, we support the families, but I don't think we open up a hybrid program that we aren't, we, we have too many questions unanswered for. So I guess that's the difference. I, I sort of go with Chuck on that, that, that we provide places for the students that really need them. And I think parents will be, I think parents that can make it work will make it work. I think, I think they'll see the big picture that, that doing this now is going to make it better more quickly down the road. Anyway. I guess I'm struggling with how different 
So we, one of the premises of what the administration has proposed is that any family that wants to be remote can be remote. So I guess, yeah, how different is that? Okay, the fact that we have no answers to these questions and it's approaching midnight is I feel that we need to vote and that, that the only thing we are sure that is safe in the big picture is remote and that we, pro we tell our community this is what we're doing and we will have answers about who can, who can be, who, how we will support families that need support and how we will move into a hybrid situation if that's possible. Manchester's starting with their younger grades. They're, they're starting remote, but they're easing them in like that. I think, I think there's no answer here. We're going we're gonna to talk about this all night. We're all emotional about it. Our, our community wants to know, what the hell am I doing with my kids on September 8th? And we don't have enough in place to say we're doing a hybrid program. We just don't. Too many questions. Too many, and, and the, the racial issues tonight are huge. So, so let's, let's let the world know that they're going to have to suck it up for a couple of weeks and it's remote. And let's put together a safe, good plan for getting kids back into the buildings as soon as we can. That's just how I feel about it. I, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> sending kids into buildings on September 8th. I just it's don't. never going to be safe. It's never going to be completely safe. Okay, so we'll just send them back now, David. You win. Oh, good Lord. I don't think we should send them back, but I don't think it's ever going to be completely safe. And I don't think remote is necessarily, you know, going to be safe either. Because <laughs> they're going to be wandering around the community. <laughs> we can't make this world safe. But I would, I would vote for remote. Yeah, I will. I mean, right now, I'm by my informal headcount, remote is going to win. So um, I'm not, not hearing people changing their views on it. I guess the question is, what kind of parameters do we put on this to well, help support our students and our administrators? Because um, I, I guess I'm really torn. I'm on the fence. Um, and so... I'm right. Let just me wondering help. if we can help. go in a direction that, that really yeah. is, is let, more let, concrete. Let me see um, if I can not help. that I totally disagree with what Barb is saying at all. I just, I, I'd like to think of a path forward that's a all little right. more concrete let's, in terms of getting us I, to the buildings. Let's see if I can help. If you vote tonight and you vote, and obviously I, I kept the same tally, I think you were leaning towards remote, okay? It, it, just listening to you, it, it seemed to be that way. Um, and then let it uh, vote remote and then let um, let us go back with our administrators um, and our um, and, and, you know, the folks at central office and answer some of those questions about our most, uh, um, you know, our fragile students, those students that are vulnerable, that need a lot of support. And that that's going to look different now. It isn't just special ed. It isn't just ELL. It isn't. You know, and it isn't just youngsters that may not be engaged that we need to make sure we corral them and get them to school and have learning. So we'll do that. I have to, you know, I have to go back and assess the staff and who would be willing to come in. Uh, that we we have teachers willing to come in, by the way. I've already got, I probably have about maybe 25 right now teachers that asked to go remote. We've already done that. We sent out a survey and um, we've, we've only got about 25 to 30 that have said, I want it remote. And most of them are doing it for reasons, um, ADA, um, FMLA, or they have some significant child care issues. So, I mean, we're respecting that. I, I work that hard with the union. I, I wanted to be able to do that and give them choice, but take your vote you, you're, you're really leaning towards uh, remote and let let us go back and, and answer some of these other questions around who and how we would get kids in. Yeah. I think that, that sounds to really there. good. Yeah. That I think that's heart. a good plan. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That just, and I know that the CEA and teachers would be willing to help. I, oh, I know well, they already have said that. They already told me, they promised me they would help. They yeah. weren't going to put up any barriers they wanted to figure out answers, and I'm good with that. My problem with Gina's suggestion and Chuck's about the remote, you know, the teachers remote from home and then the kids come in, I'm not sure that I have enough staff to cover those rooms. That's my problem. If I have teachers at home doing remote, right, 
to all the classes so that they look like their regular classes, like, you know, like Jenny said. My issue is, is having enough staff and, they, you know, in some cases they need to be certified. I can't just put a, a, a you know, some an uncertified person in, you know, managing students. I, so you see where I have that dilemma. If they're home remote and they're teaching that way to a kid who's remote in school, I need supervision. I'm not sure I have enough staff or qualified. So that's my dilemma with that that um, proposal. I, I like it. As a matter of fact, I, I really, Gina and I talked, I liked it. But when I really began to look at it, I, I, I saw some issues that I had with it. So well, and I think I think, time, I think with time, the, the, the reality will present itself. And teachers that are nervous now about going back you know, a month into school might realize, you know, that we're really, we really have a handle on this. We can make this. Work. And, and, and then other, and then if things go the other way, then we don't have to undo something that we've rushed into too quickly. So Kathleen, I love, I love everything you just said. Um, we've got a couple of board members who have their hands up and I'd like to let them speak, but I like the idea of moving towards a vote and drawing this to a close and coming back again. And that, would be good. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I, I can vote for, you know, I can vote for a remote for a month like everyone else in, but I'm going to make a motion that anyone in our buildings needs to be wearing masks. And another one is we heard it and we didn't talk about it, but we heard it a lot tonight. Four by four in high school. No, we don't need to make another change to really mess you know, we've got enough uncertainty and you sit there and think about somebody who has to take German three from September to January and then not get in anything, nothing that until they walk into German four, maybe September next year, maybe January next year. Uh, I talked to a lot of kids, AP tests are in May. So if you have the September to January thing, you're pretty much at a disadvantage when you have to take that test in May. So I would make the motion that we keep high school the same way. Yes, they're going to have six to eight classes, and it may only be one time a week, but it'll be all year long. I haven't talked to a single parent or a single student that thought changing that was a good idea. That so those are the two the, things. It should have come before the instructional committee. Those kinds of large changes can't just well, happen. Well, you know, let me let me just speak to that. I know that the four by four has been out there. That has not been approved. That has we haven't even I haven't had the time to sit with Mike. Mike talked to me about it. He he we've had some discussions. He's met with his staff. They talked about it. But, you know, like any other schedule, you do you know what the elementary schedules were going to look like? No, they were working on them just as Mike was. Mike, Michael happened to bring it up at, at the meeting and say, you know, we're looking at that. Okay. And he justified it by time and so forth. But, mm -hmm. but, but that, you know, uh, give your um, administrative staff a chance to really um, uh, delve into that and, and, and look at the, um, the pluses and minuses of that. You know, Jim brings up some, you know, good points and that has to be considered. So I'm, I, I okay, just want to make that. I'm I'm glad that it'll go before the instructional yeah. committee. I think that's, I think Barb's right. correct. That's the way it needs to do. It's going to come before the administrative in the central office. And then if, if we think we should move it on, then we'll move it on to, to the Barb's committee, instructional committee. All right. Yeah. Let's not, let's not okay. preclude any, any possible creative I, solution, yeah. but I think very clearly there's a lot of question about yeah. it. So yeah. okay. I agree. But I still would that. stick with masks in schools. If we're going to Absolutely. put anybody in the schools, we need masks for, and we need the mandate. It needs to be mandated for teachers and for anyone who, any students who can wear it. And there will be exceptions, but if everyone else is, uh, is wearing a mask, it's protecting because, you know, masks, Distance and ventilation are the three big keys for, for keeping healthy. Yes. No, I think that is absolutely critical. I mean, and we need to have that as a lot of mine. So I agree. And I think you even had a slide that had that. I mean, so I think taking a vote on that would be great. Masks, distance. Yeah. I recommended those tonight. I, I yeah. totally yeah. agree. Let's not play games here. Yeah. 
said, I will make are. a motion that masks are mandatory um, in our school buildings and in any public area where people can can gather on the grounds. And um, and it's mandatory for for everyone who's in our buildings. Um, and uh, and then I uh, and distance whenever we can. Um, and so that would be I would like us to vote on that tonight. Yeah. Oh, so like, let's get the exact wording of was it? Did you have a slide? Was, was one of the slides from that? Will think, that help I us? I think Kathleen had one. Yeah, I, I did. I did. I don't have it on. I don't have Jack it. Jack is uh, working feverishly. Jack, <laughs> Jack is working feverishly to find it. Yeah, Jack. It's like the fourth or fifth slide. So, Tom, did you have a different point? Should we stay on this point, and we'll hold your point till after we resolve this issue? Or did you want to chime in while we're finding the slide? Well, I, I, I'm i going to make a motion. So uh, oh, okay. if there's already one out there on the floor. Yeah, so let's do this motion yeah. first. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Well, we're not finding the slide. So let's just yeah. do it. Let's, do you want to just state your motion? Basically, you said masks would be mandatory for everyone in the buildings. Maintain distance, um, six foot distance. You know, when people are stationary. You know, do do we want to put and, anything in there for those that can't wear masks for whatever reason? You know, for, uh, well, for I, a medical I do, reason. No, I think we do have to have accommodation for for people yeah. who for medical reasons. Can we? We were looking at the shields, Chuck. You know, the shields. But not everybody like not everybody can wear a mask or a shield. Right. So we're going to have, we'll have to just keep those youngsters who, if they're in school with us, then they have to maintain that six feet. As you heard Dr. Dr. Noble say, I mean, that's critical. I mean, and what we talk about, about do have? Can we put it for PPE for those staff members that are dealing with yeah. the students that can't wear a mask? Yeah. Right. We talked about um, the, this, that I heard that a lot tonight. Teachers who work very closely, think about a special ed teacher, hand over hand. You know, mm -hmm. you do a lot of things really close with yeah. the youngsters. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I have something to say about that. Um, I think that your paraprofessionals would need a hazmat suit. This is ridiculous discussion here. Oh, okay, that's... I mean, I think that's what we were talking about was basically the, the, the full protective equipment. Right. So we would have the full gowns, um, the the masks, and the shields for those those teachers and the gloves. So we um, we've already ordered that. We already have that um, equipment um, for our staff, including uh, our educational assistants. So in person masks, all students, staff, K twelve will be required to wear masks while in the building. Mask breaks will be provided throughout the day. And, and again, this, this last one is obviously voluntary, but we're asking parents to help us out by practicing wearing masks with their youngsters, especially the young ones. Okay. No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Jim, do you want to make your motion? All right. And, you know, people can, if they don't like it, they can amend it. But, uh, well, it was up there a second ago, Jack. I was going to say, I want to make, I want to make wearing a mask mandatory. I make a motion that we make wearing a mask mandatory for staff and students, for anyone in our, I mean, staff, students, visitors, whatever, um, while in the school building and in any public areas on the ground where there would be more than, you know, one person that would be there that could get, that could gather. Um, and unless, uh, uh, medical accommodation prevents the, the person from doing it. I don't know if that's right. the proper wording, but that's as close as I can get right off the... I think, I think that's great. I wrote wearing masks mandatory for everyone in the buildings and public areas on the grounds, except for medical reasons. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there a second? A uh, second. Was that Barb? Yep. Great. Uh, any discussion? Um, I will call the roll. Uh, Ms. Cannon. Aye. Ms. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Croto. Aye. 
Mr. Crotto, your mic is off. There, I finally got it to react. Um, I vote aye. Okay, Mr. Crotto votes aye. Mr. Crush? Aye. Mr. Crush votes aye. Ms. Higgins? Aye. Ms. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Parker? Aye. Mr. Parker votes aye. Ms. Poinier? Aye. Ms. Poinier votes aye. Mr. Richards? What's your motion? I'm assuming you're voting aye, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not hearing you. He's here. Okay. I take the thumbs up as an aye, and it's your motion. So Mr. Richards votes aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Smith votes aye. Ms. Patterson votes aye. The wearing mask is approved on a vote of nine to nothing. Um, Jim, did you want to make a, a motion on the six-foot distance and the cleaning as well. Now your mic is, is there you go. I think I'll be able to hear you now. I don't know what motion I would make on cleaning. It's pretty difficult, but um, I do make a motion that uh, that six foot distance between individuals is maintained um, throughout the building whenever possible. I don't want anybody getting punished because they walked out of a classroom inadvertently and and violated a six foot distance. That's what masks do. Masks help you when you're having a situation that's not um, ideal and inadvertent. But I do want to uh, make a motion that um, safe distancing of six feet is maintained throughout the building. Okay. So Jim's motion is six foot di distance is maintained between individuals throughout the building whenever possible. Is there a second? I'll second it. So seconded by Tom. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, I will call the roll. Uh, Ms. Cannon? Aye. Uh, Ms. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Croto? Aye. Mr. Croto votes aye. Mr. Crush? Aye. Mr. Crush votes aye. Ms. Higgins? Aye. Ms. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Parker? Aye. Mr. Parker votes aye. Ms. Poinier? Aye. Ms. Poinier votes aye. Mr. Richards? Aye. Mr. Richards votes aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Smith votes aye. And Ms. Patterson, chair, votes aye. So that also is approved on a vote of nine to nothing. And Tom, you have a motion. Go ahead. If you're still okay. there. Go ahead. I'm putting this out there and folks can certainly discuss it. So I would uh, move that we employ a remote learning in our school district and to do a COVID huddle as described earlier each week or earlier and more often if necessary to see if and when things may need to change. I'll second that. So that was moved by Tom, seconded by Barb, I think. Yep. And it looks like Gina is would like to discuss. Go ahead, Gina. No, actually, I was going to make the motion if Tom wasn't going to make the motion. Oh, okay. I, I think we need to make the motion and we need to vote. It's almost midnight. Okay, so Tom moved, Barb seconded that we employ a remote learning model with a check-in each week as to whether changes are needed. Is that accurate? Uh, That's Tom? accurate. That is accurate. Okay, Dave has some discussion. Go ahead, Dave. Just to be clear, I'm very glad to go with a remote model. I, I think it requires a lot of due diligence. I also want to say that a lot of the things that I'm projecting have been um, emails that I've received or calls that I've received from the public. And I feel that those quiet voices need to also be heard. So I'm glad to go remote. That sounds fine. And because the safety of the people is probably what's most important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Jim, go ahead. 
<laughs> okay. It's, my mic's on now. Uh, I just want a clarification from Tom. Is that all schools? Yes, that is all schools. I think you just, I just want to make a friendly amendment that you add that in. Thank you. That's TRTC too, correct? Uh, that's a separate entity, I believe, because it's so many well, districts. Well, we control it, though, I think. So we yes. have what. So that's a school that would be included in all schools. Right. 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 Which is unforeseen Tom, consequences, but. Tom, preschool as well? I Absolutely, yes. All schools. Thank all schools. Um, Liza. Um, yeah, I was just going to say we didn't have a lot of chance to talk about either preschool or CRTC, and so I think we should include them in the current motion, but also not forget that we need to have a more thorough discussion. Um, I know that CRTC's plans are, are quite advanced at this stage, and the remote is not the plan, so let's, let's talk about it next time we get together. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are the challenges, for sure. Do, do we want to add to the motion about school starting September the 8th, that we do remote starting September the 8th? That would be absolutely fine with me. Um, we could uh, move that we employ remote learning beginning September 8th in our school district, whatever way, Jen, you'd like to to word that, but I'm, I'm certainly open. I mean, let's, let's end up with a separate motion on the start date being September 8th. I mean, my guess is that that would, that people support that regardless of model, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I guess I, the only thing I'm struggling with with this motion, I'm struggling which way to vote, but that's my personal issue. Um, do we want anything in it about that we will be so the checking in each week, is that the board? Is that administrators? And is there a goal of movement towards something different? I don't hear that expressed in your motion, Tom. Because um, I think I liked that part of the discussion. I liked that part of what Kathleen said. I think, I think that's where the board is. But I think that we as a board are going to want to check back in pretty soon. So the way I'm seeing this motion is... This is how we will start. But within two weeks of the start of school, it may be coming back to us with, okay, we think we can go to hybrid or maybe sooner. Um, I don't know. Well, obviously, I, I do. So that's yeah, go what ahead, the Tom. next month is for. I mean, that's what that, we can't answer that question tonight because it's, it's August fifth or sixth or whatever it is, but that's what the remote start buys the district time to do. Put those things together. So maybe think, do we want to change the motion so it's we start with remote learning at all schools? I mean that's I guess my question. It sounds like it's so definitive that that's what we're sticking with for sure. Like I don't know. So Tom, it's your motion. So maybe you can speak to we that. Could we could choose a date. We could say that we, we, we're committing September to remote learning, and we'll use that time to set up, you know, to see if we where we can go from there, which is, I think, what Pembroke is doing. There are two weeks definitely remote, and then they're going to re-look re at it. So, you know, I don't think we can get too specific. I think we're remote, and parents have that in their heads, and it's a decision whether whether it's popular or not. It's a known entity, and provisions can begin to be made. And then we as a district can look into what, provisions we need to provide for those who are struggling. Okay, well, I think the motion is clear. Um, so is there any further discussion of it? Can you make sure to restate that motion because it's such an important one so that I capture it exactly? The way I wrote it down was the motion is that we employ remote learning at all schools starting September 8th with a check-in each week as to whether changes are needed. And I think that that really is, is what we need to do. I think we need to be hearing from administration, you know, almost constantly about 
how things are going. We hear it every night on the news. I think it's important that we hear as a board. We're the only entity that can make sure um, something changes. So uh, I would expect, and I know that uh, Kathleen will do that for us and with us. Um, Kathleen, is that, is that a comprehensible motion from your perspective? <laughs> That's, I guess, my question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've okay. included all okay. schools, which is inclusive of preschool and the CRT. No, I got my hand up on this. And, yes. um, and that we would have uh, weekly check-ins with a co we'll, we'll call a COVID huddle. Um, and, and you're right. Tom's right. We, we need to be very open and transparent about what progress we're making along the way. Because, you know, tomorrow morning... I have a meeting at eight o'clock with the elementary principals. So, you know, and Don Donna and I, so we're not, we're not, we, we were waiting for this so we could start to really begin to put things together. So, yeah. okay. And you'll get those messages. Okay. Uh, Jim, go ahead. I, I just have a point for discussion. Full re, fully remote. How does that affect athletics? We're going to be out for a month and, um, we need to talk about it. I agree. Um, you heard some of it tonight, so I think you've got to address the athletics. And, you know, we talked about band and instruments. I've already had a discussion with the band leader about, you know, trumpets and trombones and saxophones that are very different in terms of what gets spread. So... I mean, they've been out there practicing their formations and marching around the field, but no, not playing any instruments. So th those are issues we have to address. Well, and I, I, living where I live, I see the cross-country teams run by and um, big groups of kids running together, you know, on a little sidewalk close together. Um, I don't know how easy it is to run in a mask, but we're supposed to be practicing all of these things. So I don't know that it's necessarily safe. I know that we could potentially have some folks in our district sick already. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that we have to, if we're remote, then we're remote. Um, and that might be unpopular as well. But again, one dead kid is one dead kid too many. <laughs> Jesus. It's a terrible thing to say. Well, it's my perspective. How lucky for you. What's so funny? Kids are going to die. Is that funny to you? It's not funny at all. This isn't funny. Then you shouldn't be laughing. It isn't funny. That's absolutely right. It's laughing. horrible that you're laughing. For real. So, so okay. are you comfortable I think with that motion? I, I, uh, here's what I'd like to say about yeah, the sure. athletics, if I could, because I think it was a great point, and some of the after-school activities that we've just described. You've made a decision here to be remote. That means that it's remote. Now, mm -hmm. NHIA came out with a whole schedule today, as I told you earlier. Um, you know, let's let's address that at our at our first COVID huddle in a week. Could we do that? Um, that, and I'm I'm concerned about preschool too. So I wanna I wanna dig in a little bit more with preschool because remember, preschool will only be those youngsters that have um, that are been we found through Child Find or on IEPs. We're not talking about um, typical kids that you know are in, are part of the preschool program. You know how you have tuitioned in preschool kids. Well, we're not. Um, we're, that was not part of preschool. I'm only talking about those youngsters that um, require services. So I'd like to have those two, um, com that conversation with, I think we should, I agree with the, the, the motion, but I will come back with you with information in a week on those two, athletics, extracurricular, and preschool. And what about CRTC? And CRTC, right? <laughs> right. Because, you know, we got nine schools coming and you heard from Steve, you know, how do you do automotive mechanics and automotive and or all of the wonderful programs over there um, remotely? Now, I recognize some might be able to do a little bit of remote. There's no question about it. But for the most part, it's a very hands on uh, project based learning. And that's going to be a tough one. 
And and Lies is right. He he's been working on getting his program together and opening up. He's been working on it all summer. I mean, Thank you, exclude? Kathleen. I just wanted to be sure that you know we had uh, we were comprehensive. Right. No, I agree. I agree. I think you ought to stick with your motion. But let's come back in a week with those three items. Okay. okay. Gina, you have your hand up, and then I'm going to call the vote. No, I was just going to ask if we could call for a vote. Okay, I'm going to call for a vote. Uh, Ms. Cannon. Aye. Mr. Crodo. Aye. Ms. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Crodo votes aye. Mr. Crush. Aye. Mr. Crush votes aye. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Ms. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Parker. Aye. Mr. Parker votes aye. Ms. Poignier. Aye. Ms. Poignier votes aye. Mr. Richards. Aye. Mr. Richards votes aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Ms. Smith votes aye. Ms. Patterson votes aye. So the motion passes on nine to zero. Okay, do, September 8th start date, that was incorporated. Should we have a separate motion on that? That's the only other thing that we might. I'd like to make do. a motion that we start school on September the 8th uh, for the students uh, remotely, uh, allowing the administration to have time to prepare for the remote model of learning and, and all other necessary preparation. And I'll that, second that. Okay, so that was moved by Chuck. Seconded by Jim. And I think I take that as being consistent, uh, Chuck, with the slide that had the dates for the staff. It, it does, yes. I, I yes. just couldn't remember okay. it to be candid with you. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, um, any discussion? I will call the roll on the September 8th start date. Uh, Ms. Cannon. Aye. Um, Mr. Crodo. Mr. Crowder, I didn't hear you vote. Was that an aye? It is aye. Thank okay. you. Ms. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Crowder votes aye. Mr. Crush. Aye. Mr. Crush votes aye. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Ms. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Parker. Aye. Mr. Parker votes aye. Ms. Poignier. Aye. Ms. Poignier votes aye. Mr. Richards. Aye. Mr. Richards votes aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Ms. Smith votes aye, and Ms. Patterson votes aye. So the start date is unanimously moved to September 8th for students with August 26th, 27th, and August 31st to September 3rd for staff. Thank you for this slide. Okay, anything else? I'd like to make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> um, okay, so moved. Moved by Chuck, seconded by Barb. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned at 12.07. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Good everyone night. who stuck with us to listen. We still have 145 people on the line, so thank you.